Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. This time we're going to talk about the appearance and structure of other galaxies. We went through an extended dance remix of exactly what the Milky Way looks like as a galaxy, and we discovered that it is the galaxy, meaning our home galaxy, and we learned from Edwin Hubble that all the other spiral nebulae are extraordinarily distant objects, extremely far away, and that the the uh, and that our and that our Milky Way is one of many quote island universes, but what we really learned is that there's such lots of different types. And so once Edwin Hubble started doing a major photographic survey, he showed us that the that the cosmos is filled with these extraordinarily large distant objects. So let's go see what they are. Hubble during his work in 1926 to 36, once he started started really going to town with that 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson. He took numerous photographs of the night sky, made amazing discoveries, and found that the bright galaxies in the sky, we're talking the bright galaxies now, fall into three broad classes according to shape. So he simply took photographic visual surveys of them and determined their classes according to shape. So we're going to follow in Hubble's footsteps in terms of looking at visual uh, representation or optical light representations of the various galaxies. And so Hubble's tuning fork is how he thought they would, uh, how thought that they had some kind of significance, and he thought that they naturally progressed from one to the other. And so he had that 75% of all the bright galaxies were spirals, about 20% seem to be ellipticals, and about 5% are some sort of irregular, which don't fit any pattern. And this is his tuning fork diagram. And he thought that it actually progressed from left to right, from elliptical to spiral, thinking that go from a simple looking thing to a more complex looking thing. But we now know that the Hubble tuning fork diagram has no intrinsic meaning. It just looks nice and is very helpful to help you remember the different types. So you can see we have different things with beginning with E's, those are the ellipticals, and we have the S's, those are spirals, and then there's the upper tree of spirals, and the lower tree, which are the barred spirals, or the SB's. And the bars have a bar across, and the regulars, well, they're kind of like train wrecks. So let's go take a look at all of them. From this point on, we're going to do an incredible visual survey because you've probably not seen a lot of different kind of, of galaxies. So it's my job in this particular lecture to give you a whole bunch of images and show you what the galaxies themselves look like. So here we go. Hubble's classification scheme looks a lot like this with ellipticals and spirals. So let's go take a look. I derived all of the images that you'll see in this particular thing from lots of different sources, from the National Optical Astronomical Observatory, from AAO, uh, the uh, Australian Astronomical Observatory, the Gemini Observatory, European Southern Observatory, the Keck on Mount Mauna Kea, lots of things from Hubble Space Telescope. In fact, I even went to the SADS group, and then there's a guy that does the NGC project trying to take pictures of all the NGC objects, and then looking at the NED database, which is the NASA Extragalactic Database of Galaxies. So you can look at all of these things to find all these images, and everything I've done here comes from these places. And a lot of these then also appeared in Astronomy Picture of the Day, so if you Google APOD, you'll also see many of these. All right. Elliptical galaxies are elliptical in shape. They don't have any internal structure. They don't have disks. They don't have spiral arms. They don't have dust lanes. The brightest stars are big red supergiants, and they're classified only by their appearance and their apparent flatness. So if you see a circular looking one that's in E0, and if you see one that's really wide compared to its height and it's really flat or smushed or cigar shaped, then that is in E7 where it's up to about three times as wide as it is high. Ellipticals come in huge size differences from some that are come from trillions of stars down to tiny little dwarf with only a few million stars, which is smaller than some globular clusters. They also contain no gas or dust and show no evidence of star formation. So they do have lots of hot, but, but ellipticals do, however, have ex tend to have really large hot clouds of extraordinarily hot gas emitting in x-rays that extend far beyond where you can see. So they may be very well embedded in very, very, very large x-ray uh, cloud emitting gas. So that's interesting. All right. So this is a classic 
uh, elliptical galaxy. It's a giant elliptical, and it's M87, and it's part of the Virgo cluster of galaxies. And this was taken by the uh, CF, CFH telescope at Mauna Kea. It's an enormously fun look to see. And so when you look out, you see it's got an elliptical shape. It's pretty yellow, and there's a lot of stars, and it's a kind of a glowing cloud. And let's go see more ellipticals. This is the elliptical galaxy 11, uh, 1132. It seems to be in the middle of a whole number of tiny little galaxies. It's a giant elliptical, and you can see a number of little galaxies all around it. Here's another giant elliptical galaxy. All right, we keep going through it, and another elliptical with some with some spirals that are much more distant in the background. And again, I believe this is M87 that we saw before in Virgo. And you can see a number of other ellipticals, at least four others that are there, maybe five or six. Actually, Google, if, you, if your eye wanders around, you see a lot of them, plus a lot of other fuzzy objects in the background, too. The, if it's got basically spikes, like those starry spikes, that's a Milky Way star. That's a star in our Milky Way. We're mostly and completely concerned with all the fuzzy objects that are in our field of view. Those things are much more distant. M87 in the Virgo cluster of galaxies is over 65 million light years away. And so it's truly distant compared to the stars in the field, which are only tens of light years to thousands of light years away, and maybe up to 10,000 light years away. But stars are on the order of hundreds to thousands of light years away in pictures like these. But galaxies are on the order of millions or tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of light years away. And this particular one in the center, that's the, that is in the Virgo cluster, which is about 65 million light years away. Incidentally, the light from this galaxy started traveling to us at about the same time that the dinosaurs were wiped out on Earth. So that's what it looked like back then. We see it now. Here's another image of, of an elliptical galaxy, and another one is a very, very elongated elliptical, and now a, small, a more centrally looking elliptical, lots of ellipticals, oh my goodness, ellipticals, there's an E0 type definitively, and other ellipticals, and so on, and so on. The Virgo cluster has a lot of elliptical galaxies in it. We see uh, four examples here, ranging from E0 and ranging from a dwarf in the lower left, to a very large E7 type uh, elliptical in the upper left. All right, so ellipticals, you know, can be looked at as kind of boring to put up, and you're not going to make a really big poster of an elliptical galaxy and put up on your wall because people go, why, why you got that big white dot on your wall? But we're going to get to the more inter more pretty looking galaxies very soon. The next intermediate type in the Hubble scheme is the S0 types, and they are the lenticular galaxy. And lenticular means lens-shaped. And there's also barred lenticular, SB0. They do, they do exist. So they, they're distinguished by having a bar type of shape in them, but they're rarer. So now a lenticular does have a disc-like structure. It does have a central bulge, but there aren't any spiral arms, and there's no interstellar gas. Uh, so you don't see any hydrogen gas clouds or anything like that. A lenticular galaxy is seemingly an immediate between ellipticals and spirals just because of the appearance. And they do have dust in their disk. So an, ellipti an elliptical can have dust lanes, even though there's almost no star formation going on. So that means the hydrogen gas is gone, but there's still dust left over, which is interesting. So but if they're but because they if they have very ill-defined arms and if they're face on, meaning you see most of them from the side, you won't necessarily see that dust, and a, a lenticular can easily be mistaken for an elliptical if they're not seen edge on. All right, so here's a classic lenticular, meaning that you see just a fuzzy cloud, and that fuzzy cloud is very much like an elliptical galaxy, but yet it has a dusty lane going through it. But there's no pink clouds in that that indicate star formation. So this is a standard sort of typical lenticular. Here's another lenticular. I believe it's actually the same one. No, it's a different one. But they look very similar, don't they? Here's another lenticular with a seen edge on. And uh, you can see there's dusty lanes in them. But, the, but, the, but there's no pink star formation. So it's all older stars. Here's another lenticular, and you can see that they can have spiral arms to them, but the spiral arms have no, there's no star formation. There's no pretty little Orion nebulas or Triffid nebulas or anything, or tarantula nebulas or anything like that. There's nothing like that, but there are dusty lanes inside of them. 
So these are kind of reddish sorts of galaxies. Here's another lenticular. We see it's kind of a kind of wispy, and there's uh, some dusty lanes in the middle, but it mostly looks like a lot of older stars. Another lenticular dust lane again. There's a standard appearance, and here's a here's a, they tend to be kind of small. This is about only tens of, only on the order of a, 4, 000, a few thousand light years across, and it's about 25 million light years away. So it's closer than the Virgo cluster of galaxies. But yet what we see is there's a dusty lane and then some appearance by some, some of the cloudiness for it. But that cloudiness is obscuring some of the dust lanes. So it's kind of in between an elliptical and a lenticular. All right, let's get to the really pretty stuff. The ordinary spiral galaxies. So spiral galaxies come in a few flavors, um, and we will call them S, A, B, C, and D. Now, Hubble did basically S, A, B, and C, and there's been some extensions and slightly different things, but let's add the SDs because they do exist. Um, so an S, A will have an enormously large bulge and very, very, very tight to indistinct arms. So they, get, they look a little like a lenticular, except there's star forming going on. An S, B are an intermediate type. They don't have as large a bulge, but the, the arms are much more distinct. And SC are of a tiny bulge and loose, very well-defined arms. And SD has absolutely no bulge, but lots of, lots of big spiral arms. So these tend to be really pretty, so here we go. This is the classic uh, SA type galaxy, the Sombrero. It's about 30, well, just under 30 million light years from Earth. It's about half the size of the Milky Way at 50,000 light years across. And, gent and inside of here, there is some star forming going on. Not a lot, but you can see that if you look, if you squint and look carefully, you can see there's some pink clouds in there. So this seems to be like a extremely dusty uh, lenticular type galaxy. But that's where we think of that, that it mer that's why Hubble merged into this tuning fork diagram, because they seem to, by appearance, merge smoothly one to the other. But that doesn't mean they evolve this way, they just have this certain appearance. And so there's lots of, there's only certain ways that a galaxy certainly appear. Well, inside of those dusty bands, there's some pink glows, and those pink glows show star formation. All right, another one is the classic uh, spiral called M81, and M81 lies about 12 or so million light years away, and it's an incredibly beautiful spiral galaxy, and it's one of those intermediate SB types. Uh, we can see definitive spiral arms. There's there are those bright pockets of star formation indicated by the blue glows, and there's some pink glows as well, indicating ongoing star formation. And this is another view of it. And then we see with the Whirlpool Galaxy, extraordinarily vigorous star formation happening. That's what all the pink glows are. Those pink glows indicate Orion nebulas and the hot H2 regions, meaning ionized hydrogen. That's where the pink glow comes from. And inside of the pink glow, what we see are, what we see are that's where bright stars form in clusters and groups. And as the star, as the, as the galaxy itself rotates, or more specifically, everything rotates through it, gas passes into these spiral arms, these overdense regions, gets compressed, as we saw with the formation of the Milky Way spiral arms, and, out the, and then, they, then stars are formed and keep traveling on and they explode as supernovae. So basically, you see dust on one side of the spiral arm, and inside of the spiral arm, vigorous star, star formation and pink clouds, and on the other side of the, far, spi of, the, of the spiral arm, as they travel through the density wave, are the bright stars that were formed by the gas only a few million years before. So you can think of it as that, look at it from one side of the arm to the other, and the extent of the blue stars doesn't get very far from the spiral arm. So they'll only go about 10 or so million years, so that span is just how far they go in 10 million years. All right, so let's see, get in deeper in close to the world center of the Whirlpool Galaxy M51. You can see more of what I was talking about, meaning the spiral arms or places where, the, where, where a star formation is vigorously occurring. And this is the, world, uh, the, uh, the Pinwheel Galaxy M101, which is also an SC-type galaxy, a very small, bulge, but large and loosely and loose spiral arms. And if you look really closely, here's a wonderful detail of it. You can see the, the flow of the, of the gas. You also see how the stars themselves are grouped in large, large, large groups. There's not as much pink star formation going on, 
And what's neat is about this particular image is way off to the right, we see another galaxy. And that galaxy is extraordinarily distant compared to M101. So we're looking through the galaxy to, a, to an extremely distant galaxy, maybe a hundred times further away. That's an, uh, that's an amazing image right there. But what we can see, remember we talked about the nature of our spiral arms, are basically the gas and dust is on these streams of elliptical orbits. So look at the, the shape of the gas. It looks like it's in waves. But now think instead of them being in waves, think of them as lines. And so the lines are orbiting the center. And so you have like this nested set of ellipses. And when they run into each other, they get denser and darker. All right, here's the Triangulum Galaxy. This is a local little neighbor within a couple million light years, and it's a favorite target for, uh, for amateur astronomers and for amateur photographers because lots of really great star formation is going on. See, that's that pink glow. It's also an SC-type galaxy with a very, very, very tiny core bulge, galactic bulge, and very well-defined arms. And another one is a starburst galaxy called NGC 3310, where there's huge amounts of star formation going on. That's why it's got really, really bright all over the place. It's about this only is about half the size of the Milky Way, and it's about 50 million light years away. Um, and it, to cause that, it probably was a collision with another galaxy some maybe 100 million years ago. And these stars are now the brightest of stars. And we can estimate that they would be 100 million light years, 100 million years ago, because the types of stars are roughly A-type stars. O-type stars live a few million years, B-type stars live tens of millions of years, but if the spectra of the stars is roughly A-type, then they'll live about 100 million years before dying, and that is the kind of stellar spectra that we would see inside of this galaxy. All right, here's another great spiral, Messier object number 74, with numerous star formation regions and quite distinct things, very distinct images. And these Hubble heritage images are fantastic, so go definitely Google these around. And if we look closely, we have M81 and M82 close together in the sky. These are an impact, an interacting pair at about 12 million light years away. And this is the Leo triplet, a, a triple of spiral galaxies in the constellation Leo. And you can actually, and this is this image is about one degree across. So if you have a large enough telescope and the eyepiece lets you see about one degree across, for a standard, uh, for something that's an F2, F4 type uh, telescope, if you have a, a 17 millimeter eyepiece, this would all fit inside the same eyepiece, which is I've done. So it's kind of pretty. So we see different three different spiral galaxies, and yes, they're an interacting group. The spiral galaxy NGC 1309 has another little distance by a distant spiral up to the left and a much more distant spiral off to the right at three o'clock. And then you can see huge numbers of spiral galaxies way off in the distance. And so clearly we were looking not along the plane of our Milky Way, which blocks the light of these stars, but, but above or below the Milky Way in order to see this object. So look at all the little tiny smudges in the background. Those are even more distant galaxies, far, far, far in the distance. And there's another one, another beautiful grand spiral. Um, we can see little tiny smudges. Each of those are much more distant galaxies. Here it is again, and the spiral galaxy NGC 3370 is chosen because it has some beautiful image galaxies in the same field of view. An edge on lenticular on the lower right, lower center, and it looks in a, a tiny barred spiral in the upper right, as well as numerous little ga galaxies those aren't little because they're little compared to NGC 3370. They're little because they're really far away. So this, the, gal the universe is filled with these things. So here's another one, NGC 3949. I love showing these off because they're really pretty. And there's another one. And you can see the spiral arm structure. And there's another beautiful one. And you can see that now the two elliptical, there's actually a number of elliptical galaxies that kind of surround the spiral. And yeah, they seem to do come in groups like this. And here's another classic spiral, which has huge amounts of dust. And there's the Starburst Galaxy again, because just because. And now we can see what a spiral galaxy looks like edge-on. I believe this is NGC 891. And it's a classic edge-on spiral galaxy. How do we know it's a spiral galaxy? Because of the huge amounts of dust and gas, and the spectrum shows star formation and hydrogen gas cloud emissions. 
And there's another edge on spiral galaxy, and we know it's a spiral because of the star formation that's happening in it. And that star formation can be seen by the glow of hydrogen and the prevalent blue glow of stars in the disk. Remember again that the dots that we see in front of the spiral galaxy are part of our Milky Way, and so therefore very close. And there are little tiny smudgy galaxy-like objects in the very far background, which are much more distant than the foreground galaxy. And this galaxy is on the order of tens of millions of light years away anyway, so that's pretty far. The stars are near at tens to hundreds of light years. Then the galaxy is millions of light years, and the dist much more distant little background galaxies are, are probably 100 million light years or more. There's another, there's a lenticular and a distorted spiral galaxy, and another, sometimes you see one galaxy in front of another galaxy, and this would be along the plane of the Milky Way, that's why we see so many stars in this field of view. So we're looking away from the center of the Milky Way out along the edge, and so we can definitely see uh, the spiral structure of this galaxy, but all the stars in the Milky Way are trying to get in the way of our view. Here's another pair that seems to be one in front of the other, and here's what we call a, a compact group. And so all four of these little galaxies are in a group, gravitationally interacting with each other. So that gives us some information about the nature of normal spirals. And then parallel to them are the barred spirals, which really are interesting because they have this enormous bar-like structure, where the bar appears to rotate as a solid body. Now remember, galaxy bars are not solid structures like a rod or something. No, they're composed of stars and gas and dust, but they rotate as one. So the stars to they would so that means the ones that are farther out are rotating faster in their orbit so that they maintain the bar than the ones closer in. Just in the same way, if you look at a marching band, so yeah, the best example is a marching band. The marching band has to keep its lines together in order to stay as a line as they turn a corner or do their thing on the football field. So the guy that's in the interior of the turn, he takes little tiny baby steps, but the people on the way on the outside of the turn, they have to take huge steps. So they have to go faster or practically run in order to keep the line the same. So in terms of marching band styles, you could think of the bar of a sparred spiral as a big marching band of stars. All right, so here's the barred spiral, NGC 1300. So they have very similar characteristics to spiral galaxies, except for the huge bar in the structure. There's another one, the NGC 1365. We can see the various types, S, A, S, B, and S, C. This is an S, A, S, B, A. Uh, so it's a large bulge, but, and tight arms. And this is an S, B, B, meaning intermediate bulge but looser arms and then we can go to SBC which are really tiny bulge very very well defined arms and the bulges there in the center now this also highlights the incredible incredible uh, star formation that is occurring in M83 Messier object 83 and that's where all the pink glow is and that's where stars are being born even now and it's wonderful to take a zoom in to see the, the effect of that. So those are incredibly turbulent regions. But if you were nearby, you'd have something. If you were in that galaxy close to that, you'd have such a beautiful view in your night sky. All right, here's another view of a barred spiral. More barred spirals. You can see the, the, pink, the pink glows of star formation. So these have lots of gas, lots of dust. Star formation is going on. Young stars and old stars. Okay. Another barred spiral showing star formation in young stars. There's one I use for a lab that I've used frequently. It's a very pretty barred spiral. Here's another beautiful barred spiral that kind of has a ring around the bar, which is interesting. And another barred, and another wonderful barred spiral. There we go. Let's keep going through. And now we get to the last of our, last of our, or second to last of our classifications, the irregular types. And basically, they look like train wrecks. An irregular is not an elliptical, it's not a spiral, it has no spiral structure, but they tend to have a lot of uh, star formation going on in them, the irregulars. They look like messes, and these are the two large and small Magellanic clouds. Now, they're together in the sky, and this is a ground-based photographic view, but then when we take these amazing views of the large Magellanic cloud, we see that there's lots of gas and dust, 
that there's star formation going on, and there's a lot of activity. So there's a huge amount of interaction going on inside of this thing. It's a turbulent place where stars are being born everywhere. The Large Magellanic Cloud is about 200,000 light years away. And so we see everything we see in there is the light has been traveling for about 200,000 years to get to us. Same with the Small Magellanic Cloud. This was taken by Stefan Vissart. And uh, I've just got to mention that. I'll find the link for his work and put it on the YouTube channel. But again, this is Stefan Guissard's uh, image. And we see the small Magellanic Cloud is here. But just to the left of it is a globular cluster that's part of the Milky Way. And below it is another globular cluster part of the Milky Way. So the globular clusters are, comparatively speaking, on the order of tens of thousands of light, year away, light years away. But the LMC and SMC, SMC Small Magellanic Cloud, are about 200,000 light years away. So that means for it to be that big, it must be really huge compared to something that's 10 times closer. So if the small Magellanic Cloud were at the same distance as the larger globular cluster, it would be 10 times bigger in the sky. So those are big, 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 big things. And that's also a place where star formation is going on. An interesting irregular, which is the active galaxy M82, and I showed you M81 and its neighbor, M82. It has some strange structure. You could think that maybe it was once a spiral galaxy, but it has this glowing, it has a dark dust cloud going across it. And then if you take a deep image, and this is a deep Hubble Space Telescope image, that pink glow is ionized hydrogen gas, and the outflow is going at tens of thousands of miles per hour, two miles per second, actually. It's going extremely fast. These winds have been driven, and it's being driven out to tens of thousands of light years, up to over 10,000 light years long, some of these filaments. And M82 is one of the brightest, is the brightest galaxy in infrared in the entire sky. And what has happened is that there's an enormous amount of star formation happening inside of this galaxy, and the combined winds of all those super bright O and B type stars um, cre uh, creates enormous winds, and those enormous winds drive the gas. And so the gas is being driven out of the galaxy by the formation of the stars. And this is an interesting combination of X-ray, of optical, and infrared imagery of the same galaxy. And uh, yeah, it just looks kind of like a crazy, crazy, crazy thing. So, right, the center, and this is a more standard sort of appearance, NOAO, ground-based image. And then using the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2 on the Hubble Space Telescope, we get the interior of a dusty, dusty area where lots of star formation is happening at M82. And there it is once again in the sky. Uh, a few years back, M82 had a prominent supernova that went off that we'll talk about in the future. It's a very, very nearby one, but it was a distinct kind of supernova that's called a Type 1a supernova. And it was very important to help us even more land down the nature of the distance to M82. But you can see in this full color image that the hydrogen gas clouds are there. And yes, M81 on the left and M82 on the right are distinctly interacting. M81, M81 on the left is much more massive than M82, and the interaction has caused M82 to go into a massive amount of star formation as M81 buzzes by. They interacted probably about 10 million years ago or so, and they're at roughly the same distance from us, at about 12 million light years away. So their relative distance between each other is actually quite small. So that's interesting. The interaction that they had, uh, very deep images, show that they're still interacting and that there's a, there's a line of hydrogen gas binding between them that can be seen in the optical wavelengths. And here's another disrupted sort of irregular, gosh, they look all crazy. Oh, here's another irregular. They just look like train wrecks, like something's really went wrong. Like mistakes were made. And here's a dwarf irregular. And here's another flavor of irregulars that kind of looks like a uh, barred spiral galaxy. But in the center, we see active, active star formation in a ring-like structure. And here's another strange looking irregular called Hoag's object, which is a Hubble image, and so star formation in a ring. Uh, there's another one, the center of NGC 1512, which is a ring-like structure. This galaxy has a bar, and then that bar has a ring, and so it's kind of a double-ringed galaxy, so we call this an irregular. Another irregular ring structure. 
And then you get the really strange ones, which are the dwarf irregulars, which are just complete little tiny train wrecks. And they're almost impossible to image because they're compact, dim, small, and difficult to observe. As you can see from these things, they're practically not even there. And the Sagittarius Dwarf Irregular Galaxy orbits our Milky Way, and it's so gossamer that it basically you can see through the galaxy to the other side. So what exactly holds this galaxy together, and what exactly is the lowest boundary for a galaxy? This is an incredibly important topic for, say, the study of dark matter. How does dark matter cluster? And so there must be an enormous amount of dark matter there to keep the Sagittarius Dwarf around. And here's a couple of other dwarf irregulars, and we can see active star formation occurring in them. And they're also sites where, dark, where, where they're, they're, they're basically train wrecks of interaction. And here's another dwarf irregular galaxy. These are very tiny objects. They tend to have only to a million, on the order of millions to tens of millions of stars if it, uh, on their sizes. And they're typically, uh, typically distorted in shape like these are, and they typically have a lot of hot young blue stars in them. All right, so here's some statistics on the nature of the ranges of galaxies. So we look at spirals in blue, and they tend to be on the order of a billion or so solar masses up to a trillion or so, just over a trillion solar masses, or a hundred, or, a, or just under a trillion solar masses. The larger, but ellipticals have an enormous range, down to about 100,000 stars, 100,000 masses of the sun. That's what the M sub sun means, means mass, that little target is a symbol meaning the sun, and M means mass. So we're doing this all with respect to the mass of the sun. And that means that ellipticals span from 100,000 times the mass of the sun up to 10 trillion times the mass of the sun for the giant ellipticals. And irregulars are kind of an in-between group that go from about a million times the mass of the sun to some of them can be as large as other spiral galaxies and larger, larger than many spirals. So irregulars kind of span the, span the gamut between them. Now, if we think about the luminosity of them, the luminosity is in different range altogether. Spirals go from about uh, just over just over 10 million times the luminosity of the sun up to just under 100 million times the luminosity of the sun. Whereas ellipticals range from a million times, which is much dimmer because they can be smaller ones, all the way up to a trillion times the luminosity of the sun. And irregulars are down there in the tiny ones, so irregulars tend to be much smaller. So that's because ellipticals range in size and mass. And now we think about the diameters of these things, and this is where it gets really dramatic, is that spiral galaxies are on the order of five kiloparsecs, or about five, five or 15,000 light years, up to about 150,000 light years across, with the Milky Way being about 100,000 light years across. So the Milky Way is on the larger end of the spiral galaxy size. Irregulars are all tiny little things that range from the basically that, that are that are almost like ten times the, the ten times smaller than the Milky Way, up to down to one a uh, one percent of the size of the Milky Way. But ellipticals can range from being really tiny things to catastrophically large things that can be up to ten times the size of the Milky Way. And the largest galaxies known are all giant elliptical galaxies, which which make the spiral galaxy Milky Way look like a tiny, tiny, tiny little brother. So the structure and nature of galaxies are that spirals have a disk, they have a spheroidal component, they have rapid rotation, and the spheroid is puffed up because of the random motions down inside the bulge. Elliptical galaxies, though, are only spheroid, they're only old stars, there's no gas or dust, and spirals do have lots of gas and dust, which we see with the rotation. Uh, and, they're, and all of the rotation of ellipticals is just mostly random. And there might be some slow overall rotation, but the random rotation of the stars dominates the appearance of the, of the, Doppler, of the Doppler side. So basically, if you look at one side of an elliptical compared to the other, you're just not going to see that there's one side is approaching you and one side's going away. Spirals on the other, however, if you can get an edge on, one side's coming towards you, one side's going away. And irregulars, they're just, they're just a mix. They're just a they're chaotic in structure. They have tons of blue stars and, and some rotation, maybe, 
but they're lots of chaotic motion. So they're stirred. All right. And spirals, in terms of how many stars and gas there are, spirals are about 10 to 20% gas, a huge amount of hydrogen gas. Lots of star formation is going on in the disks, and there's a mix of the, I remember Walter Bada's uh, combination of population one and population two. There's a mix of population one and two stars, meaning some old stars, some really ancient stars, and some really new stars. Ellipticals, there ain't no gas nor no dust. And star formation ended a very long time ago, and there's only population two stars. Meaning, even if you take a spectrum of it, you find that even their chemical composition is ancient. Irregular galaxies can be almost all gas. And so there's huge amounts of star formation going on because tons of gas means tons of things that you can make stars out of. So they're pretty much, you see, only population one young stars, meaning O and B and A type stars, or F and Gs, sure, but dominated by the bright ones. And dwarf ellipticals, they're a very, very, very metal poor. And so they may very well be, because of their low mass and small size, are just finally getting to the point where star formation can begin since their formation over 12 billion years ago. So that's really interesting. Dwarf galaxies are most common but are in the universe by number. By number, but not by mass. They're all, and so the, and all of these are either small ellipticals or tiny irregulars. There's no spiral dwarfs, meaning little tiny dwarf galaxies. So remember all those images I showed you with there's little tiny spirals? That's, they're far away. That's what we mean. And the dwarf galaxies might be just smaller versions of the large ones, or they're completely different population of objects, and they seem to be the same, but yet the dwarf galaxies might just have the similar appearance to them, just scaled down, but, they, but, but, but their exact nature is an area of uh, active study. The most important element, though, and the takeaway of this is though that we're going to take in the future, is that galaxies are the basic units of luminous matter in the universe. They are, by basic, what we mean is that they're the things that when we say we're looking at a supercluster of galaxies or a galaxy cluster, now we're not looking at individual stars. We're looking at groups of galaxy clusters, which then also group into groups of groups called superclusters, or just a really big group of galaxies. And so where you find star formation in the universe is in galaxies. Star formation doesn't occur outside of galaxies. Star formation only occurs in galaxies. So therefore, there are, galaxies are the place where heavy elements other than hydrogen and helium are formed in the entire universe. And so you've got to find that the different kinds of galaxies mean that there's something different by how they formed and how they evolved and where they live. And that's what we're going to talk about when we talk about the structure of the universe. And we'll see you next time. Hello, this is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. This time we're going to be talking about colliding and interacting galaxies. Last time we were looking at the Hubble uh, classification of galaxies and saw that many of them look distorted or messed up in some way, and those are the peculiar galaxies. We also indicated that possibly galaxies f are forming by collisions and mergers. So now we're going to see how that actually works. All right, so the first step to think about is that galaxies fill the space around them, uh, unlike stars inside of galaxies, because remember, galaxies are made up of stars, and hundreds of billions of stars, such as these two examples that we see here. The examples that we see below I have, the, have a huge number of stars in them. So the fuzziness of a galaxy isn't because it is gassy, when well, it is very gassy, but it's because of the collected, illuminated light of all the hundreds of billions of stars within them. But the stars themselves don't touch. They're separated by roughly 10 million times their sizes. So stars are incredibly far apart compared to their sizes. However, galaxies, which are assemblages of stars, are actually separated by roughly only about 20 times their diameter. The Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies are roughly about 100,000 light years across and are separated by 2 or 3 million light years. 
So therefore, their distance between is only about 20 times their diameter. So that means galaxies are very likely to encounter each other and collide, unlike the stars that make them up. All right, so the way we will indicate that we understand how things are going are by tidal interactions. And so all interactions that galaxies do, it's not the electromagnetic force or the weak nuclear force or the strong nuclear force or, or I don't know, sailor moon force or something. You can make, make, make it up. But they interact via their gravitational pull between each other. They're extraordinarily large. And because of that, the near side gets pulled on by more than the far side. And so they get stretched out. So the tides distort the shape of the galaxy. When we say tides, what we really mean is the differential gravitational pull or the difference in gravity pull between one object and another compared to their center of mass. So peculiar galaxies occur in interacting pairs. That's very frequently what we see. And so here's that image again. We see the two spiral galaxies interacting, and there's another pair of spirals from the Hercules cl cl cluster of galaxies. And this is what we might think of as a high tide. Notice that the Whirlpool galaxy seems to be elongated towards the elliptical with which it's having an encounter. So it's getting squished along the line of sight and stretched, squished towards the line, the line between them and stretched along the line between them. And in so doing, when there are interactions, you should expect to see massive amounts of star formation, which is what you do. See all those pink glows? That's because the gravitational pull between that is, well, the, 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 the shocks that are occurring because of the tidal interactions are causing the gas clouds to merge and collide and form stars rapidly. So you get tidal stretching along the line between the two of them. And that's what we see with the ARP, ARP 87 interacting galaxies. And when they're called, this, what this group is called ARP because after Halton ARP, who is an amazing observer, and his, he found a whole bunch of very, very strange things. So if you look for the ARP catalog of galaxies, you're going to see all sorts of really interesting, peculiar galaxies. All right. So here's another peculiar galaxy called the Tadpole, which has an enormous, uh, enormous uh, tidal tail. And then we see the mice, which also has an enormous tidal tail, pair of tails, as they're interacting. And notice they, you have a huge number of blue stars, and then you have these yellowish cores, which are in the process of merging. And here's another beautiful interacting pair as they swing around each other. These interactions take quite a long time. They'll take up to a billion years or so to fully complete. And it's important to remember that we see stars... Also, the stars have spikes, and the starry spikiness that we're going to see here, those are all foreground Milky Way stars. They are not distanced. They are distant in the sense that they're tens to thousands of light years away. But the fuzzy clouds that look like the galaxies, those are millions of light years away, or tens of millions of light years away. And if you look very carefully at these images that I'm showing you, you'll find that there's actually little tiny galaxies far, far, far in the distance that are extraordinarily small, and they are much more distant galaxies, maybe a hundred million light years away or greater. All right, here we go. So computer simulations show that they take about a billion years to conduct this dance of collision. So this is not a fast thing, even though they're traveling at hundreds of kilometers per second or up to thousands of kilometers per second. The sizes are so enormous at, the, at uh, hundreds of thousands of light years across that it really does take billions of years for the, for the interaction to occur. And so you take the simple rules of Newton's laws of motion, you take his law of gravity, you plug it into a computer, you then try to take into account other things, say dark matter, which we talked about with the Milky Way in the previous lecture. But the, um, if you take all those things into account, then you see the shapes occurring. So if you have taken into account all of the mass, all the underlying mass, and then look at tracking the individual particles, and you might call clusters of stars particles or big clouds of gas particles, and then you, if the models match the observations, then we know we're on the right track. Some number of them that occur that people have done, Dr. Dubinsky over at Canadian Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics has created a wonderful series of videos that you can go check out. There's his website and there's others that occur as well. And direct galaxy occlusions are really, really, really pronounced when they occur. And when you have very, very tight collisions where the cores come very close to each other, 
there's a huge amount of what we call starburst activity. And starburst activity means the clouds of gas and dust collide and uh, get over dense and form stars very, very, very rapidly. All right. So what did uh, what they did in with the whole group is that this this set of images was used to kind of help guide that uh, that group of that simulation that we saw. So Summers took these images and rotated around, and basically this is what you get when you take a couple of spiral galaxies that are similarly sized and just slam them into each other from various angles. The disks of the galaxies get distorted, tidally disrupted, and all depends on the orientation that they come in at. So that's this is what they look like when you have two radically interacting galaxies. And we see that now that we have a good computer simulation that seems to be doing exactly what we see in nature, we think we're on the right track. So there's a good close-up of one of them showing the starburst activity in the ring formation, and another one that shows more star formation in both of the galaxies. And here's one that's showing incredible tidal disruption. Again, look at the tiny, tiny, tiny distant galaxies far, far away in the background. We can see that the blue stars are actually being stripped away from the center and actually sent out way out and away from the tidal interaction. So the gas clouds had formed and the blue stars were essentially just left behind as they are forming. So we can see that the interaction is happening on the order of hundreds of millions or tens of millions of, of years because those blue stars trace out a time frame of about 10 to 100 million years. Okay. There's another one we see where the intense star formation actually happening right in the center. And then finally, here's another gorgeous pair that show interaction and star formation all throughout it with the hydrogen gas clouds going pink, the blue star clusters uh, appearing all over the place. And we can tell that this is extremely distant because we they, they're out of focus and or more specifically they're not resolved and since they're not resolved into individual stars those blue dots aren't individual stars but huge groups of stars many thousands or tens of thousands of blue type stars being formed all at once and here's arc 273 sometimes called the rose which is an enormous uh, beautiful looking um, uh, interacting pair and we can see that the Hubble Space Telescope image can certainly bring out the, the more interesting aspects to it. And this is the Stefan's Quintet which is a four which is actually four interacting galaxies and the bluish one in the, is in the foreground but the four interacting galaxies are certainly uh, certainly having an extreme interaction with respect to each other and if we rotate around and look at this image from a slightly different angle, this is the Hubble Space Telescope image merged with the Chandra X-ray image. And if we go back and forth between the Chandra X-ray image and the Optical Plus X-ray image, we see that the hot X-ray gas is being created in that area where the stars are forming extraordinarily rapidly. So. X-ray emitting gas is being heated to tens of millions of degrees as black holes and neutron stars are being formed in great rapidity there. So you can have ring-like encounters as well, and if one, a small galaxy goes smack through the middle of it and hits a bullseye, then you can create a circular wave of, of, tidal, of star formation, such as we see here. And this is a Hubble Space Telescope image that shows a very, very, very violent interaction between a little galaxy that literally went smack through the center. Uh, the little galaxy got completely disrupted, but, the, but it sh sent shock waves through the rest of it, which then filter out through the rest of the galaxy and form a ring sort of splash like um, uh, ring of star formation. And we see ring type galaxies all over the place. There are many examples of ring galaxies that must have had very very close encounters with very with smaller galaxies that are then disrupted. And there's another one ARP 147 that shows a ring like structure 
as well as another ring, a double ring type structure going through. Starburst galaxies are another classification that we have, and what, that's what we're really are calling these things. And starburst galaxies can be seen by their spectra as well as by their images. And starburst galaxies create huge, huge, huge output, and that and that enormous, enormous output. Um, what it'll do is it'll create very, very short-lived O and B type stars, which are incredibly hot and luminous, and they make the star at the galaxy extraordinarily bright. And what happens is, though, that these, these O and B stars make shock waves that cascade through and burn up all of the gas in the galaxy within a few million years, leaving it with some blue patches, but then a bunch of red stars. So effectively, they wipe out all of the all of the gas that's left in there, and the supernovae that are triggered by these O and B stars within a few million years create enormous winds that blow the gas and dust out of the galaxies. And so intense star formation also comes with enormous winds. And this is the antennae, which are a, group, which are a very fast interacting galaxy group. And the core of the antennae shows a vigorous, vigorous star formation. We can zoom in on this Hubble image and see huge scads of blue-type stars, uh, red regions of star formation, where H2 regions, these pink glowing clouds, where H2 regions indicate hot ionized gas. And then we have extremely turbulent areas where lots of gas and dust are forming many, many, many stars extremely rapidly. And they will form shockwaves and supernovae, which will blow the gas out of the entire galaxy very soon. And here we see a region that is coming out of a density wave and forming huge numbers of O and B type stars. And the pink glows, of course, hydrogen. The dark areas are dust. And the, uh, the glows of the stars are actually tens of thousands of hot O and B type stars, all seen in one galaxy group called the antennae, the core of a pair of interacting galaxies. And here it is also in the ALMA uh, array, which is, a, which is in microwaves, which will show um, where a lot more gas and dust are. All right, so another great interacting pair is, is M81 and M82, and they are classic interacting pair of galaxies. Sorry about that. We had a, they're a classic interacting pair of galaxies, M81 and M82. They're about 12 million light years away. The one on the left is M81, the one on the right is M82. And the one on the left is sometimes called Bode's Nebula. And we, what we see is that they have recently interacted and deep imagery also shows that the two of them have a gas streamer between them. But we can see in pink hydrogen off to the right, some huge super winds coming off of M82. And now we're going to focus in on that and the active galaxy M82 that we just saw in the other image, we just rotated around and zoomed in and the Hubble Space Telescope took a series of interesting images of it. And that pink glow shows enormous, enormous winds coming off of M82 and those, that is all hydrogen gas. It's being blown out by the star formation and shock waves from previous supernovae in huge numbers, maybe thousands upon thousands of supernovae that are happening all within the last few million years. There was a type 1a supernova that just occurred a couple of years ago in M82, um, but you know that's probably part of the residual of the formation of such things. So keep watching M82. It's actually something you can see with a small telescope in your backyard. It's not that dim. It's actually something you can see very easily with uh, not necessarily binoculars, but definitely an eight inch scope can definitely pick it out of the sky. So when do galaxies merge, if they collide, and there's enough dissipation of the orbital energy, meaning they don't get they don't get flung apart, they don't swing around each other, not going so fast that they just swing by, then eventually they can just they they can the the angular momentum gets distributed throughout the entire system and distributed out, and it can lose that orbital energy by dispersing the stars that make up the components. That then makes the gas clouds collide, that forms new stars and then the entire thing merges into one thing, one big galaxy. So mergers appear to play an incredibly important role in galaxy formation and evolution. In fact, we think that the Milky Way was formed by a construction or, form or a collision of many small little galaxies over its 10 billion year lifespan. 
And if we think about it, we even now know today that the Milky Way has stellar streams that we talked about in the Formation Evolution lecture previously. And that is, we would call it galactic cannibalism. So if you have a slow encounter between a large and small galaxy, the smaller one gets torn apart and slowly merges in. So it's not like you get this ring effect, but the little one comes in nice and slow and just gets shredded apart as it comes in slow. So giant ellipticals also may grow um, by the fact that if you take very large galaxies at very slow motions, then they will actually come together relatively slowly and their cores will stay intact and that will create a giant elliptical galaxy. So here are some other processes of, of, of galaxies that are in the process or the final stages of merging over the next 100 million, 200, 300, 500, 700 million years. There's another one where we're showing two tidal tails that are coming out and the cores are almost completely merged. And here's one that we're showing two spiral galaxies in the process of merging. They've just begun that. I think we showed that one earlier. And here's one from the Swift uh, Telescope. And the Swift Telescope sees things in, the, in, in ultraviolet. So what we're seeing is when we see, uh, this is a Higgs and Compact group, one of them, I forget which one. But this particular compact group shows enormous numbers of blue hot stars being formed in the ultraviolet. So we can see that ultraviolet is emitted by O and B type stars. And that's what this mostly picks out. So we're looking at extraordinarily vigorous star formation of young stars. And there's another one, kind of a fuzzy one. I don't know why from that. Uh, the pole, and we have a ring type galaxy, a polar ring type galaxy, where you have some sort of a, 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 a pair of rings pulled together. And this is another Hubble, Hubble image of, of a pair of interacting galaxies. And this is a, a really beautiful one that kind of looks like a pair of owl eyes as they are interacting together. And as they collide together, they're going to distort each other over the next billion years and form one big galaxy. There's another one with a ring type structure that happened as, as these two galaxies collided and formed enormous star formation in the, in, the, uh, in the ring. There's another one we see off to the side and some other tiny galaxies all around it. There's a good one that's another ARP interacting galaxy and so on and so on and so on. Part of the reason I'm showing you all these things is because there's a visual vocabulary that comes with astronomy. And the visual vocabulary is so exotic. These pictures could be hung in museums. And in fact, look at this one. This is absolutely gorgeous. Most of the stars, the points, are actually stars of the Milky Way. But we're seeing a pair of interacting galaxies far, far, far in the distance, millions of long, tens or twelve, twenty, many tens of millions of light years away. But the stars in the Milky Way are in front of it. And they're only hundreds to thousands of light years away. There's another one, and they're very fascinating things, but also look at the distant ones in the background. When we said that galaxies make up most of the universe, we really do mean that. And so we see that these objects, they're not little galaxies, they're far galaxies that look little. And that's what's interesting about these clear sky ones that are looking up away from the plane of the Milky Way. You see interactions no matter where you look. In fact, peculiar bright galaxies are happening all over the place. This visual vocabulary serves to show you how many things are in the sky and what we can see and that galaxy collisions are extraordinarily common. And as they occur throughout the history of the cosmos, they build up larger and larger and larger galaxies until we get to things like Milky Ways and so forth. And this is an enormous, enormous a study that can be done of many, many, many galaxies. There are hundreds of millions of galaxies in the cosmos. And as we look out in that, we see huge numbers of them floating around. And wow. But we talked in originally about the collision between Milky Way and Andromeda. Right now, we know the Milky Way is approaching us at about 120 kilometers per second. And so in about three or four billion years, the Milky Way and Andromeda are going to collide. And they're going to tidally distort and merge after about a billion or so years. And the elliptical, giant elliptical that should remain will be called Milkometer. John Dubinsky has a really great uh, metamorphosis that shows this. And it's a wonderful, wonderful image. I invite you to go check out his website. But I'm going to actually go with the Hubble Space Telescope group that showed exactly how we know this. 
And we look at the Andromeda galaxy, and if you look at the edge of the Andromeda, way away from, from the distant, 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 from the bright core, but way out in the outer reaches, many of the stars that are in the tiny area have a significant amount of proper motion. There's proper motion to them. There's a Doppler shift to these stars that are in this field. So many of the stars in the highlighted area are actually part of the Andromeda galaxy, not part of our Milky Way. So if we zoom in and look, we can see there's some background objects too, but inside of this study, there are about 10,000 stars from the Andromeda galaxy. And inside that one little field, this one field, there are over 200 distant background galaxies. So if you go hunting, you can find them literally everywhere. And that target field, by comparison, is just about the same size as one of the large Mare on the moon. On the moon. So the moon itself would cover up hundreds of thousands of galaxies every night as it passes through across the sky. All right, so how do they do this? Well, over time, the Hubble, they took a series of observations to see how these things had moved. And so there was some motion of them with Doppler shift, as well as a proper motion, meaning a motion across the sky. And all you have to do is, and if it's a fast enough motion, meaning, well, if you're coming 120 kilometers per second, you should see something. And so it's just separated by about a decade or so, five to 10 years. You should see some move motion of the Andromeda stars relative to the 200 distant background galaxies, because they're gonna be fixed, they're not moving anywhere. Or they are moving, but they're so far away that their motions are incredibly tiny compared to the stars in front of them. And the stars in front of them should have some uniform motion. And we're just trying to measure that uniform motion. And as a result of that measurement, it was discovered that the, uh, that the Andromeda galaxy was moving approximately 120 kilometers per second towards us, and we will have an encounter with it in about three billion years. And so uh, the group the group made a uh, an interesting video to kind of show you the encounter as it will occur in the distant, distant, distant future. The Triangulum Galaxy is a satellite galaxy to the Milky Way and Andromeda. And eventually will end up being a satellite galaxy to Milkometa. And what's fascinating is there is the encounter that we saw that's very similar to the encounters that we saw in many, many other things. So Milky Way and Andromeda will take over a billion years. Look at the time frame that's occurring. It's already a half a billion years to go through the after the first encounter. And now it's a billion years later where the two cores get close, another half a billion years just for them to merge completely. And notice they went from kind of blue to now yellow, as all the stars were, were burned out, that were young and hot, and were left with only the red dwarf type stars in copious amounts. And so after about seven billion years, well after the sun has died out and become a white dwarf, Milky Way and Andromeda will have collided together and formed one huge giant elliptical galaxy. And so this is some of the things that we, if Earth were to have survived, this might be the view that we would see. Here is the view from the present day with Milk, with the Andromeda galaxy very far in the distance with our Milky Way in the foreground. And then in about a bill, two billion years, the, the Andromeda galaxy will be enormous. It'll be much larger than the moon in the sky. It will be a, a, quite a picture in two billion years. In about four billion years, it will span most of the night sky. And when the Andromeda rises in the sky, it will be an astonishing view. And about four, and very soon thereafter, the tidal distortion will be occurring. There will be huge amounts of star formation as the Milky Way itself gets distorted. Orion nebulas will blossom in the sky, and there will be numerous supernovae to keep everybody distracted. And then when we look at the, in about four billion years, there will be so much star formation that people will be able to read by the, by the numerous supernovae that are occurring in the sky, whose light will last for months. And so there will be a strange element of lack of night due to all of the bright stars in the sky. After about four billion years, they, the Andromeda galaxy will have, will have passed by and we'll see an enormous, uh, a, a tidally distorted Milky Way all messed up with Andromeda not looking half as much as, half as beautiful as it did. That gray just looks kind of old. And then finally, 
about five billion years ago, the core, five billion years from today, the cores will get closer and closer together. And eventually in about eight billion years or seven or eight billion years, it, there will be in a giant elliptical galaxy. And there will be no more Orion nebulas. They will be gone. There will be no more tarantula nebulas. They will be gone. They will all be gone in a huge burst of star formation with no, no gas or dust, but just this yellow glow of billions upon billions of stars in the sky. And that's the future for the view of the Andromeda galaxy. And this came from uh, NASA and the Hubble Space Telescope and a group with LeVay and Vandermel and uh, Hallis and Mellinger over at NASA at Space Telescope. So I'd just take a, go take a look at those wonderful videos that are on that. I provided the link there at the bottom and we'll see you next time. This is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. We're really moving right along here and we have just looked at the Milky Way and the types of galaxies in the cosmos and then we looked at the interacting galaxies and we mentioned that galaxies are really big compared to their sizes but we also saw that galaxies in the distance are really really far and I asserted in the previous lecture that in the interacting galaxy images that we saw of a huge number we saw lots of little galaxies at extraordinary distances and they gave numbers like hundreds of millions of light years or billions of light years distant. So really, nobody's ever been there. So how do we know those distances? And basically, now we're getting close to the beginning of the study of cosmology. Cosmology is the study of the entire universe. And we're going to be looking at the physics of the whole universe, how things are distributed on big scales, how things move on big scales, how the universe has changed from, beginning to the, from the beginning of time to the future and what the age of the universe is, how it began, and what ultimately it will become. So cosmology is broken up into four big pieces. There's four pieces, but I call zero homogeneous isotropy because it's kind of a zero thing as its underlying assumption. And we're gonna look at mostly number four and, now, and getting to know number one. Number one is redshift, which is the key way that we know of distances in the Big Bang. And again, we always must remember the cosmological principle says that there's really nothing special about our location. It's just our home. That makes it really special because, you know, you can't quite live on a white dwarf and you can't quite live on Mars yet. I mean, maybe someday Elon Musk will take us there. And we don't live on Pluto yet. We can't travel between the stars yet. So the ho our place is our home right now, and that makes it special. But we apply the idea that Really, the laws of physics must be the same everywhere that they are here. So with that idea, and we look around on the cosmos, the cosmological principle says there's nothing special, meaning every, we're, we're in no other different place. But yet you notice that when we look at the sky, we see that basically everything in the sky is roughly the same thing in every direction. It's called isotropy. And if you combine it with the cosmological principle, it says that nothing's really special, then isotropy isn't really that special. So therefore, everything is pretty much homogeneous everywhere. And so that means anybody on any galaxy ever seen by anyone, if they have people out there on those distant, distant, distant stars, then they would see the sky roughly the same way we do. Maybe there'll be more galaxies, maybe less. Maybe there'll be more supernova, maybe more gas, maybe less. But they're going to see galaxies, they're going to see supernovae, they're going to see uh, stars and planets like we do. So it's going to be the same stuff. So now we're going to look at how we know the distances to the, co to the galaxies. And so we start from the idea of Hubble's law. And Hubble's law is something very interesting that said, wow, there's a, well, we're going to get to it next time, really the detail about Hubble's law. But basically, the Hubble's law relates the distance, d, to the recession speed of the galaxy, how fast its redshift indicates it's rushing away from us. And so it's proportional to, the distance is proportional to the speed v, the, the, the speed that's rushing away from us, which is inversely proportional to the Hubble constant, which is h naught. And that is for nearby galaxies. And for nearby galaxies, we can simply measure what's called the redshift. And the redshift is z. 
and z is the shift in the wavelength of light from its rest wavelength cut times the speed of light c divided by h naught. So the trick is we've got to figure out how to get this h naught number because how do we know what the heck it is? All right. Our goal is to find this magic number that gives us the distances to the far, far galaxies. And we'll just describe its, uh, its origin next time. But there's no real way you can get it universally. I mean, it begins with extraordinary expansion, as we'll see next time. So we're going to look at the way we get up to redshift. And the idea of redshift was known for a long time, since the 1920s. That's how Edwin Hubble determined how far things are. But we're going to look at that more carefully soon. But there's no one single distance method that gets you everywhere across the entire universe. Some things are good for close things. Some things are good for far things. Some things are good for really far things that aren't really too far. And so we call this a bootstrap process. You pull one of your, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you get yourself out the door. So we find distances to near objects and then you find something like that near object at a farther object that encompasses it or is next to it. And then you calibrate that you find some new way of seeing something that's farther and presumably brighter and easier to see than the thing that was closer that was relatively dim and can't be seen from so far away. The trick is though, and this makes it really problem, is that errors get made. Mistakes are made. <laughs> so let's look at the nearby thing. Way, way, way back, we talked about uh, Henrietta Leavitt's luminosity period relationship for Cepheids that she discovered. And that is one of the most important relationships, but it can only get you about to about 100,000 or so light years, or 150 million, I'm sorry, to 150 million light years or so. And that's if you use the Hubble Space Telescope. But that's hard to do with the Hubble Space Telescope because you need lots and lots of time, hundreds of Hubble orbits, and that means you have to have one of the best reasons ever to actually go hunting for Cepheids in some really, really distant location because the Hubble Space Telescope is an extremely expensive thing to run and people don't give up their orbits very well and you have to put in a decent proposal to, so that you can push people away because there's only so many times that the Hubble Space Telescope can orbit, its, can orbit the Earth in its lifespan. So use it wisely. Finally, Cepheid relationships only really work for spiral and irregular galaxies because that's where the star formation is going on. You've got to have young, hot stars in order to make Cepheids. And so the farthest you can really get with Cepheids, since you can actually try to identify individual Cepheids, is about the Virgo cluster of galaxies, which is about 60 million light years away or so, 65 million light years away. That, at 65 million light years away, is very nearby in terms of the universe. All of the galaxies that we looked at in those interacting things are within 10 to 20 to up to 50 or 70 or less than 100 million light years away. And the things in the background were much, much, much further. So really we're trying to get to the, the grandest size scales, how we can know things that are billions of light years away, not just millions. So here is what we call the cosmic distance ladder, where we start with parallaxes get pro and use proper motions and main sequence fitting or cluster diagrams. Hyades is critical. Cepheids and, Lumin and the RR Lyries get you out to the Large Magellanic Cloud and out to Virgo Cluster with the Hubble. And then you have something called the Tully-Fisher relationship and type 1a supernovae and other bright objects, which get you out to the Coma Cluster, which is about 10 to the 8th parsecs. And then finally, you can really start calibrating the redshifts out there. All right, so our first step is measuring the astronomical unit. And we talked about this many times in the past. The AU is the, the average or mean Earth-Sun distance. It's about 150 million kilometers. And you measure by geometric triangulation. You bounce some radar off of Venus when it is at quarter phase, meaning you see Venus as, a half, as half illuminated in the sky. And that means it's at a right triangle with respect to the sun. And so you get an angle between the sun and Venus, and that's not 90 degrees, but the angle between that the sun and your Earth make with respect to Venus is 90 degrees. Bounce some radar off of Venus because it's very reflective. Get you a distance to Venus. You can use high school trigonometry in order to get the distance to Venus. Now, Copernicus and many others have determined that the orbits of the planets have relative sizes, and you can look at the size of the orbits and their relative things and get all their relative distances. So 
The main thing to measure is the astronomical unit, because once you get that, then you can get the relative distances to all the planets. And if you determine the astronomical unit, you can get the trigonometric parallax to the stars. And once again, way back, we talked about trig trigonometric parallax. You got to know the astronomical unit, which is the radius of the Earth's orbit around the sun. And that allows you to calculate those little tiny angles that stars seem to make as the Earth goes around the sun in a year. Remember that the typical parallax is less than, is always less than one arc second. And an arc second is about the same size as a regulation NFL football held 37 miles away. So that's a really small angular size. So the nice thing is, is that stellar parallax has recently got a huge burst at 2016 with the first release of the Gaia data set by the European Space Agency. And they've released their second data set recently. So there's lots and lots and lots of data. Up until then, it was just ground-based stuff that got you out to about 100 parsecs and Hipparchus satellite, which only got to about 1,000 parsecs. And now, with this data, you can get the absolute distances to things. If you can get the absolute distances, you can, get, you can use the inverse square law for brightness to get their luminosities. And so we can use that to get spectroscopic parallax. So what we do is we find typical clusters of stars, and the prototypical cluster is the Hyades cluster. And we make an HR diagram based on its, based on the difference in brightness in two colors, the B minus V and two different filters, and compare it to the brightness seen in the V, or the, that's a standard color magnitude diagram, or HR diagram. And the shape that it makes is it has a, the Hyades has a distinct main sequence, and we figure that all stars are the same in the cosmos. So if a if a main sequence is below another main sequence, that's because it's farther, not because it's a different kind of main sequence. No, it's just that it's farther. Maybe it's made up of a slightly different population, but that population would only that but that doesn't account for huge differences in in the HR diagrams. The major differences between the brightnesses of a full HR diagram between two clusters is because of the relative distance. And so diffraction limited viewing gets you out to see star clusters out to the large Magellanic Cloud, which is about 100 kiloparsecs away, or thereabouts. And, uh, and you can get to, and you can make out, and that allows you to be able to make out individual stars. You have to be able to make out individual stars in clusters to create an HR diagram. And roughly the distance of the, mag of the Large Magellanic Cloud is the, is the length. Now, it's good that the Large Magellanic Cloud is there because it has a huge amount of star formation going on. And because it's got a lot of star formation going on, it's got a lot of young clusters. If it's got a lot of young clusters, it's got a lot of Cepheids. If it's got a lot of Cepheids, then you can calibrate the Cepheids from that. So this is really good. So now we can look at the Cepheid variables, which are the next step up. And the Hyades gives us the basis for all star clusters, because now you can get the physics of the star clusters and you get the absolute brightness, because you can get a very, because the Hyades are only about 150 light years away. And then you can use that, the Hyades, to get other young clusters. Remember that Cepheids are supergiant stars in young clusters. They're about to die. And there are tons of these clusters, as I said, in the large Magellanic Cloud. And there, since the LMC, well, you know, once you're 200,000 light years away, you know, one or two light years back and forth doesn't really matter. So what you do is you look at all the star clusters that you can find in the large Magellanic Cloud, make a generic HR diagram out of them, and then fit that HR diagram to what you see for the Hyades. And if you can do that thing, then you can get the relative distance to the large Magellanic Cloud. And if you can get that, then you can find specific Cepheid variables, which are much brighter than most of the stars in any of the clusters, and that allows you to match it up. So then you can get a calibration for the Cepheid variables. So these are so, so, so bright that they can get you out even farther than is possible with main sequence fitting. And so, uh, but the thing is, is that you can only really get out to about the Virgo cluster of galaxies with Cepheid variables. That's about 60 million light years away. And you have to look in spiral galaxies because, you know, there's got to be star clusters and there's got to be formation going on. Ellipticals don't have star formation, so you ain't going to find Cepheids. Funny thing is, though, is that spirals aren't as bright as the brightest ellipticals, and ellipticals are far more numerous. Okay, so there's our standard thing. The large Magellanic Cloud is littered with them, and we've got to find more. Finally, next, well, next we keep going up in scale, and we're starting to get a little desperate now because, well, 
things that are really, really, really bright that can be seen for, you know, 70 or 80 or 100 million light years away, well, those things are pretty rare. They're by definition rare, but you got to take what you can get. And so you find, you find uh, maybe you can find type 1a supernovae, which are standard candles of some sense, because they all, they happen in a very specific way as the star explodes, because the white dwarf explodes, because it just gets 10 extra molecule uh, atoms of hydrogen on it and explodes exactly the same way each time. So therefore it's a type of standard candle. Now you can also get a relationship for planetary nebulae, which are dying star, which are the shells of dying stars. So the brightest planetary nebulae are probably at roughly the same brightness because they all come from roughly the same kinds of stars. So if you find bright planetary nebulae, you can make a relationship for their rough luminosities and get something out of that. Also, you can say, well, what are the distribution and sizes of globular clusters in the Milky Way? And by studying globular clusters in the Milky Way, you can determine roughly their how globular clusters go in terms of their luminosities. And so hopefully you can make out something with that. That's all some tricks though, but the real thing is we got to find Cepheid variables to get to the spirals and hope you can find something in there in that spiral that helps you. So these things mix and match and max and niche and you can, and basically Cepheids are the most important thing. But the, but the good thing about getting out to the Virgo cluster is it starts to start to the very beginnings of getting us a local estimate of the expansion rate of the cosmos. Now the Virgo cluster is approaching, the local group is approaching the Virgo cluster. So it's a little tricky and you've got to take it into a lot of motions and things like that, but we can get, we're getting close. Now then we can do a new thing is once we have a distance to the Virgo cluster, we can assume that galaxies are similar objects to nearby ones. Remember when we did the Herschel's did star counts? Well, people do that with galaxies too. And we assume that certain kinds of galaxies are certain kinds of luminosities and it, it gets kind of dicey. But if you look at enough of them, you can find correlations between luminosity and some distance independent property. And large samples also help you remove the Doppler effect due to redshift um, of the motions of intrinsic galaxies during their space. And that's called their peculiar motion. Finally, the most there's two major, major things that are looked at, and they're called one of them is called the Tully Fisher relationship for spiral galaxies. And it's found that galaxies have a spiral galaxies have a luminosity that's related to their rotation speed. And you can use 21 centimeter radio emission in order to determine the rotation rate. And that's a very specific wavelength. And it's not littered with a bunch of other stuff, and it's very and 21 centimeter is pretty bright and can be seen for a very long, a very great distance. Also, there is a relationship in elliptical galaxies between the absolute luminosity of a galaxy and the and the line widths of these of of the of, of the large of the of the absorption features inside of the elliptical galaxy. So, you can measure the absorption line widths of the spectra. And the, the absorption line widths are a measurement of the random motions of the stars in the elliptical galaxy. And the more, more random motions there are, the broader the lines. The broader their lines there means more motions, which means that there's more gravity. If there's more gravity, there's more mass. So you can determine a relationship between if there's more mass, then there'll be more luminosity. And if you get an HR diagram of a kind of a population two sort of thing with all these ancient galaxies, then maybe you can make a relationship between the width of the, of the absorption lines of, a spir of an elliptical galaxy to its absolute luminosity. And that's also how we get the large mass differentials between them as well as by looking at this particular relationship. So let's take, let's go back to pretty pictures because pretty pictures are always fun. This is a wonderful image of the, of the Virgo cluster of galaxies, which is in the constellation, of course, of Virgo. It's about 70 million light years away, but let's zoom in on the, on the center of it. And if we zoom in on the center of it, we find we have a couple of ellipticals, but we have a few spiral galaxies and those spiral galaxies, we can measure their rotation speeds. And why do we measure the rotation speeds? The faster they spin, the more massive they are. The more massive they are, the more stars they have. The more stars they have, the brighter they are. This particular thing only works with, with spirals, and the Virgo cluster has a number of spiral galaxies. So the Tully-Fisher relationship, which is a distinct relationship between the rotation rate of a spiral galaxy seen edge on, 
and its luminosity, therefore its mass, is actually something that is very important in in looking for in looking for distances to, to clusters of galaxies and individual galaxies too. So the Tully-Fisher relationship works for works for spirals, and all of these spirals can have their distances measured in this similar way. And we have, our, of course, our, our face model uh, for, from wherever, whatever magazine, finding that in 21 centimeter radiation, exactly what happens, how do we measure this thing, is that the spiral galaxy, the hydrogen gas, is emitting at a specific wavelength of light. And each of the three little graphs shows the wavelength that it's emitting in a narrow band. However, if it's approaching us, if it's in a gas cloud that's approaching us, the frequency of the 21 centimeter radiation will be blue shifted towards a shorter wavelength. Maybe it's 19 centimeters. And if it's in the center, it will be unshifted, so it stays at 21. And if it's red shifted, maybe it's 25 centimeters or 23 centimeters or something like that. And the greater, and so when you add up the entire thing, you can't necessarily make the entire, make out the entire galaxy unless it's very nearby, say in the Virgo cluster then you can say, oh, this is a spiral galaxy. It's got a really broad emission line. If it's got a broad emission line, because you add up all this stuff together, then you see that it must be rotating fast. And the, the faster it's rotating, the brighter it is, because the brighter it is, the more massive it is. The more massive it is, the more stars it has. And for spirals, that means bright stars and O and B type stars. All right, so the Tully-Fisher relationship is probably one of the most important relationships in that is used for cosmic distance studies, uh, because it's it's a very it, they're very very bright. You don't have to wait for serendipitous things like supernovae, and you can't and try to try to hunt out and scour out a whole bunch of tiny little point sources like planetary nebulae or bright or bright supergiants or something like that. No, you just say find me some galaxies. I'll take their rotation rates and I'll. I'll Try to get a relationship between them, and so Tully and Fisher made a really good made a made a lot of hay out of this thing. And so all you have to do is is calibrate it with a whole bunch of different relationships, and event and use utilizing the distance to the Virgo cluster and calibrating the Tully Fisher relationship using that. And then all you do is say, okay, what's the rotation rate? And determine that the faster it's rotating, the more massive it is. The more massive it is, the more luminous it is. And so we can get the luminosity in terms of comparison to the sun. All right, once you've calibrated the Tully-Fisher relationship, you may keep going further to find things that are even brighter than spiral galaxies because maybe that 21 centimeter line is dim or fuzzy or hard to find. And those things are like the like a type 1a supernovae. And with all of that, then we can finally get out probably to redshift, and all these things get you about to about a billion parsecs or a gigaparsec. And the last thing you're hunting for is redshift distances. Redshift is as the thing that comes after everything else. So each remember each one of these steps was calibrated on the on the feet of the one before it. Each step depended on accurate measurements of the one before it. And so you're trying to measure that finally. If you can get accurate distances to dis far galaxies, then if you can measure their redshifts, we find that the farther away the galaxy is, the greater the redshift it is. So we can then estimate, like we had that equation right back at the beginning, where we said, what's the distance? It depends on the speed with which it's rushing away from us. And in nearby galaxies, out to a few hundred million light years, uh, 100, maybe a half, a, maybe half a billion light years. It's pretty much a linear relationship, like we saw. So the Hubble relationship is a is a measurement of the expansion rate of the universe. And so all we have to think now is that the redshift is a good distance indicator because the farther away they are, the faster they're rushing away from each other. And now once we've calibrated the Hubble relationship, we can then measure things. The distances to very far galaxies simply by taking a spectra and seeing what the redshift is. So all of these things are critical, critical, critical measurements. And of course, the most critical distance is to the Large Magellanic Cloud, which calibrates the Cepheids. And the Cepheids then get tweaked because maybe we find a Type 1a supernovae floating around. And that's really important because those are extraordinarily bright beacons that can be seen up to billions of light years. And since it's about not doppel shifts, doppler shifts, 
we have to actually understand how galaxies are moving in space because we need to study because they're not just standing still they are moving like the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way are going to collide in four billion years in about four billion years so galaxies are on the move and that can add to the Doppler shift so the nice thing to know is that lots of different measurements and lots of different ways to calibrate the uh, the redshift relation give almost all the same results between 60 and 67 69 kilometers per second per megaparsec therefore what this means is every megaparsec every 300 million light years 3 million light years every 3 million light years a galaxy is rushing away maybe 70 kilometers per second faster to 6 million light years it's rushing 140 kilometers per second away at 10 million light years it's rushing uh, with 30 million light years it's rushing 700 kilometers per second away from us so the faster it's rushing the farther it is and what's nice is there's many ways to measure this and they're really close to each other so here's some recent stuff the most recent uh, major work that's been done the first was in 2012 by the WMAP probe, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, and they quoted the, uh, the expansion rate at about 69 or so, plus or minus 0.8. So you can see what the error bars are, which has, demonstrates how well they know their data. And so that's about 69-ish or so, and it's pretty good, and it's very, these are incredible measurements. We're in the era of precision cosmology. David Sperger would get mad at me for calling it pretty good. This is an astonishing achievement with the WMAP. And then the uh, European Space Agency's Planck mission came along and did some revisions and made some tension with that by giving by quoting something in 2015 about 67.8 or so. And that's really close to the WMAP, but there's some tension there. And then finally, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, looks at various things, uh, it looks at galaxy clustering. Um, and that helps how galaxies cluster is also part is also affected by the expansion rate. They came out in 2016, and they give something that's very, very close to the, the Planck mission. And finally, there was a really good measurement that was done by looking at gravitationally lensed objects. And that's in the, then gravitationally lensed objects traver, um, show, the, show how light has mo moved through space as the universe has expanded underneath it on lines of sight. So the Holy Cow group, and yes, that is the exact name of the group, is called Holy Cow. Um, you can go look it up. It's really wonderful. And November 2016 gave a rather large number that was well outside the error bars of everybody else. And that provided what a little bit of a tweaky problem for many people. And at the, Dece the January 2017 meeting of the American Astronomical Society, this was a major source of concern um, for a lot of people. And but but. But the thing is, is that this is, they're all in really close agreement. We're no longer in the time where I was when I was in college, where people didn't know if it was 50 or if it was 100. And the, it was off by a factor of two. Now people are getting really, really close with these measurements. And numerous teams are getting numbers that are very close to each other. But this means that we're in the era of precision cosmology where we will actually discover the expansion rate. And maybe it's dependent on direction, maybe not. But uh, these, these measurements are, are very good and show that the, the expansion is robust and can be measured in many different ways. So we have really big questions that we're going to be asking in the future. And exactly what is the Hubble parameter? What's the great expansion rate of the universe? What's the age of the universe? How did it expand in the past? And what will it go to in the future? And next time we're going to be talking about what is this redshift Hubble parameter thing anyway to begin with? Because I just talked about it like you knew about it and you probably might have heard about it and you might not know anything about it but you're about to learn something about it so stick around and you'll see what's gonna uh, you'll learn about the redshift next time see you soon Hi, this is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Today we're going to be talking about the Big Bang and specifically redshift. 
Last time we looked at Edwin Hubble's amazing discoveries about the nearby galaxies, and we're going to extend that into his discovery of the cosmological redshift distance relationship. The cosmological redshift is one of the key pillars of Big Bang and the cosmology itself. It demonstrates, just let the cat out of the bag, that the universe is expanding. We're going to look at the evidence for the redshift and why we treat that evidence as supporting the expanding universe. Once again, cosmology is the study of the entire universe and everything in it and what it's going to do, how it moves, its origin, and its fate. Next, we're going to utilize an incredibly important idea that is the cornerstone of the entire study of astronomy, the cosmological principle. The cosmological principle states that on the largest cosmic scales, the universe is both homogeneous and isotropic. This means there's nothing special about our location in the universe other than the fact that it's where home is. Homogeneity means that the distribution of things is smooth and regular. There can be an overall pattern, but it must be continuous and unchanging in space. So a perfect br a brick wall, perfectly laid out, is homogeneous in this regard. It's all brick, and the individual bricks are arranged and stacked in roughly the same way, and they all have roughly the same size, or range of sizes. Isotropy means that everything is observed to be roughly the, sa the same in every direction. In the brick example, if you're right up next to the brick wall looking around its surface, because of how the mortar is laid out between the bricks, there are different kinds of views in different directions. They might seem to repeat, so not every angle of direction looks the same. Isotropy takes this further, stating that there is no preferred direction in the universe. That is, from your current location, no matter which direction you look, the universe will look the same. In our brick example, this would only work if the wall were one big brick with no mortar between the bricks. For the universe, if you take a big enough sample, you see roughly the same numbers, sizes, and counts of galaxies in each direction. <clears throat> That's isotropy. We say that the universe is isotropic around any point in the universe, and of course, in particular, around us, which is supported by the observation. Homogeneity means that there's no preferred location in the universe. That is, no matter where you are in the universe, if you look at the universe, it will look roughly the same right around you and be made of roughly the same things. However, redshift results, results from the recent redshift surveys, such as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey on the right and the 2DF redshift survey on the left, of the distribution of relatively nearby galaxies seem to imply that the universe isn't homogeneous and isotropic. In other words, the galaxies in one direction are not seemingly distributed in exactly the same way as galaxies in another direction. But the galaxies that are investigated in these two surveys only extend out to a redshift about 0.2, which is equivalent to a distance of only 750 mega parsecs, million parsecs. We'll get to that redshift, what that means soon. When we study the most distant objects, we find that at much larger distances from the Earth, the structure appears to smooth out and become more homogeneous on the largest size scales. For example, all sky surveys of the positions on the sky of objects detected by radio telescopes reveal a much more uniform appearance. The objects seen in radio surveys are mostly expected to lie at higher redshifts than the galaxies seen in optical light, as shown here. This suggests that when we consider the largest distance scales, the universe appears to be homogeneous and isotropic. Thus, we currently find support for the cosmological principle in the distribution of galaxies in the universe. Furthermore, if you combine the observational evidence for homogeneity on the largest size scales with the argument, or even assumption, that the laws of physics are the same everywhere, implying there's nothing special about what's going on where we are or anywhere else, then isotropy as seen at one location means isotropy at all locations in the universe. If you have a homogeneous universe from physical law arguments or radio galaxy surveys, and you have isotropy about one point, i.e. our home, then you have isotropy everywhere. Net net, the universe looks the same everywhere and is made of the same stuff, then no matter where you are, you're going to see almost exactly the same things. This, of course, doesn't apply to time. Things do look different long ago than they do today. This is very important, and I'll use this observationally supported idea to make an astounding claim at the end of this video. In a previous video, I talked about the Great Distance Debate in the early part of the 20th century. It was solved by Hubble in 1929 when he determined the distance between the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy, as well as the distances to some other spiral nebulae, which is what they were called at the time. Let's do a quick review of a couple of galaxies, M81 and M82. 
M81 is the spiral on the left, and M82 is the smudge on the right with the little red bits going through it. Before 1929, no one knew, nobody knew how far away these nebulae were. All such galaxies were thought to be star-forming regions or planetary-forming regions or something like that, or perhaps even just big clouds of swirling disrupted gas. When looking at the images taken at the time, the confusion is easily forgivable. An image like this, which was taken with a modern backyard observatory by Johannes Schedler in Austria, demonstrates a huge amount of detail. Back in the 1920s, astronomical imaging was in its infancy. Today, we know these are a pair of interacting galaxies about 12 million light years away, each composed of about 100 billion stars. It all begs an important question. How exactly do we know the distance to these galaxies? What put the great distance debate to bed and finally showed us once and for all that these spiral nebulae were in fact well outside the Milky Way? In other words, it's all very pretty and all that, but how do you know how far away they are? Between 1912 and 1917, prior to Hubble's discovery, Vesto Slipher at the Lowell Observatory was able to measure the spectra of about 25 of these spiral nebulae. These spectra were used to get radial velocities for these 25 galaxies. 21 of them showed a redshift with some high speeds as up to 1,000 kilometers per second. And this redshift, if interpreted as a Doppler shift, showed that galaxies are rapidly receiving. His paper discusses this process and the difficulties, and I put some edges at the top. And right in the middle there, that's the, the table of his, of his galaxy measurements, as, seen, as published in April 1917. However, he didn't have distances to these things, these nebulae, but he knew he was onto something very important. It was just that he didn't make the cosmological connection to the distance. Unfortunately for him, the Lowell Observatory had no way of imaging the galaxies in enough detail over long enough periods to begin to do any kind of distance measurements. And he stated this unequivocally, saying, this is the so-called island universe theory, which regards our stellar, uni stellar system and the Milky Way as a great spiral nebula from which we see within. This theory, it seems to me, gains favor in the present observations. It is beyond the scope of this paper to discuss the different theories of the spiral nebulae in the face of these and other observed facts. He just didn't have the information on distance in order to continue this, and this was his concluding paragraph. Then, in 1929, Edwin Hubble, who you see pictured here, finally measured the distances to a few galaxies, including M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, M33, and other local group galaxies. He did so using what's known as a standard candle, or something that has a known luminosity or energy output. If you measure the brightness of something at some distance for which you know the luminosity, then find another of the same thing, but the second one is farther away, then it'll be dim by the distance squared. Hubble set out to compare the distances with the recession velocities, and subsequently found that the recession velocity is larger if the galaxy is positioned further away. This was understood, after much debate, to mean that he had found the systematic expansion of the universe. This is a really big discovery. In fact, it's one of the most important discoveries of 20th century science. It changed the nature of the study of the universe. It was the beginning of our journey away from learning about the story of the origin of the universe from stories told in ancient books to cosmology being a precision science. And that's where we are today, almost a hundred years later. How far is the Andromeda galaxy from the Milky Way? That was the question of the 1920s. How did Edward Hubble accomplish this feat, and what were his standard candles? There were the Cepheid variables, whose light curves had been extensively studied by Henrietta Swan Leavitt. Leavitt studied variable stars of the small and large Magellanic clouds, as recorded on photographic plates taken with the Bruce Astrograph at the Boyden Station at the Harvard Observatory in Peru. She identified over 1,700 variable stars. In 1908, Levitt published the results of her studies in the Astronomical Observatory, Analog, uh, Observatory Annals at Harvard College, noting that the brighter variables had a longer period of variation. In a 1912 paper, Levitt examined the relationship between the periods and the brightnesses of a sample of 25 of the Cepheids variables in the small Magellanic cloud. She determined conclusively that 
there is a simple relation between the brightness of the Cepheid variables and their periods. We discriminate between all the various kinds of variable stars by looking at how they get bright and dim with time. Cepheids, first, are extraordinarily luminous stars. Second, their light curves have this distinct shape with periods of oscillation on the order of tens of days. Cepheid variable stars can get you the distance to an object in which they live. Now we just need a good handle on the redshift. These peaks follow an important pattern. Most importantly, Levitt found that the luminosity at the peak brightness is tightly correlated to the time between successive peaks. Therefore, if you can find some bright stars and hope they aren't one-off novae, then you can return night after night to get the period of brightness of variation. Once you've determined that period, then you know the absolute magnitude of the star at the peak brightness. Once you know that, you compare it to its apparent magnitude and use the distance modulus equation, which I described at length in a previous video in the series, to get the star's distance. But basically, if the Cepheid happens to live in a distant galaxy, then comparing nearby Cepheid's brightnesses with the distant ones will give you the distance. So Hubble's plan was to look for Cepheids in M31 and other galaxies and use the Levitt period luminosity relationship from the Milky Way Cepheids to get the job done. Luckily, these stars are so bright they can be picked out in the relatively nearby M31 of the Andromeda Galaxy. So Hubble went off to find those stars by taking photographic plate images of M31 and M33 and was rewarded with a bunch of candidates, as we can see from this photographic plate of M31 from October of 1923. Edwin Hubble first spied the star on a 45-minute long exposure he'd taken early on October 6, 1923 with Mount Wilson's 100-inch telescope. Hubble had spent months trying to determine the distance to M31 to see if it and other such controversial spiral nebulae were distant parts of the Milky Way or instead distinct, quote, island universes. He'd initially marked the three stars on this plate with N, thinking they were novae, but when he cared to, compared his plate to earlier exposures, he realized that one of the three was actually variable, so he crossed out the N and excitedly pinned, quite queerly, VAR next to it. Here's another one of his plates for the galaxy M33, another nearby galaxy, which is, a, which is really just the big smudge in the middle from 1926, as published in the Astrophysical Journal. You can see how he marked up a series of Cepheid variable stars for observation and follow-up. Notice that this plate is negative, as, was, as is a common convention for publishing results. So the stars look black and the sky looks white, and the galaxy is that big cloudy fuzzy thing in the middle. Numerous follow-up observations revealed the periods of these Cepheid variables. Each dot on this curve represents a separate 45-minute exposure of that galaxy. A light curve was fitted to the observations. Likely, each of the four candidates that you see here was observed on the same photographic plate on the same run. But things can go wrong with such photography, and these light curves are folded to stack onto the light curve. It's not like they began measuring before day zero, and it's only two peaks. It's many, many, many days, and this is convoluted and folded to find this pattern. You can see in the sawtooth patterns of these four variables, which are indicative of Cepheid variability. Hubble then went on to make these radial velocity measurements. He did this for a number of galaxies, using the same processes that Vesto Slyford used. However, he used the 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson, which was the most important telescope of its time, just like the Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb Space Telescope are today. Incidentally, Hubble's observing partner, Milton Hummison, was actually one of the mule drivers who helped bring the 100-inch mirror all the way up Mount Wilson in California. He had dropped out of school and had no formal education past the age of 14, and he loved those mountains and found a job taking materials and equipment up to the mountain while Mount Wilson Observatory was being built. In 1917, he became a janitor of the observatory, and just because he really loved it, he volunteered to be a night assistant at the observatory. His technical skills while doing the work were rewarded by George Hale, who was the director of the observatory, who hired him onto the staff in 1919. Hummison then became one of the greatest observational astronomers of the time. He and Hubble would stay up all night 
with the telescope, taking the spectra of these distant objects. And getting just one spectrum would take between 30 and 50 hours of exposure to collect enough light to find the spectrum. This meant that the same photographic spectral plate had to be taken out of the telescope every night at the end of the session and put back into the telescope before starting. This would be done over many nights to build up enough exposure to catch the faint light from these gargantuanly distant objects. To make this process even more painstaking, the galaxy would have to be centered in the telescope. The telescope did have tracking, but it wasn't sufficient for their needs. Thomason and Hubble continuously peered through a centering eyepiece at the base of the telescope to ensure that the tracking was perfect. This extraordinary process took a very long time to create the data that you see on this image. For reference, the top one, NGC 221, is a satellite elliptical galaxy of M31, the Andromeda galaxy. NGC 4473 is an elliptical galaxy located about 50 million light years away to the constellation Coma Berenices. NGC 379 is a lenticular galaxy in the constellation Pisces. His quote of 7 megaparsecs from the second one, or 7 million light years, is off from today's reckoning. His distance measurement put all these as too close compared to modern measurements. But that's not really the point. The point was, at the time, these were just being discovered to be outside of the Milky Way. And this is what the whole cosmic distance debate was all about, which I discovered in a previous video. Now let's look more closely at just one of those observations so that we understand what's going on and what we're looking at. We have a series of lines, and we're going to call them the calcium H and K lines. These are the tiny dark spots in the middle of the smudge in the middle of the image, with surrounded by a red circle. I've also lined them up with a red arrow going up to lambda naught, and that's what I'm calling the calcium H and K line. There's also two yellow arrows which indicate reference spectra. The reference spectra was probably going to be something like a um, uh, such as such as a reference lamp like maybe iron carbide, vaporous iron carbide, a very hot iron carbide thing which is vaporized, which then glows and emits this very particular light. The galaxy spectrum is in purple and is the smudge. That's the real data. The things on the left and the right are references such that you can actually make a measurement of the wavelength. The reference lamp is a known wavelength set because you know the elements, carbon, or iron carbide, or whatever they were using and put that down and say this is the wavelength of those light. And then you put the spectrum in between it of the galaxy. And then you check again. If you look at calcium and look absorption of calcium and you have a list of lines, a list of spectra, including vaporized calcium, you find in a table that there are wavelengths according to which which have, have been named H and K in terms of calcium. And that's what their names are. It's just a little list in a book saying, oh, if we vaporize calcium and heat it up, we get a whole series of lines. And one of them we call H and the other one we call K. And they're very prominent. And the little red circle shows them. But the reference lines show that they have been displaced from their rest wavelength. And the rest wavelength is that lambda sub e. Lambda sub e is where they would be naturally in the laboratory. And I've indicated with a blue line where that should be. And the little white arrow shows how far off to the right or to the red these wavelengths of light have been displaced. So that's really interesting. And we'll continue on a bit. We'll talk more about that later and how that comes about. So all these galaxies were used, or at least their spectra can be best measured because of that strong absorption feature marked K and H in these things as well. They're all the same process. Something is doing K and H absorption. The purple line crossing all the spectra marks, the rest and lab wavelengths for the calcium H and K lines. Galaxy spectra like these are typically characterized by a strong continuum component, which is the smudge going across the middle, not the reference little tick things. This is caused by a combination of a range of stars spanning a range of temperature. They all combine together in that galaxy's light to form one spectrum, which is fairly flat overall. The H and K absorption lines are superimposed on top of this spectrum. 
on top of this continuous spectrum. And are due to the absorption of atoms, which are called metals in astronomy speak, and molecules in the atmospheres of stars, and to cold interstellar gas clouds that siphon off the radiation at these specific frequencies. This implies that there's a presence of old stellar populations, which are typically found in elliptical galaxies and in the bulges of spiral galaxies. We understand that these kinds of galaxies have the same kinds of stars that the Milky Way does, and the absorption features are therefore due to the same kinds of processes that we see locally and in the laboratory. And they're not different processes that act on different wavelengths. Therefore, the absorption features that are seen in these images are redshift. And the redshift is the red arrow pointing to the right, and the resultant location of the H and K lines is inside each of those circles. Again, we're using the cosmological principle to state that there's nothing special going on anywhere, so that the H and K lines are formed at the same wavelengths, in the same kinds of stars, and the same kinds of nebulae. And also, if we're looking at the galaxy's shape, we see that the farther they are, the, more, the smaller they appear to be. This shape difference, assuming they're roughly the same size, combined with the distance measurements, seem to indicate that the radial velocities do increase the farther away the galaxy is located. Now let's rotate this little diagram to help us understand even better. The spectra that were taken by Hubble look to be in black and white. Sometimes it's helpful to remember that the spectra are seen by us in bright light to be a rainbow spectrum. Now, if the top spectrum is stationary, and the bottom one is rushing away from us extremely fast, and then when we measure the rushing one, we find that the lines are displaced from their laboratory wavelength to longer and redder wavelengths. This is called redshift. Okay, so let's take a moment to reflect that this didn't have to be this way. We can make, all sorts, make up all sorts of fancy ideas, science fiction, pure speculation, wild word strings based on a jargon generator. Nature could have surprised us in a lot of ways, but this surprise is a doozy. It was a shocking discovery that nearly every galaxy is rushing away from us. One, redshift is an observational discovery. It is nearly universal across all galaxies. It didn't have to be this way. This was a discovery. And fourth, this was extremely important. We'll now look at Hubble's law and show how it arises from the relativistic theory. First, let's define the idea of redshift. Redshift, z, is a unitless measure of distance, not distance, is a unitless measure of the difference between the observed wavelength of light and the emitted wavelength of light divided by the emitted wavelength. Basically, a measure of how much the light has been stretched or compressed from its original emitted wavelength. Now we've rearranged the equation to help us with some things later. Again, the redshift z is the ratio of the change in the wavelength of a moving source compared to its wavelength at rest. This isn't observable. We just have to know the wavelength of the light when it's emitted. That's why we really depend on the physical laws being the same everywhere in the universe. If it's not moving away, then the redshift is defined to be zero. So now I've added some physics. On the right is the special relativistic formula for the Doppler shift due to the emitter and observer being in relative motion towards or away from each other. Doppler shifts are more familiar when car speeds by you with a blaring siren. The pitch goes higher as it approaches, and it goes lower as it goes away. This formula takes into account the first postulate of special relativity, that the speed of light is always the same for all observers. To get more about that, please go and watch my series on special and general relativity. Suffice it for now that the big square root is the fully relativistic way of writing the Doppler shift. Again, this is experimentally verified, as well as originating from a general theoretical principle. The rest wavelength, meaning what we would measure if the thing emitting the light were just sitting there, of something emitting a pretty shade of green at 5500 angstroms, is given by that lambda sub emit. Lambda sub obs means the observed wavelength, with v meaning the speed of recession or approach of the source emitter and to the observer, and c is the speed of the wave, here, the speed of light. This formula applies to all sources moving with respect to any receiver when we're talking about light. Let's make things easier on ourselves and note that all the reference spectra we looked at before were speeding away at speeds much less than the speed of light. This is helpful, not just in the math, but in helping you understand it. So that big square root can be approximated by a much simpler version. 
So now we see the relationship between redshift and the recession speed for slow speeds, but it looks like a mess. If you look at both ends, we see that we can reduce this down even more. And now we have the final form for our relationship. We haven't removed the wavelength observations. They are represented by the Z. Now when Hubble and Hummison did their measurements, they assumed it was a Doppler shift and got that Z. Now with both of these measurements, a distance from the Cepheids and a recession speed from the redshift, Hubble plotted his data and discovered this relationship for all of these galaxies. This is Hubble's actual data from 1929. From it, he derived a best fit value for the relationship, which looks like the solid line. The slope of that line that Hubble derived was 500 kilometers per megaparsec, which is much larger than the values understood today. So that's it. Hubble's law directly relates two observable measurements, one from radial velocities in the spectra and another by understanding stellar physics and knowing various standard candles. Combining these two things together, you can measure the distance to some unknown galaxy by getting a radial velocity alone. Oftentimes, it's very hard to pick out a Cepheid in a distant galaxy or wait for a supernova, but spectra are easier to measure. Therefore, it's important to discover more standard candles and get finer and more precise radial velocities. Arguably, the second thing is easier of the two. Our faith in the fact that the physical laws of the universe are the same everywhere leads us to trust this distance redshift relationship as real. The main result is that the more distant a galaxy is, the faster its recession velocity. Hubble's original value of 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec is a lot bigger than we know it is to be today, but that was due to some calibration errors in his work. Those errors don't invalidate the conclusion, only the rate of expansion. You'll often see H sub naught called the Hubble constant, but it's really not. The Hubble constant is the value of the slope of that line at the present cosmic time. In the past it was different, and it will be different in the future. So its best name is the Hubble parameter. H naught is measured today to be about 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And if you measure with the most, if we measure with most standard candles. However, it's 68 if you derive it from cosmic microwave background measurements. More on that later. The obvious goal is to then obtain distances to galaxies. To indicate our attention, let's invert this equation to obtain the distance as a function of redshift for relatively nearby galaxies. Here again, z is the cosmological redshift, z is the speed of light. It gets more complicated for extreme distances and look-back times, as we saw with the original Doppula formulation a few slides back. H0 also measures the expansion rate of the universe. We'll show you why it does that shortly. But to progress the story for skeptics, in 1931, Hubble and Hummison followed up with measurements of farther galaxies and groups of galaxies. The relationship held for much more distant objects. These observations are what finally ended the great distance debate about the size of the universe. It was no longer just the Milky Way. It was the Milky Way plus lots of other things that seemed to be the Milky Way at very great distances. This was a hot topic of debate prior to Hubble's work, whether the universe was just the Milky Way or if there was anything beyond. I did a long video on this amazing part of science history, and you should go check it out. Note that their data was from just two years prior, makes up only the tiny corner of the newer data, and this was just the beginning. Here's a Hubble diagram from 2004 that shows the relation up to about 650 megaparsecs. The standard candles here are type 1a supernovae and were derived and measured by Robert Kushner at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. They were critical in letting us know that the Hubble parameter has changed with time. These specific type the standard candles. More on that in my video on dark energy and cosmology. The slope of this line is roughly 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Way down in the lower left-hand corner marks the span of Hubble's original diagram from 1929. It doesn't matter which standard candle you use. We always measure the same distance velocity relation. All of these are direct measurements with the distance and radial velocity, each with different standard candles. There is a rub, though indirect measurements of the Hubble parameter using the cosmic microwave background and baryon acoustic oscillations give a significantly different answer, which I'll talk about later. The Hubble Key Project was one of the first to do a major search for many Cepheids in distant galaxies, and then measure the Hubble parameter. 
They gave their final work in 2001. In fact, this project was one of the core reasons for the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope and why the orbiting observatory was named after Hubble. Just to make sure we all know, there's no one on board the HST. It's a robotic facility. On other recent measurements, as shown here using Cepheids and other standard candles, show that H0 is about 72 or 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec. H0 is very hard to measure. Recession speeds are roughly easy to measure from the shifts of spectral lines, but distances are very hard. And the recession speeds are complicated by the random motions of galaxies due to the being in clusters or falling towards 100 megaparsec scale mass gradients. These extra non-cosmological motions have to be taken into account. However, subsequent measurements using Hubble Space Telescope and now the James Webb Space Telescope support these measurements. The accuracy, precision, and interpretation of these observations are not under question. The universe is expanding. So all these projects to measure the Hubble parameter have the intent of being able to faithfully represent the distance to some new or unknown galaxy using only the redshift as measured strictly from the spectrum. Nearly every astrophysical process that we want to learn about depends on us accurately knowing the energy output. If we know the distance to something, then we can quickly relate how bright the object appears to be to how bright it actually is, that is, its energy output. Once we know that, we can relate processes evident from its spectrum, from its environment, or from its appearance to teach us what's going on over there. So without the Hubble law, we wouldn't have a handle on what's a lot of what's going on. But first, let's get back to that expansion of the universe stuff. Incidentally, the inverse of the current value of the Hubble parameter gives us a rough approximation for the age of the universe. Because the units are kilometers per second per megaparsec, and if we know how many kilometers there are in a megaparsec and how many seconds there are in a year, then we can get a good guess. Okay, so let's go through it real quick. First, we take this thing and put the seconds and megaparsecs on the top because that's what the per and per allow us to do, and I'm going to kind of use this as a mega fraction and start canceling units. Next, we want to try to get rid of how many the megaparsecs as a thing and convert them to kilometers. So first we know that one megaparsec has over, wow, 206 trillion, I mean not trillion, billion, well I guess you guess you a trillion if you're talking Brit talk, but 206 billion astronomical units. But how many astronomical units are there in a kilometer or reverse wise? How many kilometers are there in an astronomical unit? There's about 150 million kilometers in an astronomical unit. And finally, we've converted now megaparsecs to astronomical units and astronomical units to kilometers. We have kilometers on top and kilometers on bottom, but we have seconds on top. The age of the universe in seconds isn't really good. So in one year, there are just over pi million, 10 pi, pi times 10 to the seventh seconds in a year, which is a really cool little statement. It's a little bit over pi. So we can call it 31, three, almost 32 million seconds in a year. And if we multiply all across the numbers across the top and multiply the ones at the bottom and then divide up and down and get rid of the units, we're left with years. And that's approximately 14 billion years. So that's a rough, good guess as to the current age of the universe, which is an interesting thought about what you get from just this rate of expansion. Hubble's law demonstrate that the universe is expanding in this systematic way. The further a galaxy away is from us, the faster it appears to be moving from us. The Hubble parameter, H0, is a measurement of the rate of expansion of the universe as measured at the current cosmic time. It is not a distance velocity centered only on us. It's not just that. How do we know it's actually expanding? Let's actually go through what we mean by the expansion of space and how that relates to Hubble's law. And we're going to drive this using geometry. Distance measurements are always measured so some length, so it doesn't matter how that length is measured. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make, say, a really big triangle somewhere in the universe. I'm also going to say that it's anywhere and it's any rotation or orientation that we can imagine. We can rotate it around any which way and put that triangle in any location in the universe. Let's start with the triangle being around when the universe was, say, small. And I'm going to color that triangle purple. I've labeled each side and each vertex of the triangle. My hope was to kind of make it look like we're going around the triangle. R12 at T0 means the length of the side of the triangle between vertex 1 and vertex 2. The T0 means the starting time. We use parentheses on each because that length is a function of time, and we're marking the starting point. Now at some later time t, the triangle has grown such that all the angles are the same with respect to each other and the length of each side has doubled. 
superimposing the two triangles, we can see that it's just a bigger but looks the same. If you remember your high school geometry, we use the angle, angle, angle test to show that the two triangles are similar but not congruent. This just means they look the same but differ only in size. Now let's capture the time functionality of the change of the sides of the triangle. Whatever happened to maintain its shape, all the sides grew in exactly the same way meaning the scale factor function was the same for all three sides. I'll call that scale factor a as a function of t, or a of t. We don't know the functional form of a of t. It could be a wild function of time, or very simple. It just applies to all sides equally. So now, let's go through and peel each one of these things and pull them up to their respective places in the equation. Now, I've captured and related all the sides as a function of the scale factor. In each case, the r of t0 is a constant, each of those three on the right-hand side. The size varies due to the scale factor function, a of t, and on the left-hand side is the resultant size after some time t. Let's just make it clean up so we have a little more lined up so we're not looking at things that are moving around. Looking at all three equations, these could be vector equations, explicitly demonstrating the orientation and location space. However, we posited that the starting triangle's orientation and location were arbitrary. This is actually a restatement of the cosmological principle. Now let's just take a look at one of those sides. Anyone will do, since this whole thing was arbitrarily chosen. And we'll now have see this, how this, change, this equation changes with time. We want to get that function. We must have varied somehow, small to big. So now we're going to check that. And we're going to first sometimes use convenience of dot notation, which shows that a dot above the variable means a time derivative. So that ddt means a derivative with respect to time, and a dot is just a very shorthand notation way of doing that, so you don't have to carry around all that writing. Next, we use the definition of speed as the rate of change of distance to rewrite v sub 1, 2, t as v of 1, 2. Not, and I'm going to use v for, speed, for its speed, not s, since strictly speaking this is a velocity, which attaches a direction. But I don't really care about the direction of the change at this point. Now then, we're going to plug that top equation into the bottom one by noting that the r 1, 2, t naught is equal to the r as a function of time divided by the scale factor at that time. And therefore, we have all the variables as functions of time in one equation. But now we want to simplify our notation for clarity even more. Since 1 to 2 was arbitrary, we don't even need that subscript. And the time variable is a given for everything. Same with all the rest. Finally, we're going to call r sub 1 to d for distance. And we get something that looks like this, a blindingly simple looking thing. But wait, what's that a dot over a thing? That's kind of familiar. It's actually the Hubble relationship, where we define the Hubble parameters, the change in the scale factor divided by the scale factor. H naught is just its present value at the present time. That's why I called it parameter and not a constant. This is the Hubble relationship. And now all we need is to understand how redshift measures and encapsulates that scale factor A. Okay, so it's worth stopping here for a moment. I was a bit sneaky and glossed over everything related to distances. As you can see, the sides of the triangles are lengths, but more importantly, they're lengths at one exact moment in cosmic time. This, in general relativity, is called a proper distance. At t sub zero, and at a later time t, we've, quote, stopped time to take a measurement of each side. That length is called a space-time interval. This whole idea is assume, assumed a cosmological principle, isotropy and homogeneity, for how we set up the triangle in our space. Then we said that the triangle expanded in that space. However, what if space itself expanded? Why would we ask such a question? Because when general relativity was being formulated, it was in response to the question, how does gravity work within the framework of special relativity? If we can make measurements nearly instantaneously, or at least seemingly so compared to the size of the thing measured, then we can use the old Pythagorean theorem to get the lengths of the sides. Time doesn't figure it into that, but special relativity asks, what if you measure lengths when something's moving fast, and you posit that c, the speed of light, is a constant? Then you get a link between time and space. But why expansion? Why? 
Back in 1900s and 1910s, when Einstein first developed special relativity and general relativity, it was well understood that gravity attracts. It was also known that the Earth was very old, as are the Sun and Moon, so for stars and nebulae to not be crashing down onto each other when they are so big and so massive, yet relatively close enough to each other that it seemed worrisome that they hadn't crashed into each other and made one big blobby ball of stuff. To alleviate that worry, imaginative mathematics were developed, quite apart from the questions of the astronomers and the physicists. These solutions to the Einstein field equations of general relativity tried to keep the heavens from crashing down on us. If space expanded, that would do the trick. So I've essentially followed the mathematical argument by simply creating a space-time that expanded. I've also used the ideas of homogeneity and isotropy to show that this triangle growth would happen anywhere. H0 would just simply be that rate of growth. In some sense, this is completely physics-free. What we now need is a method to actually measure the lengths of these triangles, especially when the sides are very, very, very large. So let's look at our only hope, light. Let's presume in the previous discussion is true. What does that tell us about light? So if we start with a galaxy emitting light on the left, and then we watch what happens as the universe expands and the light has finally arrived at the telescope. So now we have a thing moving in space-time. According to normal physics thinkers, if a thing moves, it has momentum. That's a basic Newtonian mechanics. If a particle accelerates anyway, it changes momentum. But light doesn't ever change its speed, and its momentum has been experimentally verified to be dependent upon its wavelength, and the h is the Planck's constant. Trajectories in space-time are called geodesics, and they are the curved space-time idea of a straight line. These straight lines also must take into account the passage of time. Light's geodesic is called null. I discussed this at length in my lectures on relativity, so I won't expand here. Combining the null geodesic, a statement of physics about the nature of light always going at sea for all observers, with the concept of light as a particle with momentum inversely proportional to its wavelength, we get a startling result. Light changes wavelength as it passes through a changing space-time because it cannot respond to that change by slowing down or speeding up. No process is operating on the light other than traveling through space. So to continue traveling along the geodesic, it can only change one thing, its wavelength. Again, a null geodesic is simply the shortest zero-valued space-time interval. In other words, it's what we would call a straight line in a curved space-time if you moved at the speed of light. There's a lot that goes into the statement, really, and you spend a good deal of time in a general relativity class learning about parallel transporting and a vector in and on a curved manifold, specifically to the form of the friedman robinson walker metric as you propagate a photon along a null geodesic. Its momentum along this path varies like the energy of the photon. So let's see how this plays out. We return to the redshift definition and see how that scale factor comes into play. We rewrite it for clarity, and now we apply the scale factor to each of the wavelengths of the photon, noting the observed wavelength is just the scale factor times the original emitted wavelength. Okay, we can do this because light travels on a null geodesic and its energy is directly proportional to its frequency. A very loose way of saying it is if changes in the scale size of space-time affect something with a real size that count, quote, can't, quote, counteract the change, it's a really loose way of saying, then the thing will be stretched or compressed with the thing with the change in space-time. One of the central and experimentally verified tenets of special relativity and general relativity is the constancy of speed of light for all observers. When this is extended into general relativity, it gives us a null geodesic. Also, the proportionality of the frequency of light to its energy is what got Einstein the Nobel Prize, not relativity, so this is very well established too. If the speed of light does not change, and the laws of physics are the same everywhere, then the same process will emit the same wavelengths of light, regardless of the size scale of the universe. When that light travels and traverses the universe between emission and observation, in order to maintain the constancy of the speed of light as the universe expands, given its energy, the wavelength must change to compensate for that expansion. Look, I'm really trying not to get too deep into the derivation of the friedman roberts or walker metric and show the tenets of special and general relativity create the Einstein field equations, but this metric is one solution given the nature of space-time. 
I'm, t I'm also really glossing over the fact that the A of T contains all the physics of how the universe's contents affect the space-time. I'm trying to get the highlights of the points and dodge all the point-by-point -point steps to get us there. It's just that given how photons carry momentum and that their path through space-time creates a change in their momentum, ultimately means that there's a direct link between a universe with the ways space-time intervals or distances are measurements and the energy output of those photons and the energy of those photons that take that path. Another nice but quite loose way of thinking about it is the total number of wave peaks between the source and destination is, doesn't change. If you look at the universe when it was smaller and stopped the expansion and let fly the photons, you could count the number of wave crests between all the endpoints. Then you expand the universe and stretch all the lengths between the source and the destination. Stop the expansion and do the same thing. The number of wave peaks would be the same. For that to happen, the wavelength goes up and the frequency goes down. The speed of light, then, being constant, means that if we see a redshift that is not due to the relative motion of the endpoints, then it is due to the stretching of space-time itself. You might be asking, well, where does all that photon energy go? The photon frequency is decreased, so it looks like there is an energy loss. But there really isn't. The universe is a totally closed system, so there isn't an increase in entropy of the photon field due to this expansion. If there were some loss of energy to the universe in some way, then the laws of thermodynamics say it would eventually go into heating something, which would then in turn eventually make more photons, because heating things up makes photons. This means that the expansion of the universe and its action on photons would somehow make the universe brighter. But this isn't seen. Quite the opposite, in fact. Another way to say this is if we ran time backward, we would return to the same photon energies as we left them. This is an underlying assumption of the universe being a closed system, not to be confused with a closed geometry. In a sense, light itself is closely tied to the measurements of the universe. We can look at the speed of light as a conversion factor between space and time. Just think of this following thing. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So we can say that one second is 186,000 miles, and that's a really good way of thinking about how we relate space and time. One second is 186,000 miles. Photons just happen to only travel at that one speed. Gravitational waves also travel at the speed of light, but that's a different video. So let's divide out all those lambda emits and get a, we're left with scale factors. And then if we define a naught, a sub zero, a sub observed to be one, meaning the scale factor today is one, then we rearrange this equation to have something that looks insanely simple. Redshift is that the redshift and scale factor relationship. It clearly shows that if we look back in time for when the scale factor was smaller, z gets bigger as expected. For the Big Bang, when the scale factor starts to approach zero, z goes to infinity. It means the farther back in time we try to appear, the redder the light becomes. This is why I keep hammering on this point. This is why I keep saying it's an expansion. Why can't it just be everything that's really flying away from us? Why can't it just be a Doppler shift where it's just due to motion of the galaxies through space? Well, first, with all the observation we see and the many dozens more that exist, the recession to speed distance relationship does not have an dependency on the direction you're looking. It would be an astonishing coincidence if this were only due to the simple motion of galaxies. A process would have to be devised to make it so they're flying away faster and faster the farther they are from us. This just seems patently absurd on the surface. We do not observe something similar from any other galaxy, or some doubling up of speeds due to some big galaxy between us and a more distant one. No, it's a linear relationship centered on us that just is the way we see. Well, that sure does make us seem pretty darn special, doesn't it? Ah, but wait, that would mean there is some physical law here, or centered on here, that applies only to us and to no other place in the universe. You know what? Every time anyone has ever thought that in the history of science or philosophy, they've always been proven wrong. Geocentrism, dead wrong. Only planets in the galaxy, wrong. Only galaxy and universe, wrong. Humans are the only form of life with feelings and emotions. Now, that's wrong. Earth is the only planet on which liquid water occurred and oceans were pos and oceans that happened that were hospitable for life. That's wrong. See also ours. Therefore, the cosmological principle, or rather the Copernican principle, holds here too. We are not special. 
So we're not at some center, and we're not different from any other galaxy. An astronomer in any other galaxy in the universe would also see the same Hubble law. Anyway, this all goes by way of saying that the change in redshift directly measures the change in the scale factor size. At z of 1,000, the universe was 1,001 times smaller than it is today. At that redshift, the cosmic microwave background is a cosmic mid-infrared background. With all that in hand, let's keep moving. It's worth going over a few examples to make sure we got this down. Here we see a classic example of the stretching of a photon's wavelength as depicted on the surface of a balloon. This common picture is the result of light traveling on an old geodesic. In special relativity, we don't have any curvature, so the Minkowski metric clearly shows the speed of light's constancy. When we extend the constancy of the speed of light in curved spacetime, and specifically curved spacetime that's allowed to expand, then a photon's wavelength and frequency both change as the universe expands. I derived the whole thing in a different video where redshift comes from. Light, again, only follows null geodesics. Normal particles don't. This expansion only applies to photons and whatever else someone may think up one day as traversing null geodesics. That's why we use the balloon analogy. It's a hypersimplification which tries not to talk about the metrics and length measurements and all that, but you can see the grid on the balloon changing, and that means we're measuring lengths and times in a curved, expanding space. Some things move in particular ways in those spaces, and we have to take those into account. So, redshift arises, one, because the photons have a constant speed of light, the universe's measuring sticks are given by the friedman robertson walker metric, and three, the universe is expanding. The third bit is the conclusion you must draw if you agree to the idea that C is a constant and that relativity is a thing, and that you have discovered that photons Momenta and energy are dependent on the frequency. Since there's ample experimental evidence for all of this, we just keep walking our science along, seeing if that idea breaks anywhere, and as of today, neither idea has been broken, and not for lack of trying. So much for balloons. Now let's take a look at the observer's horizons in the expanding universe. Here what I've done is I've created a little kind of tiny universe made out of a yellow bubble. The yellow bubble will be centered on the yellow robot. There's also other robots in there, a blue one, a red one, and a, and a purple one. Each of those represents different observers in different galaxies. So all of these objects are extremely far apart, and this just happens to be a person or an observer or alien or whatever you like to call it in some very distant galaxy. Let's just see what happens if we allow for the expanding universe and see who gets to see what. Inside of yellow's capability of observing, we have the red one, the blue one, and the purple one. So now as the universe expands and everybody spreads apart, the yellow one, the blue one, and the red one, all three of the all four of them stay inside of yellow's universe, as it were. But each of these observers, because of the nature of the expansion, has their own horizon too. Notice how the, the diameter of the balloon, or the yellow area, expanded from that small area to this large area. If we assume that the blue robot had his small area, the same air volume as the, what we saw beginning in the yellow, we should actually see something a little like this. Notice for the blue observer that the red and purple robots are outside of their, of their view. They do exist, they're just outside of his view. Likewise, with the purple robot, only yellow is inside, and finally, only the yellow is inside the red. So all of these outer far robot observers, or whatever they are, whoever they are, these things, they are very far away from each other, far enough that they're outside of each other's horizons. They don't mix. So we have a series of horizons that are all stacked up on top of each other. And none of them is the end. For us, let's say we're the yellow um, observer in the middle at this point. We have an observable horizon that's it's kind of indicated by one of those little, the, the circle that surrounds the yellow, yellow observer. But that yellow observer has only that as its horizon, and that horizon is, is the limit of a redshift of, say, very large. If that redshift becomes larger and larger and larger, we see that it gets to a point where we have a maximum look-back time, and that maximum look-back time is the age of the universe, meaning the speed of light times the age, well, well not well, the, how far light is able to travel since the beginning of the universe from a certain point. And that's what we mean by this horizon. So 
that actually makes an interesting statement because blue sees the same thing, red sees the same thing, purple sees the same thing. Everybody has their own horizon. More importantly then, where do those horizons end? Because presumably to the right of the red observer, there's more observers. And to the upper left of the blue observer, there's more observers. And to the left and down from the purple observer, there's more observers. Where does that end? How does that stop? Hmm, don't know. Currently, it could just very well be that the universe is infinite in extent spatially, which is a fascinating statement. If the universe is infinite in extent spatially, then all these observers all see all the same thing, which is truly fascinating. It means we're really in no such spatial place at all. So let's take a little bit and check what exactly I meant by that previous statement of the cosmic horizon. And to that, we're going to also whack on the idea and bash on the idea of the light year as a result. So once again, let's go back to this the concept that was elucidated with that little animation I did before, which is that the galaxy rushing away from us, well, the emitted light and the light travel along this line to get to the telescope, we saw that before. But now this is elucidated in kind of a graphic format here, where time progresses from ago at the bottom to now at the top, and we're at this galaxy that's on the left that stays put. And the apparent change of the galaxy, or the actual change of the far galaxy as it rushes away from us due to the expansion of the universe, is on the right-hand side. And the photon that travels comes from that right back over to the left. So there's an emission distance, which is the proper distance at time of emission. There's the proper distance at now, which is that, which is when the galaxy is where the galaxy is now, and these are proper distances, which means if you simply stop the expansion and then put out a bunch of measuring sticks down now and just added those all up, that's the distance you'd have. And you could measure that in light years if you wished, but wait a second, measure in light years? Hold on. The light travel time distance is simply the speed of light times the time difference between then and now, and that's what we call the light travel distance. So People at public events always ask about, and they're told that light years of the distance to some galaxy or way over there, even NASA uses this on their website, oh, this, the light's been traveling to us for 12 billion years, or sometimes they'll just get short and say this is 11 billion light years away, or whatever. Well, light years are conceived as the speed of light times the time it took to travel from there to here. And this is absolutely not the same as the proper distance at either the time of emission or the time of observation. It's a completely different distance measurement because light travel time distance does not take into account any aspect of the expansion. There's another distance we call a co-moving distance that's often used. It is the proper distance divided by the scale factor. This means that two galaxies, if they had no random relative motion, would stay at the same co-moving distance as cosmic time progressed. Proper distance is tied to the expansion, so it changes co-moving distance as the distance removed from the scale factor. So light travel time distance really isn't anything, but it's what a lot of people think about and what they think it is to be when they hear about the distance of something, when they hear about it. Say, oh, this thing's from James, from James Webb's space telescope. We see the light as it was 200 million years of the Big Bang, so it's 14 point seven fourteen point one billion light years away or whatever. The most important thing is that this is not the same thing. We see that the distance traveled we is not the same thing. Light travel distance does not take into account any aspect of expansion. It's simply a speed, which is C times a time interval. It does not take into account anything related to the scale factor of the expansion. So that's pretty interesting, and it's also something that we kind of have to look at more carefully. So let's go back to the horizon and put it in terms of a graphical format in this way. So we're going to look at redshift. I said before in that previous thing with all the robots and balls that we were talking about redshifts and look back time and distances and horizons. So we know that if the redshift increases with time, with as we look back in time, as you can see in the left-hand column, the redshift goes up and up and up and up and up, and we're looking back in time, the look back time, all the way to the right. Notice that the redshift goes up very steeply towards the bottom, 
and the look back time starts to level off and change not at all. And in fact, past a certain redshift of distance of redshift, we have zero change in look back time. That's because redshift measures the expansion rate of the universe from the time of the Big Bang. And the Big Bang is roughly 13.7 billion years old. Now this set of numbers came from the fact that we assumed a flat universe with h naught equals 71 kilometers per second per megaparsec with a standard lambda CDM cosmology. Then we can derive all these things for a given redshift. And notice that maximum look back time of 13.7 billion years. And there might be a lot of confusion because if you look just to the left of it, the present distance is 47 billion light years. It just sounds like they're completely different distances. So which one's the correct distance? And one seems way too far away. I mean, the universe is only 13.7 billion years old, so how can something be 47 and a half billion light years away? Again, that's the expansion of the universe, and the present distance is a proper distance, the proper distance today, right now, if we stop the expansion and just lay down a bunch of markers. That fourth column, we use units of millions of light years. We see that Instead of megaparsecs, megaparsecs are a geometric measurement, which is measured based off of trigonometry, based ultimately off of the angular change of a star in the sky due to the Earth's motion around the sun. That's where the parsec is defined. So it's very, very geometrically based. But light years is just a distance times a time. Well, a distance divided by a time, or a rate, a speed, a known speed, or an established speed times a time interval. It's not a geometric distance. So everyone learns that a light year is just the distance light travels in a year, and that is completely true. However, the indication, implication of that statement is that all distances are the same, and that a distance is a distance is a distance. One is just different units from the other. Our memory and our cultural bias say that if something's 10.8 billion light years away, then it emitted that light 10 billion years ago. More frequently in more responsible places, people will just say it emitted the light 10.8 billion years ago. But they won't say that it's 10.8 billion light years away. They'll say it emitted light when it was 10.8 billion years ago. So if we want to say 10.8 billion years ago it limited light and it's 10.8 billion light years away, that's not true. In an expanding universe, something that's measured to be 10.8 billion light years away emitted its light only 7.7 .7 billion years ago. Now we're getting confused only because we got attached to this idea of light speed as a unit of speed in a high school physics sort of way, where distance equals speed times a time. And the fact that all of our experiences with non-curved, non-expanding space times. We're just hung up what we learned in grade school and high school because light years sound really cool and it's very easy for the teachers to teach, especially when you say distance equals speed times time. It makes it kind of fun for them to teach. But the idea or intuition or common sense that we have from that early idea breaks down when we discover the evidence for an expanding universe. Another way to view this horizon concept is, this, is with this graph. When we think of a time horizon, because as we saw in that graph before, there was definitively a look back time maximum. Redshift went up to infinity, but the look back time had a maximum time of 13.7 billion years ago. So we can look at that as a time horizon from which we cannot see any time before. In every direction, if we look farther and farther away, objects we look at are deeper back in time. If we look far enough, quote, we get to the Big Bang, but all of its life would, light would have been redshifted down to impossible to detect wavelengths. More interestingly, we can see that there's a maximum proper distance for this emission, and that can be seen by this graph, which shows that it's somewhere around 5 gigaparsecs, or if you really, really, really want to go back, 15 billion light years. Farther out than that, and make mostly farther back in time, the size of the universe and cosmic history was actually much smaller, and that the dis emission distance starts to be comparable to local distances and gets closer and closer, and eventually gets very close to zero, or at least 
down to the size of some primeval fireball that would eventually make up the universe, and that happens, of course, at the Big Bang. The outer ring of this graph, this green ring, is the emission distance of almost zero. I mean, this sounds bad, but it does work out. It works out due to the at what point in cosmic time do you want to start your emission process and send the photon on its merry way? Again, if the volume of space is really small and you're you are right around the beginning of the expansion and you throw a photon at a target, the expansion quickly drags it away, like a very fast escalator with a kid running the opposite direction. The kid keeps running at the same speed and covers a lot of distance, but the distance keeps growing underneath him. At each moment, it seems like the kid is being carried further and further away, which is true, but the escalator is going ultimately at a slower rate than the kid runs. At some point, the kid gets past a point where the dragging away is less than the going forward. He'll advance slowly, then faster and faster, until the time when the target finally receives the photon, or he gets the other end of the escalator. This process for the universe is maximized for a volume of space centered on the target, of course with the source photons being just inside the light travel time horizon at the time of the Big Bang. This is not the edge of the universe, as we saw with the example with the observers and robots and balls before. This is not the edge. This is just our edge of capability of seeing. This is our horizon, but it doesn't mean it's the edge of the universe. There is no edge to the universe. It doesn't exist. There is more stuff of the same just a little bit away outside of that horizon. And as we saw from the picture below, the three robots that were inside the yellow ball at the beginning are outside of each other's balls. So each one of them has their own horizon centered just like this. And the farther away they are, they, the more the space will expand, and the space will expand such that the other observers will not see each other. So it is, there's more of the same past this horizon, and everybody sees the same horizon. But, just, but it's important to remember, we're not at the center of the expansion. We're only at the center of our light horizon, defined by the places from which light has had a chance to get to us. So that's what this graph means. We see on here the redshift increasing on that right-hand side, going all the way out to very large, where look-back time gets larger and larger and larger, and redshift gets even larger and larger. But the look-back time is a constant, sort of a stayed, steady look-back time, because that's just an advancement of a clock. And so the thing going up to like 1 o'clock or noon, we have an emission distance, and then we have an event distance as well. So these emission distances and current distance are interesting. On the left-hand side, emission distance goes up and up and up till it gets to about 5.7 gigalight years, and then it goes down to 1 at the other end. So there's a maximum emission distance from which you get the largest possible distance between the emission of the photon and the observer and the receiving. And that's just because of the nature of the expansion of the universe. And the current distance is larger and larger, getting past that 5.7 billion light year um, emission distance. The current distance is the current proper distance. The emission distance is the proper distance at time of emission. See, that's where we get those things from. That's exactly what those previous slides were. Proper distance at time of emission, proper distance now. That's what those two things mean. And so uh, the other things, that the, the going down to the left at about 7 o'clock, shows the extent of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the Hubble Deep Field, and the cosmic microwave background, as well as when the first stars were born, young galaxies and old galaxies in the dark ages when there was no light in the universe. And those funny lines just show you that where, when we wish to map, the points of look-back time. When, when was the emission distance? What was the emission distance at said look-back time? And what is the current co-moving distance right now? The current proper distance. And that's where we get those things from. Notice that the emission distance goes up from the beginning time and then swings back down and goes smaller. But then the current co-moving distance is the current proper distance, and that goes out and out and out and out and out and gets larger and larger as the universe expands. So the bottom thing is a true expression of where things are now, but the, the top thing is where things were 
ago. All right. So now that's all interesting and everything, but our original question was the measurement of the Hubble constant and the Hubble parameter and what Edwin Hubble did using Henrietta Leavitt's information and Vesto Slifer's techniques. Ah, nowadays, there are a lot of things to work out with H0. We saw well before that H0 seemed to be centered around 72. But the recent years have discovered a tension in the measurements between the Hubble constant. And you can see from this graph there are two bands, one going down the red side on the right, and one going down the green side on the left. And they're separated roughly by this group of things that are direct measurements and groups of things that are indirect measurements. So let's look at each and what the impact is. First, let's look at the indirect measurements, which we didn't really talk about in this discussion. The indirect measurements come from trying to fit the Hubble parameter at the present day with, the, uh, with measurements of the cosmic microwave background using the Planck, tel Planck Observatory, as well as using the same data without the Planck Observatory, and then with, no com with not using the cosmic microwave background, but only Big Bang nucleosynthesis arguments, as well as microwave lensing. Uh, and power spectrum with microwave lensing. That's what those things are. Those are indirect measurements. They don't directly measure it. They're fitted curves to data. Notice that they center roughly around 67 or 69 or so. More like 67 and a quarter, 67.3 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And that's what we see in the third one on Agamemnon 2020 with the Planck 2018 data. It's roughly 67.27 uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. And the error bars, that's what those things going to the left and right are, shows how confident they are in those values that they have. So now those are indirect measurements. But if we now look at the direct measurements, which are below, first we have the Cepheids, which we talked about extensively. And the Cepheid variables seem to center roughly around 73.2 or 73 or so, somewhere around 73. And then we can see that there's type 1 supernova or tip of the red giant branch groups so that's in the green that's below. And they all sort they're a little bit lower, but they're still in agreement with the direct measurements. And if we scroll down and see other things, different kinds of standard candles, such as Myra's, Masers, the Tully-Fisher relation, surface brightness fluctuations, type 2 supernovae, the brightest H2 region in galaxies, and lensing-related and mass model-dependent lensing models, meaning gravitational lensing of objects, we see that these direct measurements of H0 uh, lead us to roughly somewhere with the most optimistic average is roughly 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Those are direct measurements where we don't have to infer anything. We have a standard candle of some sort and then some way of measuring its, it, the, a statistical set of standard candles versus the statistical set of the um, of the recession velocities. So there's a statistical grouping of these things for individual sources. And then when you group them all together, you get a fitted curve, just like we saw with Hubble's original curve and all the other curve and all the other lines that we saw in the previous graphs. This is interesting. Oh, in the bottom is a very interesting thing coming up very recently is gravitational wave detections. Gravitational waves also travel along null geodesics. So how they can, they can do a direct measurement. Now, they're not as accurate because there's only a few gravitational wave observatories, and their ability to pinpoint things in the sky is very low. So that has a great impact on what their measurement is for, for uh, H0. All this means there's a lot to work out with the Hubble constant. And the Hubble tension means that there are recent measurements that can indicate it's roughly 70, 68. I'll call it 67.6, or we'll call it 68. And then higher values, roughly around 73 or 74, which I list the 74 one for March 18, but it's roughly around 73 is the average for the direct ones, as you can see from the red bar. And the green bar, the indirect measurements that principally come from the cosmic microwave background or physics arguments from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Those two sets of measurements, all of these sets, both the direct and indirect, are extraordinarily rigorous. They're extraordinarily well understood. They're all very, they're both, all sets are considered valid measurements of the Hubble parameter, but they differ. And they differ on a four sigma level. 
And what that means is that it's a very difficult thing to think that these things are actually non-significant. Like these changes, like, oh, it's something in between. Maybe it'll be just the average of these things. No, they are measuring very different qualities of something. So there has to be a relationship that tells us why one of these, why we get this Hubble parameter when we measure direct, and why we get this Hubble parameter when we measure these indirect things. There must be some reason. We don't know what it is. This is very important because it means what is the actual expansion rate? It doesn't seem like there's any systematic errors. The, the errors that are involved with this are most certainly embedded somewhere in here, but and we see the error bars for each of these measurements. But the important part about this whole thing is we have one group of measurements saying one thing and one group another. There must be some physics or some understanding that we do not yet know that links them together or says, ah, but if we take this into account, then we get, then they balance out or they come to this value or something. Nobody knows what that is. That is a current area of extraordinarily active research. I did a little video on, on an attempted kind of thing where somebody said, oh, what if light has a light tie, that light gets tired and loses energy or the, or the physical constants of the universe change as time goes on. There's a lot of reasons why that can't happen. Um, and those are extensively discussed in much of the literature and it's currently ongoing. But that was just one very flashy thing that came up in, in previous months. So what we're looking at is, importantly, two different tensions, this tension that is currently active research. However, just because there is this tension, it does not invalidate the expansion. The expansion does exist. It just means we don't know everything yet. That's all it means. So in the end, which version will win? The direct measurements, such as those of the Hubble Deep Field that we see on the left, or indirect observations, such as the Planck plus just interpreting statistically the cosmic microwave background of, of the, of the as seen here in the Planck on the right, by the Planck telescope on the right. Which one is win? Which one will win? <laughs> um, which one? We don't know. There will probably be some modification of both understandings, some modification of both. So now let's go all the way back to the beginning. The cosmological principle. We look like we're at the center, but that's what every other observer will see too. No matter where in the universe we are, we will measure the same relation between the recessional velocity and the distance, the same Hubble parameter. If that's what we see, and everyone else sees it, then it's a universal property. That's isotropy and homogeneity. The universe is expanding. Now then, where was the Big Bang? We think that. It's like, oh, if it's expanding, it's expanding from some point. So where is that point? If we look, take the expansion backward in time, all the galaxies seem to originate from a single event, event in space-time called the Big Bang. Even though it seems like it, we must not be at that center because every observer also sees themselves at the center. It doesn't matter which of these galaxies we see in this image. And any galaxy, any observer, anywhere in the entire observable universe, they would all see themselves at the center. There is no place where things are actively dumping out or spreading away from the one place. There is no shock wave. There is no expansion front from some long ago explosion or detonation. There is no single spot that has a bunch of smoking embers or tangled up space-time or wibbly-wobbly messed up thing from which everything flowed. There really is no special space in the universe. Therefore, the Big Bang was everywhere all at once. This is due to the combination of the cosmological principle that we've discovered about the nature of the universe and by observation, what photons are and how they carry the energy and momentum and how we've played around with the field equations to give us something that kind of looks like a good idea. All these things come together to give this startling, inescapable, counterintuitive re result that defies common sense. The Big Bang was everywhere all at once. That's pretty cool. Universe today, then is a low density, dark, and rather cool place. We see that it continues to expand. 
the universe 13.7 billion years ago was smaller, denser, and hotter. The universe was opaque and filled with radiation in the form of photons. How far back into the universe's past can we go? Go check out my videos on cosmology to learn more about that. And don't forget to subscribe and like this video. Thanks. Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. This time we're getting way out into the cosmos. We defined the nature of redshift last time, and so redshift allows us to get distances to galaxies, and with those distances to galaxies, we can figure out how things are arranged in space. And that's the, tr uh, the structure of what we're talking about this time is groups and clusters of galaxies, because once we know where they are in the sky, we can see that they're actually grouped. All right, so the first most obvious group that we know about is called the local group. And the local group is about 54 or so galaxies comprised the Milky Way and Andromeda. It's our little local neighborhood in the universe. Now the Milky Way and Andromeda are of course falling towards each other, so they're all bound by gravity. And the diameter of the local group is about three or four megaparsecs, and it contains about five or so bright galaxies and three are spirals, and one some big elliptical orbiting uh, M31, which is M32. There are a few dwarf ellipticals, and lots and lots of little dwarf spheroidals, dwarf irregulars, and all sorts of little bitty things. Now the total mass of the local group is about five trillion solar masses. That's about five times 10 to the 12th solar masses. Because each of the Milky Way and Andromeda is a few, is a few hundred billion stars, <clears throat> with a lot of dark matter in between. And so when you add up all the stuff and all the dark matter, you got a lot of mass there. All right, so the local group is our little neighborhood. And there's what it kind of looks like. There's a lot of space between galaxies um, because remember, galaxies are where the stars are. But we also know that in between the Milky Way and Andromeda, there's an enormous amount of dark matter. So if we could possibly see all the dark matter, it would fill this space. It would be like this big glow around the Milky Way and around Andromeda. And in fact, it would probably be about five to ten times the size of it. So this whole bucket would be filled almost to the brim, almost completely smoothly with dark matter if we could see it. So the local group has a certain kind of orientation. So let's take a little tour. There's what the Milky Way is. We always center ourselves in the Milky Way. Lots of little dwarf galaxies, large and small Magellanic cloud around us. And if we go up to the M31, we see it's over here. The Triangular Galaxy M33, M110, and M32 are also there, some elliptical galaxies. And we can see their arrangement in space. Uh, and here's a beautiful image of the Andromeda Galaxy taken that was shown in Astronomy Picture of the Day. Another wonderful astronomy picture of the day picture comes here of the Triangulum Galaxy and the large and small Magellanic clouds are part of the Milky Way of the, of the local group as well. So the Milky Way is a kind, the local group is kind of a thing called a group. And so there's different kinds of ways that galaxies come. They come in groups and clusters. Groups have about 3 to 30 or a few bright galaxies and clusters have at least 30 to a couple hundred bright galaxies. And groups and clusters typically range from about a megaparsec across uh, to about 10 or 15 megaparsecs parsecs across. That's millions of parsecs, which means about 30 million light years to about 50 million light years. And they're filled with many, many, many more dwarf galaxies than bright galaxies by their counts. Now, there also, there's uh, groups and clusters of galaxies. They range in mass between a trillion and a thousand trillion solar masses. So there's a lot of mass that tends to be in groups. And thousands upon thousands of galaxy clusters have been known and cataloged. So here are some dwarf galaxies in the Perseus cluster. Here's what's one of them is called a Hickson compact group. So you see uh, three spirals, two interacting, and one, and one elliptical and possibly a very, very distant spiral in the lower left. 
Here's Higgs and Compact Group 31, and that's another group of galaxies. There is an appearance, so you can see this, this is not very big. So the Higgs and Compact Groups are kind of an exception to this, where they're very small volumes of space with smaller galaxies that are interacting as groups. Here is Seifert Sextet, which is another uh, small group of galaxies all interacting. And the Hickson compact groups themselves were studied by Hickson, and he created a series of, uh, of, of groups that were between 50,000 and 200,000 light years in diameter and always contained maybe one or two spirals uh, and elliptical a few ellipticals, but they tend to be uh, centered on spirals. And we can see a couple of groups in here with the lower left, which is the uh, which is the Stefan's Quintet, of which only the four in the, on the lower left is Stefan's Quintet. And the upper right, we just have an apparent group. The big one in the foreground is actually a foreground galaxy, but the ones that are above it and beyond, that's actually a group. So groups get to larger groups that we call clusters, and clusters of galaxies are much larger and contain thousands, can contain thousands of galaxies. The Virgo cluster is the nearest large galaxy cluster to the local group. Uh, it's a relatively loose cluster, meaning it's not really tightened in and everything together. But there are two bright ellipticals, M87 and M84, that comprise it, and it lives at a distance of about 18 megaparsecs. That's about 60 million light years, and that spans about two or three megaparsecs in diameter. Composed of about three or four thousand galaxies, and the most of them are dwarfs, of course. And the total mass is really huge, a hundred trillion suns. But the Virgo cluster has a large composition. As you can see, the spread out nature of all the fuzzy objects, that's what we mean by not compact and loose. And so there are much tighter clusters of galaxies, which we'll see shortly. And here's some of the outskirts of the Virgo cluster. We kind of rotate it around, and here's the core of, the, of it, highlighting M84 and M86, which are two giant elliptical galaxies. You can see that there's some spirals inside, but lots and lots and lots of objects that are identified as galaxies inside here. Here's an extended uh, extended mosaic of the Virgo cluster, and here's a wonderful thing from Astronomy Picture of the Day to go hunt around yourself. There it is again. So we can then go jump and look at rich galaxy clusters, and rich galaxy clusters contain thousands of galaxies. And they, they can span up to about 10 or so megaparsecs, and they have about a 1,000 trillion solar masses. So remember that the Milky Way is about 100 billion solar, uh, solar masses, which is about 10 to the, 10, 10 to the 11th. So this, this would be a 10,000 Milky Ways in terms of mass. They always at least have one giant elliptical deep in the center, and rich galaxy clusters have many ellipticals swarming around the center, and the gravitational pull from them usually makes these galaxies spin up to a thousand kilometers per second as they whip around inside of them. Now that thousand kilometers per second inside galaxy clusters has a lot of implications. And here we see the Coma Cluster, which is a more compactified galaxy cluster. And there it is, the center of the Coma, which is, you can see lots of elliptical galaxies in here and a couple giant ellipticals. But we don't see a lot of spiral galaxies inside a dense cluster like Coma. And we can see two kind of groups over here. The, there's two centralized groups of galaxies with lot, all the fuzzy patches are distant galaxies. And another rich, dense cluster, Abel 02345, where a couple of giant ellipticals surrounded by a swarm of elliptical galaxies. And here's Abel 02439, which is a long sort of string of galaxies. And another one, 2350, which is kind of an extremely distant galaxy cluster uh, that seems to be have a, have a number of ellipticals in it. Uh, and Abel 2351, which kind of looks like a star field, but actually is a group of fuzzy little galaxies far in the distance. Just to give you an idea of what galaxy clusters look like in the digital sky survey, that's what this is all doing, is that we can see that these, these little tiny fuzzy things that are deep in the distance that were seen photographically originally, and so counts were done. And here's Abel 2353, another one that's a nearby galaxy cluster. And the Hercules cluster is a more loose one, and it is spread out further and has more spirals in it. 
ABEL 98 is a much more rich cluster with a dense group of, of ellipticals around a giant elliptical at the center. And again, ABEL 98, I believe that was the same thing, ABEL 98, different orientation. Now, the fun thing about galaxy clusters is they're held together by gravity. Now, gravity is keeping them together even though the relative speeds of them are whizzing around at a thousand kilometers per second. Now, when you have something that's a hundred billion solar masses and another thing that's a hundred billion solar masses or thereabouts, and they're going a thousand kilometers per second, that's too fast for them to stay together. And since that's too fast for them to stay together, their average motions, as we learned with the nature of dark matter, when we talked about that when we looked at the Milky Way, there has to be something there that keeps them together. So the total amount of mass that must be there such that these clusters actually exist, given the fact that they are composed of these large galaxies, the mass must be enormous. So people looked for, for, for the amount of mass that was there, and they hunted in all sorts of wavelength bands, from radio to infrared to optical to x-ray. And when x-ray views were taken, it was found that a huge amount of x-ray uh, gas existed. But it wasn't enough in order to make up the mass that held the entire cluster together. Um, but most, so most of the matter in all galaxy clusters is in the form of dark matter and can make up to 90% of the mass. And that's what keeps them together from flying apart, even though they're moving very fast. In X-rays, we see that of the remaining normal matter of the entire galaxy cluster, which is 10% of like normal matter, we assume dark matter is not normal matter, but the remaining normal matter, most of it's an extraordinarily hot 10 million to 100 million Kelvin gas which can only be seen in X-ray wavelengths, and it's typically superheated material that is, that is emitting light through what's called thermal bremsstrahlung, and that bremsstrahlung action means that there is a, as, as one atom moves at nearly the speed of light, uh, relativistic thermal bremsstrahlung, or, or even just bremsstrahlung itself, itself, if they're moving extraordinarily fast, then as they pass by each other, their directions change and they lose energy. But they don't lose a huge amount of energy, but it's just enough in order, and when they turn around and get pulled by an atom pulls on an ion or pushes on an ion, that bremsstrahlung or breaking energy ha uh, makes X-ray light. And so that can be done in the presence of a magnetic field or just simply in the presence of other charged particles. And when it does that, well, if it's in the magnetic field, it would be called synchrotron, it would be rotating, it would get radio light. But thermal bremsstrahlung is, is a hot gas where the way it's emitting light, because it's not dense, it is not a dense hot gas, it is an extraordinarily diffuse hot gas with only a hundred or a thousand particles within a cubic meter. So they're incredibly, incredibly under dense areas. So the fact that it's glowing so intensely in x-rays means that there's a huge amount of it. So we see that the in the optical image here from Abel 2199, we see a bunch of galaxies, but in the X-ray image, we only see the hot, hot, hot gas, which is centered on the X-ray, which is centered on the giant elliptical at the center. So this X-ray gas comprises most of the mass of the cluster that's normal matter, and that normal matter interacts with light. But even that is not enough to keep it together. So the, the studies for X-rays emitting gas in galaxies has been done for a very long time, and when Chandra X-ray Observatory went up, the, what was one of the major studies is to map out X-ray distributions in the sky, and here's some Chandra maps of X-ray emission in the sky of various galaxy clusters. And we can see that the X-ray emitting gas greatly extends and encompasses and envelops the normal luminous matter. The vast majority of all the gas of the matter, of the normal matter in a galaxy cluster is about, about 90% of it is, is this hot X-ray emitting gas. So, the, so if 90% of a galaxy cluster is dark matter and 90% of the normal matter is, is this hot X-ray gas, then we're only seeing 1% of all the normal matter when we take a picture with a photograph in optical light where we just see stars. So stars and gas and dust make up only 1% of all the mass of galaxy clusters. Most of the rest is in this hot X-ray emitting gas. All of the rest is in dark matter and this hot X-ray gas.
So here's another image of, a, of the Chandrax Observatory looking at the hot X-ray emitting gas of a massive galaxy cluster, a rich, rich, rich galaxy cluster deep in the distance. And we can see that there's an enormous amount of X-ray emitting gas. This X-ray gas is probably, is probably being created by the formation of this galaxy cluster, as well as enormous star formation and possibly active galactic nuclei, which we will talk about in the future, where, hype, where active galaxies uh, spew out huge amounts of material into the intercluster medium, thus probably heating up this gas. And so the gas is at millions of degrees. So it's probably been that way for a very long time, but it needs to be reheating because as it emits light, it cools down. If it cools down, it's falling towards the center because gravity pulls things towards the center, as you can certainly see from this image. So something's got to reheat the gas in order for it to have this great extent so it can stay at tens of millions or 100 million Kelvin. And that's probably due to active galactic nuclei as the galaxies then collide and the supermassive black holes in their centers merge and then form quasar-like activity, which we'll talk about soon. All right, so the largest known structures, largest no structures, meh, are what are called superclusters. And superclusters are enormous clusters of clusters of galaxies or just huge, vast, amorphous, glumpy groups. And they can range up to sizes to 150 million light years or 50, mil 50, 50 million parsecs. And their masses range from 1,000 trillion masses to up to, uh, you know, quite a bit. A 10,000 trillion masses, which is an enormous amount of mass. And they tend to be long filamentary structures and separated by enormous voids that span the sizes that, that are as big as they are. Now, superclusters are dominated by, inside of the clusters themselves, mostly empty space because it is filled with dark matter and X-ray emitting gas, right? So, but there's, it's amazing to look at such an image like this from uh, Courtois, Helene et al. Uh, in their Cosmography of the Local Universe. It was published in 2013 Astronomical Journal. And I get the link there for you from Archive if you want to go take a peek, because this is worth taking a peek at, is that you see that there's these enormous voids. Uh, and uh, these huge, huge, huge voids make part of what we're looking at around here. And the Virgo, the local group, is right down in the center there, just off to the side, to the left of what's indicated by Centaurus. So the local group is part of the local Virgo supercluster. So what's that? The Virgo supercluster is uh, what is now, and now on this image that you see here, this is a map of all the galaxies in the neighborhood. And so this was made, of course, with using positions in the sky and their redshifts, and then using the Hubble relation in order to map. Because you can't get uh, Cepheid variables for all of these things, but you can very easily get redshifts. So redshifts are fast, Cepheid variables difficult. So now that we're talking about individual galaxies, if we know their distance, it's because we're correlating it using a well-calibrated uh, Hubble diagram that relates the redshift to the distance. So now this is how we know their distribution in space away from us. So the Virgo cluster of galaxies is off to one side, and we've got these little minor clusters, the Virgo Libra, Centaurus, Hydra, and Ursa Major. This is called the Virgo supercluster. It has an enormous amount of mass, and it's centered on roughly the Virgo cluster of galaxies. And as the local group falls towards the, towards the Virgo cluster, the others are kind of grouped together. And this is a roughly gravitationally bound object. Now another, but the but in 2014, uh, Tully and and a number of other astronomers uh, redefined the nature of the local superclusters, and create and redefined the Laniakea supercluster. The Laniakea supercluster it spans many hundreds of about a thousand hundred thousand galaxies, goes over. 40 million light years, up to 50, 500 million light years, almost a half a billion light years across, and has a mass of at least 10 to the 16th and the 15th of solar masses. I think I got, I made a typo there, so they have an enormous thing. There are four major subparts, and the subparts are the Centaurus cluster, the Virgo cluster, uh, the Hydra cluster, and I think I think there's another one in there. I think of the, like the Dorado group or Fornax group or the Pegasus cluster. Those were separate used to be separate superclusters, but in 2014, the astronomical community adopted uh, Tullian, Tullian team's 
definition of the nature of a supercluster because now the ability to actually resolve the relative speeds of things could be deduced and removed from, from the cosmological measurements of the redshift. So now you could get a position in the sky and base the nature of superclusters off of the how things apparently are moving in the sky. And so utilizing the, the apparent cosmic flow of galaxies, you can redefine clusters of galaxies. So the Laniakea supercluster was defined in such a way, and it's known this is too big to actually be gravitationally bound and will probably be shredded by the expansion of the universe at some point uh, within the next few billion years by the, by the push of dark energy. So the Laniakea supercluster is the, is, a, is the redefinition of the local supercluster. So let's kind of zoom back into a closer thing. So let's look at what we mean by the Virgo supercluster. Um, this is again from uh, Helena Courtois' paper, uh, the cosmography paper that we talked about later, and I'll give a reference for that soon. And we see that the Milky Way is off to kind of the outskirts of some side. There's the M81, M82 group over there to the right, and the Virgo cluster 60 million light years away, and the Ursa Major uh, loose cluster off to the side. Uh, we see that M81 and M82, which we highlighted many times off to the side, is, is pretty close by. And the Centaurus A is a bright radio galaxy that's seen in the southern sky, and the Sombrero Galaxy M101 is up there, is, is up in the sky, up over there too. So we notice from this image that there are lots of empty spaces. So the universe is kind of foamy on the largest size scales. The largest structures, such as the Laniakea supercluster, is a, are about 100 to 200 megaparsecs in extent, thus it's enormous, up to about a half a billion light years across. And those structures are only kind of semi-temporary because they're not gravitationally bound, so on the largest size scales. Uh, but, so, but they still do have some sort of coherent appearance. And so the actual definition of where clusters begin, end, and superclusters begin is kind of up to taste and current researchers, whoever working on it, and then uh, people just saying, well, that makes sense or not. So this, it's actually kind of an open-ended current area because Laniaki was only defined, of course, in 2014, so people are really, are really working on it. So clusters and superclusters are arranged in these kind of filamentary or sheet-like structures and, and sheet-like structures. And their, their actual volume occupies only about 10% of the space. So the rest is huge voids. And there are big, big, big empty bubbles. And these bubbles of voids can be you know, up, to, up to 100 million light years, up to 150 million light years across, or 25 to 50 megaparsecs across. And they have a vastly fewer numbers of galaxies than superclusters, up to 20 to 50 times fewer galaxies. And in fact, they, they might have none. So the exact number of galaxies inside of voids is not well known. So here is a, the, there is an uh, important, credible one called the Great Wall, the Sloan Great Wall. And you can see they come in these kind of lumpy sorts of structures. And, that's, and notice we're looking now at surveys. So a survey shows we're looking in velocity space. And so that's we, we can assign distance, which is distance in megaparsecs. But it's much easier just to call what the distance is. We know that the distance is, is related to the Hubble flow. So we don't really need the distance. We just say how fast it's rushing away. So we have a kind of a pizza pie diagram, and this I believe is the two is a P, 2DF survey or a Sloan Digital Sky survey, uh, and I forget which it is well, exactly. But the we see that there's fast. Oh, this would be Sloan because of the orange mark or marks out the uh, Sloan the Sloan Great Wall. But we see that there's these lumpy structures and they're foamy. And but if you look that they're foamier actually lumpier as you get closer and closer to us, meaning velocity goes to zero. So the Milky Way and we are observing from the vertex of these pizza pie slices. And as we look out towards the edge of the pizza slice, we're looking farther and farther and farther away and further and further back. And they're much more distant galaxies. So we're at the center of the observation, looking either north or south. All right, so here's a better view of that. And once again, you can see that if you look at the distance of things that are approximately 700 megaparsecs or so, we see that it kind of, things get more spread out and, or velocities uh, or up to 50,000 kilometers per second or so and greater. 
We see that it's harder to find galaxies because they're fainter, and you have to have deeper surveys in order to find them, but we see that there's greater structure nearby, or stronger, more uh, larger structures nearby, and that's a result of gravity. So the, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, uh, endeavored and continues to endeavor to map the galaxies in the cosmos, and uh, they've released many data sets over the decades that they've been working. In fact, I started my graduate career in the eight, early 90s by, by beginning some of the very, very, very rudimentary networking to connect, the, uh, connect Apache Point Observatory down to New Mexico State. Uh, in the in the in the lab area so that we could see that so it was an early use of early networking So that was kind of a nice way to begin a career Anyway, the Sloan Great Wall is an enormous enormous discovery. It's about uh, 450 million light years long about 60 or 150 or about 60 megaparsecs high and about 5 megaparsecs thick and has a mass of over 20 20 hundred 20 20,000 trillion solar masses. That's enormous. So, I mean, this, it's almost getting silly to even talk these big numbers. But remember that 10 to the 16th means that's how many suns there are. So we really should start to have a new unit in terms of Milky Ways. And a Milky Way unit would be 100 billion solar mass. So if we just use 100 billion, which would be 10 to the... Uh, 10 to, 10, to, 10, to the, uh, 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 11th solar masses. So this would be 200,000 Milky Ways would be about the size of that structure and how many things are in there. So 200,000 Milky Ways comprise the mass of that thing, and there's not many things that are bigger in structure than about 300 megaparsecs. If you do Google around, you will find some odd things such as very large groups or large quasar groups that seem to be much larger than that. But uh, they and they seem to be actually larger than this kind of structure. But notice that we don't really find structures larger in great numbers than 300 megaparsecs in size. And here's another view of the Sloan Great Wall. And there's another wall group that was seen by CF2, CFA, the Center for Astrophysics uh, Survey. And they were looking, all of them were looking in, in velocity space. Notice in these pizza, these pizza diagrams, we always look out towards the edge. And these things are given in terms of right ascension, which is left and right in the sky across a pizza wedge. And we're at the vertex looking outwards. And here's another great galaxy survey called the 2DF survey. Uh, and so we see lots of filamentary structure, the and wall like structures and voids, and each of the points is now not a star, but a but a galaxy that is billions of up to billions of light years away. And we can see the relationship between the distance in billions of light years and redshift. And redshift is up to about 0.2. Remember, redshift, we defined it in the previous lecture as being the change in wavelength compared to the rest wavelength. And it's about 20% is the redshift. So it's been changed by a, by a factor of, uh, by, you know, it, the redshift has been altered by a significant fraction. Not doubled in terms of wavelength, but extended by 20%. Uh, whatever it is. So if it's a if it's a wavelength of uh, 1,000 nanometers, then it is now 1,200 nanometers long. So it's been extended by 20 percent, and that is that happens when something's about a, almost two billion light years away. So you really have to get very far out to get significant redshift. And there's another view of the 2DF survey, um, and it leads to a very more impre incredible question: How did galaxies form? The existence of this large-scale structure, meaning all these voids and filaments and groups and clusters, galaxies have to form in these structures. So their st the structures themselves are created and shaped by gravity and dominantly by dark matter because we've learned that clusters themselves would fly apart if they weren't, create if they weren't composed of dark matter. So they're moving really fast. They're composed of mostly dark matter. The structures are shaped by the gravity of the dark matter and the hot intercluster gas that permeates them. So there has to be huge amounts of con concentrations of matter where the galaxies form. So we should expect that the, that the dark matter web 
should look very similar to the web-like structure that we see here. And that will come up when we talk about large-scale structure formation as part of the Big Bang. So let's go back to Courtois and Helene et al. And, uh, who are looking at uh, the, the map of the local universe. And this just predates Tully's definition of Laniakia. And it looks at things in terms of the local speeds. And in fact, this set of data is what helped to define the nature of, of Laniakia. So we see that, let's start with the local group and the local group in Milky Way and Andromeda and M101 and M81 group and all that stuff. Remember M81, M82, way over there, there's lots of little dwarf galaxies next to them. But, but you can also see that there's an enormous void off to above and below the plane of the Milky Way, which is really fascinating. And if we look down from that local void on top of it, we see that there's a group, a tiny little grouplet over by M81, which is its own group of galaxies, right? And we see M83 has its own group, and Centaurus A, which is a bright, bright, bright radio galaxy. When we talk about active galaxies, it'll be in there. And we see these things are composed of little, little groups. And if we then zoom out a bit bigger, to, we, we see again the location of the Virgo cluster of galaxies, which has a few thousand galaxies inside it. And we saw all the little tiny mini groups that are close by. Uh, and then we can kind of look even a larger size scale and notice that the coma cluster is much more distant. And we get the beginnings of the Great Wall. And the zone of avoidance is, is there because of the existence of, because the Milky Way itself, the dust and gas of the Milky Way blocks that view. So there is a huge gap that it can't be seen and never shall be seen because of the Milky Way blocking it. But on this size scale, uh, when we're looking at velocity space of up to 5,000 kilometers per second of recession velocity, that gets us out to uh, some, some rather large galaxy clusters such as Coma and Abel, Abel uh, 1367. But you see that Virgo cluster is about 65 million light years away, so that we would go five times that distance. So we go out to about 300 million light years away to get us to the Coma cluster, as well as Abel 1367. We take and we rotate the view because that was that was an X and Y view. Now we look at it from above, uh, from the Z axis looking down, and we see the zone of avoidance from there, and we see the Virgo cluster off to the side, and we can see slightly different versions of the filamentary and, and group-like structure of the local universe. And we can rotate it again to see the pancakey sort of structure of the entire environment. So it is kind of flat, actually. There's a very pancakey structure to the entire local universe. So now we can kind of group it and see how things look in sort of a density sort of format. So we have red where it's most dense and blue where it's least dense and nothing where it isn't dense. And we see there's big groups by the Hercules cluster. The, the Great Wall is intruding in. It's just poking into the, uh, into the, into the view. And from a different angle, we see the Great Wall poking through again. And this is where it gets interesting and in how we begin to start to define the nature of Laniakia. So notice all these little dots. And this is what, Court, this is what Courtois Helene et al. did in order to try to begin the mapping. And this is a major achievement of actually being able to take the actual velocity data out of the flow and show you how things move in the sky because of the local flow that they must have. So we zoom back and forth between the two images and go back and forth between the velocity space and, and others. And we find that we're in part of a large group that's falling towards the great attractor. So the Virgo cluster in which we are in the cent kind of center right is flowing towards this red area. And the blue is where things are flowing out of. The red is where it's, things are flowing into and the blue is flowing out. So there's, and these things are traveling on the order of thousands of kilometers per second, and we're looking at things that are millions upon millions of light years in size. So the great attractor is apparent, is not visible due to the zone of avoidance uh, because the Milky Way is blocking it, so we can't see it. But we do, we can measure the flow or the apparent flow by seeing the residual uh, speed uh, away from the Hubble diagram, away from the Hubble flow. And so then we can look at, the, at a slightly different view that shows us the Virgo cluster flowing towards the great attractor and leaving behind an enormous, enormous void. The blue is where the voids are, the great attractors are where the red are. 
And this shows how things apparently are flowing in the local rivers of the universe. And again, here's another amazing view of it that shows how the flow is going towards the, uh, there's the local void and how everything is kind of flowing towards both the Fornax cluster, the Virgo cluster, and then that's all going towards the uh, Great Attractor. And so what we have is that's the, the flow diagram. And then if we take that flow diagram and say, really, what's actually grouped together, we can name those groups. And we find that there is that there are all these superclusters in and around our area. And we find that the superclusters are the, the, the local billion light years in area, the Laniakia group. Uh, supercluster is in yellow in here, but we see all these other superclusters that, that are around us. And superclusters make up the largest size scale objects in the cosmos and are composed of enormous numbers of galaxies with vast, vast, vast distances between them. And the Laniakia group is not necessarily a gravitationally bound group. Most of these large stringy superclusters are not, but the clusters within them are. So there's a bit about our local cosmos just within the nearest billion light years and how we found it using redshift surveys and groups and clusters. And we'll see you next time. Hello, this is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. We're continuing down the path towards understanding the Big Bang and the most, some of the more important elements to it. We're not going to get into huge details like we're taking a graduate level course or something, but I'm giving you a taste of all the things that go into Big Bang cosmology. One of the most important things that we have then is that we found last time that galaxies come in clusters and groups and that there's been some big surveys. So now we're going to look at galactic evolution and how things change. So again, cosmology is the physics and distribution and age of the universe. And the cosmological principle says there's nothing special about our location other than it's our place and our home. And as a result, the laws of physics are the same everywhere in the universe. All right. So what is out there way out past 10 to the 8th parsecs, 100 million parsecs in the billions of light years? What do we see out there? Well, what we can do is we can actually look far back in time and use very specific kinds of surveys to see how galaxies have evolved with time. And that's really what we're going to be talking about now. So it's thought that galaxies go from small, misshapen, extraordinarily blue objects and go by mergers and mergers and mergers to forming spirals and giant ellipticals. So it's thought that galaxies start in very tiny things and grow through gravity. And that's what we think it is. Now, given that's the concept, we should look for that in the observational evidence to see if this general sketch is true. So we can also think that this might we, there's definitely evidence for collisions because as we saw, starburst galaxies have massive star formation. We can actually model the appearance of starburst galaxies by colliding. And the, the collision, collision models and uh, numerical models that show collisions between spirals can actually accurately map objects that we see deep in the sky. And in fact, we see some places that look like they have multiple cores, like some galaxy has, some galaxies are, are supermassive uh, giant elliptical galaxies and appear to have multiple galactic cores. And so they must be in the process of merging. Also, we know about stellar streams. There are stellar streams around other galaxies, and there's also stellar streams orbiting our Milky Way. And stellar streams are tiny little galaxies that are very low mass that get spread apart along the line, their, their orbital path. And as they orbit, they get stretched and pulled, and their stars get pulled into different orbits. And they no longer look like a galaxy, but now look like a stream because of the tidal pull between the near and far side of the little galaxy. So we should expect that larger interactions actually will create maybe some spiral interactions. Maybe a small galaxy turn a large one to a spiral if it still has gas and dust, it spins it up. So we can then say, well, 
do, do these evolutionary characteristics actually appear in the data? And so if we look at, at, at massive surveys, such as the 2DF galaxy redshift surveys, looks at about a quarter million galaxies, and they showed that, yeah, they're distributed in sheets and filaments and voids, and some of and they're, the appear, what's been looked at by this specific, specific survey goes out to about almost 2 billion light years. And there we'd have a better view of it. And we see the redshift is about to about 0.25, about a quarter. And that's a really good way of measuring. Instead of billions of light years, redshift is the big thing that we're going to be talking about. So the other one that's actually been a significant contributor to the universe, uh, the, our understanding of the universe, is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which was a large two and a half meter scope in Cloudcroft, New Mexico, and uh, actually went to grad school in New Mexico State, and I started off the very, very, very beginnings of the elements of the computer technology that went into the the uh, the stuff. And so back since that's the early 1990s, we're talking this is like the beginning of the internet. So you know nowadays that would it, it would look what I did was kind of minor, but yet it was groundbreaking in its time, and that's how I want me to do other things in my life too, which is kind of neat. So. This particular telescope, though, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is demonstrate, which is shown here, um, its goal and its its major survey ran from 2000 to 2008, and it cataloged millions upon millions of objects with hundreds of thousands of quasar redshifts and lots and lots of galaxy redshifts, and it got photometry for billions of stars, galaxies, and quasars. And the goal with this thing was to make an accurate map of the sky and specifically hunt for, for galaxies on their redshifts. And there it is over, over, the, uh, over the, the, the Sacramento Mountains. And in the distance, you can see the White Sands National Monument. So this is a beautiful place. And if you ever get a chance to go to New Mexico and get up to Cloudcroft and say hello, do it. Anyway, this is their. This is one of their data sets. This comes out from the from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This is comes from their what they call their classic legacy archive, and it shows uh, shows out to a redshift of about 0.15, which is not as deep in this particular image as the as the 2DF survey. But over time, the Sl uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey went much deeper and had many and much larger data set than 2DF. Well, uh, well, can we find that takes a little bit? So let's go back a little bit further and see why the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was even done and why 2DF was done and what motivated people to make these massive surveys. Well, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched and uh, in a, long, a while back, and one of its major goals was to actually study the evolution of the universe. And what this was was the longest at the time, it was released in January of 96, uh, it, it, it was the, the deepest survey yet done by any telescope in ever. And so this is what we call a pencil beam survey. And the Hubble Deep Field uh, was, was a, was, was, allowed us to see galaxies back to about 13, uh, about almost 13 billion light years in distance. But we see that there's all sorts of, of arrangements and appearances to galaxies. There are about 1,500 galaxies in this image alone. But, they, but remember that the size of this image is very tiny. It looks kind of big here, but if you take a dime and put it 75 feet away, that is the size of this image in the sky. So it's a very, 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 very tiny image of the sky. And if 1,500 galaxies are in this direction of the sky, then they're everywhere. And this is not the deepest of the surveys, but this was the first one. And here's some elements from it. Um, and it was a, and the, the details uh, were, were, was pretty controversial when it first was done because nobody actually thought that this would actually use Hubble time wisely. But it ended up being an amazing, amazing set of discoveries. Uh, and we see most of the objects in here are galaxies. There are some faint red dwarfs uh, that, are, that are Milky Way objects. Those would be the stellar objects that are in the foreground. But most of the tiny, tiny, tiny objects in the background are galaxies. Again, here are some more details from the Hubble Deep Field, and there were 30, 342 frames taken over the course of, of 10 days. So this is a huge, huge undertaking, uh, and the size of the, the area was, this is one of the longest exposures ever done to date in 1997. All right, so 
But that wasn't the first then. Considering that that was something that actually yielded results, then people said, well, let's keep going. Let's keep going and get more. So the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, uh, based in part on that, uh, surrounding that area. And so what you see is that the purple circle here shows what the Hubble Ultra Deep Field looked at, and that the, the circle illustrates the size of the moon. And then there's the green outline, which is the goods survey. Uh, and this is the, the goods north group. And so there's a very large image that was created out of that. And the advanced camera for surveys on Hubble Space Telescope uh, is a tiny little blue block in the center. And the near-infrared camera and multi-object spectrometer, or NICMAS, also on the Hubble Space Telescope was used to do deep imaging. So a series of, of images um, were, were given in this whole area uh, in order to, to, um, to, I, to discover exactly how deep, what kind of depth we had. And the Hubble Ultra Deep Field then was released in 2003, about six years later. And this, held some of the, this also uh, contains the Hubble Deep Field. But it is a, there's now 10,000 galaxies in this visible light image. And so they, they used a large, so now the visible light band was used. And there are some very, very, very red galaxies. And the, the dimmest objects and tiniest galaxies were when the universe was only about 800 million years old. Um, and so as you see through, when close-ups of this image show that when the universe, well, you look at deep, deep, deep into this image and look at the highest redshift objects, then those are small blue misshapen galaxies. And you only get fine structures like spiral galaxies in the local universe, meaning today. And what this, there's something really interesting about this that we'll get to. Um, but this again was an enormous undertaking with 800 exposures, taken over 400 orbits of the Hubble Space Telescope around the Earth, about 11 days of exposures. Uh, and this utilized the advanced camera for surveys. And then they utilized looking at the, with the NICMAS experiment, looking at the near infrared, to actually look at the objects who would be strongly redshifted. And this gives an important element to see what are the deepest objects in this field. And that allows you to see further back in the past, because if something is getting greatly redshifted, it will probably appear in the infrared rather than visible. And so you can actually see farther back in time using this. And that's why we that this the caption of this uh, comes shows that it's about 400 million years after the Big Bang would be the deepest and faintest objects inside of this. So the Hubble Ultra Deep Field is actually in the northern constellations. I uh, actually know it's this is a southern. This is the, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field south. It looks in the exact opposite direction, and uh, we're looking in the area of Eridanus in the constellation Fornax. So there are many details in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field that show the evolution and state of galaxies. You can see some extraordinarily misshapen objects, and only the larger objects, meaning the closer objects, meaning objects that are in the local universe, are actually things that are, um, that are, that are grandly structured, such as spiral galaxies. But if you look in, say, the lower right image of these six, you see in the upper, in the kind of the right, left-hand side of the lower right object, you see a really distorted and misshapen thing. In fact, all the objects in there are distorted and misshapen, and only recent objects, meaning very nearby and at low redshift, have the appearance. And what we're actually beginning to see is that the something that looks like the Milky Way only appears now. If the universe had it was infinitely old, then we should expect to see things just like the Milky Way, but extraordinarily far away. We do not see that. What we do see, though, is the Milky Way is only a recent thing. And if we look farther out into space and therefore farther back in time, we see that there is an evolution of galaxies from then to now. And we do not see anything in the deep, deep, deep past that looks like anything like the Milky Way. So this is, again, a prediction of the Big Bang, that there would be a baby picture of the universe and an adult picture. And baby pictures in predict that if the universe had a beginning, then if you look farther out into space, you're looking farther back into time. And therefore, you should see things as they were ago. And if the universe was infinitely old and didn't have a birthday, then you should see Milky Ways and things mixed in with baby galaxies. But we do not see that. We only see baby galaxies long ago 
and far away. So the goods field south that we de described a bit, this was, this was presented at the AAAS conference, American Astronomical Society conference in July, January 2015, 2010. I had an interesting time seeing this. They printed this out and put it on a wall at high, high resolution. It, it was about 30 feet long, I think, and about 15 feet high. It was an enormous, enormous poster that they printed out. But the goal with this thing was, again, to show that the images of the, that galaxies could be, uh, could be seen when we look perpendicular to the plane of the Milky Way. And as we look at very, very far deep, deep out, we get to see how, how galaxies have evolved with time. And here are some details from that image set. As we zoom in, we see many, many galaxies. But the deepest, tiniest, even the tiny little flecks, those are galaxies. Those are because they're misshapen and they don't look like point sources such as stars. Now, there are a few Milky Way stars in this image, uh, quite a few. But most of them are, uh, but there's more, more galaxies than stars. So the fuzzy objects are are galaxies. And on the left-hand side, we see a number of tiny galaxies or globular clusters or dwarf kinds that are being, uh, that are, that are interacting with the two near spirals that we see. And we see kind of a little spiral off to the upper left that is much further away. And here's some details inside of that as well. We see a kind of a cluster and some gravitational lensing effects on the upper left there. We see a gravitationally lensed galaxy. And we see the ranges of redshifts in here. So if you can go, I will post the uh, actual po uh, the, the actual images and the location where you can find this on NASA's website. So you can go take a peruse so you can see how far back in time we look. All right, these are some really cool images. And again, almost all of the things that we see in this image are galaxies as opposed to, um, as opposed to stars. But part of the ultra deep field that was observed were some extraordinarily high redshift objects. So in 2011, a particular ultra-distant uh, ultra, ultra object was seen where its uh, redshift was measured in a very special way, which I'll describe in just a bit. And if it is a tiny, dim, misshapen, compact galaxy just made up of blue stars, wait a second, if it's made of blue stars, why would it be red in the image? Uh, well, okay, since it's not like a mystery game, it's red because it's been redshifted. It's been redshifted deep into the infrared. But the, in order for it to be seen deep in the infrared, it must be extraordinarily bright. And if, there, and if it's high, high, high redshift and still visible in the infrared, then therefore it must be bright. And therefore these whatever was emitting it was emitting copious amounts of blue light. So this is a time when this particular galaxy, whatever it looked like, was a mishmash of stellar activity. So let's zoom in and take a look at what this ultra deep object is. and has the highly enjoyable name of Ultra Deep Field J3954684. Okay, that's not very illuminating. Uh, this was done by Illingsworth at, at Santa Cruz and Bowens and, and uh, Hubble Ultra Deep Field 2019. And so we can zoom in and see this little bitty tiny red dot, which is this ultra red high redshift object. And well, you know, now we're looking at the actual pixels on board the Hubble Space Telescope itself. And that is the, the, the pixelation, that, that blocky appearance is the appearance of the actual object in the picture itself. And the boxes are the individual pixels on the camera for the, for the Hubble Space Telescope. And they provide a couple of links here that show an interesting thing we're going to talk about called photometric redshift. So photometric redshift is what you can do when you have a high redshift object and a lot of filters. So the Hubble Space Telescope is outfitted with a huge number of, photo, of filters that it can use to put in front of, of the camera. So what they'll do is they'll focus on an object and then they'll take an image of it with one filter, then another, then another, then another. And if you steady on it and look at, now we've got this funny thing going back and forth, okay? So what we're seeing is an image of a galaxy and if it's red shifted, it will simply disappear from the long wave, the, the short wavelength, meaning the purple and blue side of this, which would be the left-hand side. And as it's getting redshifted, it will be appear only on the right. So why does the light disappear and go to zero? That's because there's hydrogen gas in the way. And as the light traverses the distance of the cosmos, as it traverses it, the hydrogen gas absorbs it at a specific frequency, but it's been redshifted. So it gets absorbed at every wavelength uh, in between. So 
you're going to find that there is no light left over at, at, at visible wavelengths because as it travels, it keeps passing through hydrogen gas at different redshifts so it can absorb at different wavelengths. That's really interesting. So we're left with, if you only see it in the longest possible wavelength filter, wavelength band filter, and that's the only signal is in the, the long wavelength filter, such as the F160W that we see there, way off on the right-hand side, and it's only visible in that one. That means it's been so strongly redshifted that the only way that galaxy can be seen is if it's a redshift exceeding that of 10 or 11. All right, so an example galaxy then, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field 2009, and the Extreme Hubble Deep Field, which is XDF, uh, actually integrated all these things together and looked at all the various filters that the Hubble Space Telescope can see, stacked them together, and found that 39546284 Ultra Deep Field J object has, an ex has a Z or a redshift of about 10 because it only appears in the Hubble H filter. It doesn't appear in BV, I, Z, Y, or J filters. And so we call this a photometric redshift because it doesn't, the galaxy's light only appears at that wavelength. So we think it's a galaxy and not a foreground star because a star will still have some emission at a little bit broader wavelengths. So it will not, it, it won't be only at these wavelengths. Although it could mirror that, but then you look at the shape of the object and say, oh, it's misshapen, it doesn't have a point-like source. So therefore, it's probably not a star or some rogue planet in between the galaxies, because those things would be pretty dim. And so the galaxy itself can be observed, and we can posit that because it only appears in one of the filters, it must be an extraordinarily high redshift, and therefore it set a record of being a redshift of 10 when the universe was 10 times smaller, more like 11 times smaller, actually. So the Hubble Ultra Deep Field uh, was, was then uh, concluded in 2012, and those observations were taken between August and September, and that included numerous observations on top of it all, uh, and using the Wide Field Camera 3 with numbers of different filters. So they actually started adding different filters together. And the goal would be then to say, if you can add all these filters up, you can finally get photometric redshifts, and that's what's been highlighted in this image is, is the highest redshift objects in the entire uh, in the entire field. And we see that there's a couple of them at high redshift 8, another one at 10. Inside this field, another tiny object at redshift 9.5, and, and another high redshift object at 8, at almost 9-ish. And then the highest redshift object is the one we were talking about at 11.9, which is an enormous time, which is when the universe was, ten, was one tenth of its current age, or one twelfth of its current age, and 10 times smaller. Remember we talked about redshift indicates the size of the cosmos. So it's actually about 12 times physically smaller at that time. So the extreme deep field then stacked all of these images together and made it for an amazing, amazing panorama. They just they took all the legacy data and all their own current data and pulled it together to make one image so it actually had approximately many months of time. And this was this is a common technique that amateur astronomers use in order to stack images together to make a very pretty picture. And it actually cleans up the image because you can actually eliminate uh, noise by doing that. So the more data you have, the cleaner your data is. And you can say, oh, it, you have a pixel in this image, but not in that image. And so that must be its noise. And so this allows the image to be very well cleaned. And the only thing that's left is data. So this one small image shows 5,500 galaxies at various states in evolution. And we see there's the, the proof and that we have the pre, uh, a, a, uh, some extraordinarily distant objects. And there was one that's even a, that showed a redshift, a supernova in a galaxy inside the Hubble Deep Field, which demonstrated the redshift was at a, a redshift of two. So that was a very high redshift uh, object to see. All right. But that's not all. So people kept hunting and hunting and hunting and eventually found inside that field some objects that are worth following up on. And the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, led, by, led by Pascal Osh at Yale, in March of 2016, instead of just doing a photometric redshift, obtained an actual spectroscopic redshift 
uh, inside of in, inside of a of a the most distant galaxy. So that is the this an uh, this is a much much more uh, difficult measurement. Photometric measurement has a lot of problems, but if you can make an actual spectrum of it, then you know that you're actually looking what you can actually determine the spectral free, spectral characteristics and determine it's actually a galaxy and not a star. Mm -hmm. So they were able to do this and find that this was a confirmed redshift by, 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 by actual spectroscopy, that when the universe, we're looking at, that the light has traveled to us from this little galaxy for 13.4 billion years, and only when, they, when the couple hundred million years after stars first started to form, so we're almost looking at the very, very, very baby pictures of the gal of the universe, and so this is an uh, this is an amazing little discovery. And so you had to really pour over this image to say, hey, there's a very red-like object. Let's take a let's take a closer look at it. And so here is the image of that. So they cleaned up the Hubble image. We saw from the other thing that it that how, what that actually looks like, and we see this squarey aspect to it, which shows we're looking at the actual pixels of the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is a the shape of this misshapen, really bright galaxy. Well, it was very bright at its time, making huge amounts of blue stars. It now looks red because of the redshift. And so it probably existed, at the time it existed about 400 million years after the Big Bang. And so how they did this was they took the, uh, a, the spectroscopy, a spe spectroscopic slit of the Hubble Space Telescope and laid it across the object. And that's what these lines show is the location of the, how the orientation of the spectrometer was. And so they actually could get some clear space in order to, in order to actually, uh, or actually get, a, get a view of it. And so what they had to do is they took their full spectrum of it, that's what the top image shows, and then they figured out, well, you know, there were some bright objects in there, so they must be contaminating a little bit. So they reduced the contamination by the objects there. And after they take out the contamination due to neighbors, then they had a clean spectrum. And then they had a model of what a high redshift galaxy should look like. And then they reduced the clean spectrum by the model, and they got what looks like static. And that bottom one is the residual, which is static. And so that's the best you can do is create static, which is random noise. And so they feel like they've actually gotten it. And so this, since, since this spectrum took 12 orbits every three days of focusing on this, this one little object, they found that they could model the, the spectrum. So the upper, red chip, upper portion is the actual spectrum of it. And then the modeling uh, shows where the data points lied and how they could actually say, okay, it's basically noise to the left, and then they have an actual spectrum that begins with the, uh, the, the, uh, the grism showing it's an 11.1 uh, res redshift object. So this was, uh, the, is, it is currently the highest redshift object measured spectroscopically, which is really interesting. So it's the farthest galaxy that Hubble probably will be able to see, and it still doesn't get to when stars turned on. It's looking at extraordinarily deep objects, but Hubble's, but Hubble's uh, aperture is not large enough. It simply is not a large enough aperture, and it doesn't have the infrared capability. And that's going to have to wait till the James Webb Space Telescope is launched. So with the, object, the previous record holder was about 700 million years after the Big Bang. Now it's something that's looking at about 400 million years after the Big Bang, just after stars started forming only 200 million years. So we could think that if stars that are super massive take only a 5 to 10 million years to actually form, then potentially we're looking at the first four or five or six generations of stars being formed in that little, in that misshapen sort of weird galaxy. And hopefully the James Webb Space Telescope will to see things. And this diagram kind of tells it shows us what we've been seeing is that structure forms with time and galaxies evolve from being small, misshapen, tiny, bright things and they merge and collide into larger and larger and larger objects until they form either supermassive uh, ellipticals or small ellipticals or grand spiral galaxies. So just to give you a feel for what this where this location is, that where that tiny, tiny, tiny galaxy is, we're looking at Ursa Major, the Big Dipper in the sky, and so let's zoom in to see how tiny a patch of sky that really is that we're looking at. And we keep zooming in and zooming in and falling into this into this tiny patch into the Goodsfield North Survey, all the way into tinier, tiny locations, and there it is, 
one little bitty object seen in spec observed spectroscopically by Hubble. And yeah, it's right off the handle of the Big Dipper. <laughs> So what we've learned by looking at these deep, deep, deep surveys, which we, we call, we'll call pencil beam surveys, um, like the Hubble Deep Field, Hubble Ultra Deep Field, Extreme Deep Field, is that we're able to see galaxies in different states of evolution. And so we can think of what a spiral galaxy like our Milky Way would look like. And it would about two, when the, when the universe was only two billion years old, is what the far right-hand pictures might see. And as time progresses from, say, right to left, I wish it was the other way, but hey, we're, we're going this way. So when the universe is only two billion years old on the far right, things were tiny, bright, and misshapen. And as uh, at five billion years after the Big Bang, we see multiple cores and multiple interactions in some bright areas, but not uniformly bright across the object, but they're larger and there's some structure that's appearing. By nine billion years after the Big Bang, objects have gotten much more complex and larger in scope. And by the today type time, 13.7 billion years later, we're rounding to 14 just because, because this was in 1994 and still oh, dark energy still not been really discovered yet. So here we go. But 14 billion years, 13.7 billion years later, I should really adjust the slide. Uh, we see spirals and giant elliptical type objects. So galaxies evolve with time. We do not see Milky Ways in the deep past, so therefore a key prediction of the Big Bang, which is stuff had a beginning, it evolved with time, and we only see very far away long ago because it takes time for light to get here from there. So therefore, since we don't see structured Milky Ways deep in the, pa deep in the past, there, the universe had a birthday, and we're seeing the tiny, tiny, tiny beginnings and how things evolve with time. And that's what the important thing is, and a key prediction of the Big Bang. Now, if the universe was infinitely old and infinitely big, and maybe there is matter being created, like a steady state theory, then you should expect it to be mixed together, like young galaxies, like tiny misshapen things right next to old ones. But that is not the case. We only see the tiny misshapen bright ones deep in the past. We only see the grand spirals nearby. We only see the giant ellipticals nearby. So galaxies do evolve with time, and that was is a key prediction of the Big Bang Theory. So um, there, there's some review questions for you to go over and talk about, and I'll post the links to these websites, which are really amazing, so you can learn even more about them on my website and on the YouTube channel. So we'll see you next time. Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Tonight, we're going to be continuing our quest into the extragalactic domain. We've talked about the types of galaxies, how they're distributed in space. But if we go out even further and just think about what is out there, that there's happening way out there in the cosmos, we find that some of the most violent things in the universe are happening really close next door, considering, uh, considering cosmological distances. So we're going to talk about active galaxies and quasars, some of the most luminous objects in the universe and how we know that and what, are, what the strange observations we have of them are. Active galaxies were discovered first in 1943 by Carl Seifert. He identified six kinds of galaxies. And well, actually, they were, uh, well, he studied them most exactly. He, he studied uh, galaxies that had strong, broad emission lines. And they came from the center of the galaxy, meaning mostly and coming mostly from the center, meaning we cut the nucleus of the galaxy, and they were bright and compact galaxies. Those are called Seifert galaxies because, you know, the guy who discovered them were Seifert. Well, in the 50s, uh, radio telescopes found that some of the faint galaxies that were, were, there were many, many, many faint galaxies found at the location of extraordinary radio emission, and they're called radio galaxies. Okay, so kind of had names for things before we really knew what they were, but so there were Seifert galaxies with broad emission lines and radio galaxies doing a lot of extra radio emission. Um, but the thing is, is that when you look at with optical spectroscopy, 
we see that there's broad emission lines in their spectrum. What he did uh, back in actually, uh, why did Sly, why did uh, Carl Seifert actually go and look at these things? Well, back in uh, back in the day, prior to the 1920s and 1930s, Vesta Slifer and Edwin Hubble looked at a specific one, one of the nearby galaxies, NGC 1068, which is one of the Messier objects. I believe it's Messier 60, uh, 77. Um, found it to have a really weird spectrum. And that's an odd thing. And what they did is that Seifert did do the follow up, and this was one of his first galaxies that he looked at. And he found that it had big emission lines of hydrogen, helium, and oxygen. And this is a more modern version of its spectrum taken by Mostakis and Kennecott back in 2006. And we find, if you look closely, that there are some really, really bright hydrogen emission lines, specifically the one at 6,550 angstroms. That is hydrogen. We also see the helium line at 5,000. And there's also some other bright oxygen lines floating around in there, too. But notice it just kind of has a flat spectrum uh, from left to right, unlike the star spectra that we saw. So this is a very different sort of spectrum. And notice the hydrogen emission is extraordinarily wide. That wouldn't look pink. That would look, that would look kind of reddish, but it wouldn't have that distinct pink that we associate with those star forming regions like we see in the spiral arms of this particular galaxy. Look at that little inset image and you see that there's these pink glows. Those are star forming regions and that's the pink stuff. Now that is also at the, at the wavelength of 6563, but notice the intensity of the light at that one specific wavelength. Also then compare it with the bright kind of yellowish whitish center of the nucleus. The nucleus that we see in the inset is the place where this spectrum comes from. If we were to look at just the pink uh, clouds off to the right hand of the of the center, we would only see a bright pink thing. So that uh, at that specific wavelength, and we wouldn't see much else. That's why it looks that pinkish color. But the bright center of the galaxy has uh, is enormous hydrogen emission, which is very broad, as well as emission at other wavelengths too. But that's right down in the center. So it doesn't look pink though, which is really interesting. That's because it's bright at many wavelengths. So if we then zoom in and look at just that central region, just that tiny, tiny dot in the center, not the outskirts, but the really bright center of the, of the image of that galaxy, we find and focus in specifically on the wavelength band only for hydrogen emission. You, you can then see just how broad the emission line is. It's not just at 6563 6, angstroms. It's really smeared out and much, much wider. So it's uh, almost 100 angstroms wide and more like 50 or 60 angstroms wide when an emission nebula like the Orion Nebula or something like that will only be about 5 or 10 angstroms wide. This, is, this broadening is due to what we call Doppler broadening. And Doppler broadening means that there's some clouds of gas that are moving towards us and some clouds of gas that are moving away from us. And some of them are moving extraordinarily fast, up to 5 or 10, 5,000 kilometers per second. So how does that make it broad? Well, as you can see in the inset, we've got some cloud. We got, now we can break it down to individual particles inside the cloud. And we see that if, if well, if bulk clouds, but let's just pretend we're looking at each of these dots as one individual cloud. So if, they're, if it's really moving fast, then the hydrogen, and if it's moving fast towards us, the hydrogen can, blue, can absorb light that would, or emit light. This is all an emission now. The emission from a, from a hydrogen atom moving very quickly towards us, its wavelength of light will be blue shifted, and hydrogen moving very quickly away from us will be strongly red shifted. Now it's a mix between a lot of uh, between uh, between high red shift and low red shift, but mostly in between. So that's what the color combination is trying to show in the image. So the average is going to be kind of right on the center of it because the average is definitely on the center. But there's some high moving parts and some low moving parts. However, when we're looking at the central region of this galaxy, it's not really that. It's whole huge clouds such as the pink dots. But they're really, really, really tight in and they're really compact. And so they're moving extraordinarily fast and they're extraordinarily bright. So let's see some other observations of them, some other Seifert type galaxies, which are really pretty. So in the center of this image, we see NGC 4151 which is about uh, 62 million light years away. Uh, this picture was taken by Adam Block with the Mount Lemmon Sky Center at University of Arizona, uh, and it was taken on a 32-inch scope of the Schulman Foundation Telescope. 
in fact, this was another one of the core group that, that Seifert additionally used to define the term a Seifert galaxy. Now, we are going to say this a couple of times, that the, the nucleus might hold a black hole. I'm going to allude to that in the next lecture, but let's actually step away from that, step back from that idea, and actually just look at the nature of what, what we're actually seeing. That's actually funny is, is that there might be binaries that they orbit really fast, but the most important thing in this is that we've got a very, very, very bright, compact region of the galaxy that has very strong emission lines and looks kind of whitish, but it's bright overall. In fact, if you look really closely at this thing, you'd guess that the central region is easily just as bright as all the rest of the galaxy combined, and you'd be right. All right, another, uh, another wonderful Seifert galaxy is NGC 1097. It's an extraordinarily bright nucleus uh, and a bar-like structure. It's about 45 million uh, light years away. It's, it exhibits some of this, and this picture was taken by the European Southern Observatory's uh, VLT, VLT on a couple of nights. It just so happened that I believe the president of Spain was there during this observation down in Chile. This is another Seifert galaxy, NGC 7469. Uh, this, it's the one in the upper right. It's actually colliding with the one that's in the lower left. Uh, this is almost 200 million light years away. That's why it looks fuzzier than all the rest. It's farther away, so it's harder to get it clear. And this is a Hubble Space Telescope image uh, and that you can go uh, check out that image with. But, the, but again, we see a very, very, very bright, compact nucleus. Let's compare and contrast a bit. So a, go a galaxy's nucleus, a normal galaxy, is the exact center of a galaxy. It's pretty much the same no matter what. So you have the galaxy's nucleus as the center. If it's the spiral galaxy, then it's the exact center of rotation of the entire galaxy. And ellipticals, it's like this dynamical center around which everything seems to be orbiting. And, so, uh, and then for normal galaxies, there's always some sort of really dense star cluster in the center. Maybe there's a, a supermassive black hole, almost always actually. And the spectrum shows uh, of a normal galaxy, lots and lots and lots of stars and lots of absorption lines. And so there's a bunch of things happening in there. There might be, might be gas emission and so forth, but mostly it's stars and gas and dust. And it's a composition of those things. And so you can see that, and there might be some weak nebular emission lines, like the hydrogen emission lines. However, if you're looking at an active galactic nucleus, it's very different. Roughly about 10% of all galaxies have what we call our active galaxies or active nuclei. This is a really fuzzy number. You look around the inner, you look around at it, and this number is very fuzzy. But let's just it's the not the most important thing is that not all galaxies are active. So the, but in general, an active galaxy shows a bright, compact galaxy, and sometimes it's brighter than the entire rest of the galaxy. The spectrum is different too than a normal galaxy. There are those strong, broad emission lines like I showed you before, and they're coming from extraordinarily hot, very excited gas that's moving really fast around. These AGN, or active galactic nuclei, they're also variable. So if you were to take a spectrum of them, or their brightness, they vary on extraordinarily t short time scales, for about a day or so. That means that whatever's making this variation is very small, meaning it has to be smaller than one or two light days across in order for it to be coherent enough that we actually see it. Spiral galaxies tend to be the ones that we see with this kind of uh, Seifert level activity. And, but the, when we're talking about like really dominant cores, it's only about 1% of them. So the truly dominant ones are, are kind of rare. An interesting one that is shown uh, that, that I like to show, and it's kind of one of the quintessential ones that you'll see in textbooks and online, is the Circinus galaxy. It's a spiral that's really actually kind of close. It's only about 12 million light years away. It's one of the local neighborhood sort of galaxies. And, but it wasn't discovered because it's basically in the plane of the Milky Way until 1977. Um, so since you're in the middle of a star field and dust plane of the Milky Way, it can easily be mistaken for some. I think, in fact, you'll look in the literature and you'll find that it was mistaken for like a standard nebula. In any event, uh, then, the, then there's a classic Hubble image of Seifert galaxies, the Seifert uh, Circinus galaxy taken with the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2, and that's what I put in the inset there. And that inset was taken uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope by Wilson et al. at the uh, University of Maryland. And that was part of their study. What we see, though, is that another, an amber, uh, another astronomer, Judy Schmidt, 
took a bunch of the Hubble observations that were taken and then rejiggered them using Photoshop and so forth and focused in on the core and made what he considered more of a true color image. And it does look very true colorish. Uh, the rings, and you can see the rings of the hydrogen gas, and that's why it's pink. And so the rings, of, and then there's some ejected gas that's being shot out at high speed in the upper right. And this is actually not a very large region. There's two kind of ringish structures. One of them is about 1400 light years across, and the very deep inner ring is only about 200 light years across, or 300 light years across. So really this very close by galaxy that's exhibiting extraordinary uh, uh, active galaxies in its uh, active galactic nuclei is pretty close by. So we're seeing that there's some really violent things happening in this galaxy because pretty much for the Cicinus galaxy, it's all about the core and it's almost nothing about the rest of it. So I invite you to go kind of hunt that down and I'll post the uh, image, uh, the link online. So here's a, and then there's another set. So Seiferts were one kind of active galaxy. The other one I alluded to at the beginning were once discovered with radio telescopes. These are called radio galaxies. And so we, <laughs> what we see is we've got a combination of a, of a NASA, NRAO, and a NSF image. What we have is we have a specific, the, the radio emission is in red, and it looks like that puffy, cloudy stuff. And then we have the wide field camera, for the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, and that was done by uh, Kiel et al. at the University of Alabama. But what we see is that the visual image of the wide of the Advanced Camera for Surveys wide field camera, uh, which is the which is the kind of optical sort of view, and then we have the red puffy glow, and that is the radio emission from this galaxy. So we're starting to get a hint that radio emission is very different than the rest of the emission of the galaxy. And even on the right-hand side of this image, we see some strong radio emission that looks like kind of a feathery sort of jutting sort of thing in the center that seems to be bright as a dot in the center and almost like a tadpole sort of fish thing shooting out. Well, it's not a fish. It's a jet. So something's happening there because those puffy clouds on either side are actually up and down or forward and back. And notice the lower right one has a little bit of a bright spot in the center. That might be where the jet, which looks like the fish on the right, is finally slowing down or hitting some other stuff. So let's see what, what we can find out about radio galaxies. So radio galaxies emit strongly in the radio part of the spectrum. So that's what we think. So electromagnetic radiation, mostly in radio. So they're very strong radio emitters. Uh, and they can have huge, huge, huge lobes of gas, which are totally invisible optically. And they go perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy, which is interesting. So you've got this, uh, this one is called Centaurus A. And Centaurus A is one of the brightest radio sources in the sky. And uh, well, on the left-hand side is the image that you that is taken uh, by uh, the upper the upper images is a, is a European Southern Observatory picture image. But the one on the right was taken by, by the, with, the, with the Parks Observatory as well as other observatories to construct a very large scale image of the, of the radio emission of Centaurus A. So what I did is I took the image of, on the left and overlaid it with the image on the right to show you how big the radio lobes are compared to the image of Centaurus A. Now, what's fascinating is on the right is that the smallest structure, the littlest, tiniest lumps are about 200 light years across. So it's, you know, these are, yeah, those are big things, but yet, it's pretty interesting that there is structure that's large enough to be like 200 layers across. And we see a, a little bar at the represent that says about 160,000 light years. So that's what the bar is worth. So this thing is huge. The extent of this thing is enormous, meaning it goes over almost a million light years across, which is big. Um, there's a lot, and because this is a radio image, the dots are not stars. Those are other active galactic nuclei, other radio sources from other massively distant galaxies that are being picked up by this particular telescope as it looks deep into the cosmos to make this incredible, incredible image. Centaurus A is the pinkish glow. That's the, the radio structure that comes from it that we do not see in visible light. And in fact, the radio energy is so incredibly large that each of the lobes is 20 million times the energy in just the radio sources as the sun puts out. 
And this is only happening at one wavelength. So 20 million times the energy of the sun's radius at specifically 1.4 gigahertz. So if you integrate it across all the radio emission, it's staggering amounts of energy that are being emitted. It's billions of times the mass of, of the luminosity of the sun if you integrate across all radio waves. All right, just for a very interesting contrast, uh, this is this was a fascinating way they did this. And, and uh, so the foreground telescopes are the telescopes that were taken, that were used to take the radio image uh, with the Australia Compact Array. And this is, uh, the image was done by Ileana Fain, Tim Cornwell, Ron Eakers. And then the Northern Lobe was was created with uh, by, by Morganti at Astron. And the Parks Observatory data is uh, by Jones. So the, and, Sh Amy Sh and Sean Amy at Cicero and CSIRO took the night sky image. So if you could see the Centaurus A in, uh, galaxy in the sky, that's where it would be. And that's what it would look like if you could see in radio emission. The radio sky is extraordinarily different than the optical sky. It would be a vastly different place. And so by comparison, we see the moon there in the sky. So a really interesting, fascinating appearance. Other famous radio galaxies, the most one of the most important ones is Cygnus A. Cygnus A is almost, a, it's like half a billion light years away. And what we see is that there's a central bright core, these long jet-like structures, and then these feathery lobes at either end. And the size of this, of the object in the sky, is only one by two arc minutes. But remember, an arc minute is, the, the moon is about 30 arc minutes across. So this is only, a, this would be, a, this image that you're looking at would be about the same size as one of the, one of the smaller craters on the moon, or one of the, one of the visible craters on the moon, through binoculars. So if you could see radio, teles radio emission in the sky, you would see this extraordinarily bright source in the sky uh, that would be that you would eventually with a large telescope if your eyes could see in radio uh, with with a, with a very large telescope anyway so there's a jet-like structure which is which seems to be collimated over extraordinary distances and at this distance this is almost a half a million light years or many half a million light years across it was discovered uh, in 1939 by Grote Weber at Grote Weber and in 1951 as a bright strong radio source is it actually one of the strongest and in 1951 along with Cassiopeia A and Pupus A were defined as radio stars uh, as people were looking at so people didn't know you know we first point radio telescopes in the sky you just say what's that well it's a bright point like object call it a radio star okay great they were identified with uh, with optical sources, and so they were called radio stars. Uh, Cygnus A is a radio galaxy, and the other two, Cassiopeia and Pupus A, are, are nebulae, with Cassiopeia A being that supernova run that we talked a while back about. Um, and in 1953, just a few years later, Jenison and Tiscupta showed it to be a double source with a radio emission, so everybody's saying, wow, this is neat, let's go look at it with radio telescopes. And all radio galaxies, especially this one, have a huge, huge, huge active galaxy nucleus in the core, and there is a supermassive black hole about almost two and a half billion times the mass of the sun. And the upper, the, that's the image in red, because with radio, you have to kind of give it levels. That was taken by the Very Large Array in the NRIO, National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And on the right-hand side, what I did is I found this in the digital, the digital sky survey at Space Telescope Science Institute, and made a pic and grabbed it by the 15 by 15 arc minutes to show what the region of the sky looks like in visible light. And this is the red image. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shrink it down and show you where it kind of appears on the sky. So that's roughly what it would look like if you could see it. It's I don't think the orientation's right. I think I got that wrong. But the point is, is that it's kind of big, it's really bright. The galaxy itself can be seen in visible light, but the lobes cannot be seen in visible light. They can only be seen in radio. And it's one of the strongest radio sources in the sky at a half a billion light years away. Another extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily bright one is the Hercules A radio galaxy. And it was taken, the pinkish glow was taken by the very large array at three different bands. And they mixed it together to form a red, green, blue, and made some good images. 
And then the optical is from the Hubble Space Telescope Wide Field Camera 3 and UVES. So this thing is almost 2 billion light years away, and it's on, centered on a supermassive elliptical galaxy. Um, and there's a hugely bright galaxy in there. It's a two and a half billion solar masses and much bigger than the one that's in the center of the Milky Way. And what we find is that it kind of doesn't look like much in visible light, as you can see in the lower left hand image. But it's also, but since it's the brightest radio emitting object in the constellation Hercules, it's kind of crazy that this thing is, you know, half a billion light, two billion light years away. And it's even at that distance, it's a mil, over a three, almost two million light years across from low, edge of lobe to edge of lobe. So something is making these jets. Something is making the jets. Something is keeping it collimated for almost a, a million light years, at least a half a million light years. And then the radio emission then gets deposited out there, and then it still glows in radio light. So the question then becomes, what exactly is making that radio emission and how does it stay in this jet-like format? And that's a big, 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 big puzzle. So there's the optical image of the visible image of, of Hercules A, and there is the Hubble, and then there is the VLA image overlaid on top of that. And this is a Hubble heritage image. Well, what exactly is it? So it's, it's supposed, because it's radio light, so it has to be very low energy radio light that there's a strong, strong, strong magnetic field. And that magnetic field is, uh, it is actually causing electrons to spiral around. And that's what an electron will do in a magnetic field. It'll, if it has any motion, it'll kind of start to go around the magnetic field lines. It'll form a curly cube. Now, if it's moving really, really fast, then what'll happen is it'll form a helix and it'll scoot around. And if it's traveling at almost the speed of light, it has a specific kind of spectrum. A single photon, a single electron, uh, will make a spectrum of light in radio light, like the hump that we see in the lower right inset, which is a single contribution from a single electron traveling at nearly the speed of light in a very strong magnetic field, or at least in any magnetic field. And some of the electrons are more energetic than others. And so as they travel along the magnetic field lines, each one of those electrons each emits one of those kind of humpy sort of spectra. So if you add up all the contribution from all of those individual electrons, you get what the red arrow is pointing to, which is that dashed yellow line, which kind of looks like the merging of all of those spectra. So you get what's, what's called a power law spectrum. And that power law spectrum looks completely different than, say, a black body spectrum like we saw coming from stars. There's no absorption lines in the synchrotron radiation. It's just this flat, flat, flat uh, feature. Well, we know about synchrotron radiation because of studies in, in, uh, in particle colliders as well as nuclear physics studies. So this, has been, this process is well understood, and it's interesting to be found in these radio galaxies. So here's another diagram to show it, and we see the electron zipping around in the magnetic field, and as it goes around and around and around, it emits light. And as it emits light, it loses energy and therefore goes a little bit slower. Now on the left-hand side, I kind of grabbed this other thing from Wikipedia to kind of try to show what I mean and why we think, why this is a special kind of spectrum. Now if the electron is spiraling slowly, meaning, you know, kind of fast for normal people, like it'd be going faster than a person can go, but if it's kind of spinning slowly, not at nearly the speed of light, the emission that an electron would make because it is accelerating, because it's going in a circle, as it goes in a circle in a magnetic field, it will emit light and it will lose energy. And that light emission pattern is shown in that kind of donuty sort of bagel thing that we see. And that's the way the light spreads out from the electron as it slowly goes around, in, if it's moving slowly and moving in electric field, or in a magnetic field. But now if you take the same magnetic field and accelerate the electron up to nearly the speed of light, you get what are called relativistic beaming effects, where all of the light gets beamed in one direction. So the direction that the, the electron is going. So that chain, that, that shape of the emission as well it dictates how the spectrum will look. And that's what we see and that helps to 
this understanding of how it works and how the emission actually works with the light gives us an understanding of how we might get to the upper right hand sort of individual electron thing. But this is called relativistic beaming. And as the electron spins faster and faster around, it actually it goes very fast and loses just the tiniest amount of energy because it's radio light. It's got a huge amount of energy on its own, but it emits that light and gets lower and lower energy. But as they all emit in this particular way, according to this model, you get the sum of all the contributions. And that model is also borne out by looking at nuclear physics labs. So given that that's how these things kind of make their emission, let's look at some of the zoo of crazy things that we see out there. In the nearby uh, Virgo cluster, the galaxy M87, which is an enormous, enormous, supermassive giant elliptical in the Virgo cluster of galaxies, about 600,000, uh, about 60 mil 70 million light years away, roughly. And what we see is that there's these enormous, the lower left-hand image is a, an optical light image, but on the right-hand side is a, vis is, a, is a radio image of the same galaxy. So this is a very strange thing that they're completely different. There's these puffy things around it. There's these weird shapes. I don't know exactly how they superimpose, but the, well, the, stru the structure on the right is much, much larger than the Milky Way. At 200,000 light years across, this thing is easily, the green puffy thing, is easily twice as large as the entire Milky Way galaxy. But yet there's really bright core compact regions, and then you see something that looks really jet-like, that's pushing stuff out. You can almost imagine that there's this jet, jet of material being thrown out in two directions, one of them towards us and one of them away from us. Now, here's a VLA study, a uh, very large array uh, by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory done by Fraser Owen and John Batia at NRAO. Um, and so we see that the VLA, looking at 20 centimeter radiation, shows that large jet-like structure in the center. So we see the big, big, big map. Now we zoom in with the 20 centimeter VLA, we see a very tiny jet-like feature. And then the right-hand side is a jet and the left-hand side, not so much. And then we zoom in closer and tighter with the, um, with the VLA at two centimeters. And we see that the jet has deeper resolution. It has knots and baubles and beads type of things. And then zoom in even tighter with seven millimeter wavelength radiation of the VLA. And we can see almost the central core get even tighter and tighter. We can go, we can get as tight and as small as we want, and you still get smaller and smaller radiation until you get to this amazing, amazing imagery where you now have to go to the bottom two, which are VLBI, which is very large baseline interferometry, which is not just the VLA telescope, but numerous other teles radio telescopes across the United States and across the world all combining their data together to get higher resolution of that interior structure. The VLA is only so big, so the resolution gets poorer as you zoom in. But if you, you integrate tel a bunch of radio telescopes together, with such as the VLBI, uh, then you can then you get uh, then you get much higher resolution. But notice as you zoom in 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 in, you still maintain a compact tiny source. So. The lower left-hand image shows something that's only a quarter of a light year across. What's a quarter, like two-tenths of a light year? Two-tenths of a light year is a couple of light months, right? Or even one light month. One light month is 30 light days. 30 light days is, wow, that's, a, that's pretty that is, remember the size that the Voyager has gone is almost a light day. So the image that you're looking at across, if you look at an individual pixel, a couple of pixels across this thing is what the Voyager has traveled since it was launched in 1977. So a few pixels on this lower left-hand image is the distance Voyager has gone from Earth. So this is a really tiny, compact, extraordinarily bright object deep down in the core of M87 in the VLBA, very long baseline array, showing the inner tenth of a light year. Remember, a tenth of a light year is on that order. So we're looking at, at objects or, or resolution of a bright, compact radio source that is not that much bigger in terms of that bar. So that bar is, is one, it's like one tenth of that bar is what the Voyager has traveled since its launch.
Um, this is to just try to show you the size scale that we're looking at something that can be easily measured in terms of solar system size scales. And there it is with the Hubble image showing the jet in visible, visible light. So there's something going on in radio, there's something going on there, and we describe that the radio emission comes from synchrotron radiation that's coming from the spiraling of electrons in a strong magnetic field. Now you can get visible light and you can get X-ray radiation from that as well, and that's what we're seeing here in this jet coming from the center of M87. And there we see M87 using the Hubble Space Telescope done by uh, Jay Madrid at McMaster University showing actual changes in the visible light of that bright knot in the center of the in the center of the galaxy of M87. And just for enjoyment to get you an idea of where the heck this thing is, the lower left is the is M87, the giant supergiant massive elliptical galaxy. It's in the Virgo cluster and we're seeing a cluster of galaxies here. And this was taken by Chris Mijos and the colleagues at, Brunel, at the Brunel Schmidt telescope. Uh, and this was done with the European Southern Observatory. And they took out all the foreground stars, and that's why they've got those spots of bright. Because, you know, we just want to deal with the stuff that's actually the galaxies and not look at the stuff necessarily and not be distracted by things that are in the foreground in the Milky Way. Another thing we can remember that with active galactic nuclei is they're really luminous, extraordinarily luminous over all wavelengths. And on the left again, we go back to our favorite, which is a Centaurus A, which is one of the most interesting, which is one of it's a favorite target for active galactic nuclei studies. And on the left, we see a visible light image taken by Sarah Tololo at the IAO in Chile, uh, the Blanco 4 meter. But on the right-hand side was taken by the Spitzer Infrared Space Telescope or run by NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratories. And so we have emission from that, from thermal emission, from at, which is we have dust and gas and thermal emission. But you would also still see dusty, gassy distortions. You know, it's extremely bright in the center. And we also see that there's some sort of jet-like structure coming above and below. So there's a, there are extreme activity in infrared, too. And if we look in ultraviolet, and this comes from the Galax mission, uh, and if there are some jets coming off of that, and maybe even the jets that are coming off of that indicate star formation that's happening deep in those jets as a result of, of collisional activity. That's one possibility, but perhaps it's just a synchrotron radiation again. But this is ultraviolet light with the bluish whitish light being higher energy ultraviolet and the yellowish light being lower energy ultraviolet. And so ultraviolet is interesting because you get these kind of circly structures and that's because of the nature of the detector itself. Not because they're bigger objects. No, we're looking into those yellow spots typically are stars in our in our galaxy. All right, but you also see there's a density around them. So that indicates there's some activity happening around Centaurus A. Notice there's a cluster of those light yellow dots. So there's something happening as the two galaxies are colliding and making hot stars. Again, we can look at the at Centaurus A and we see in X-ray light, this is from the Chandra X-ray Observatory from, uh, from, from, uh, from one of their earlier studies, and we can see that the jet is formed from the, from, uh, from the from various processes and X-rays, and we see the bubbles that also that are visible in radio light are also visible in X-rays. So Centaurus A has a completely different appearance in X-ray, and we see an extraordinarily luminous, hot object in the center. And the bluer the light in this image, the more energetic the X-rays we're looking at. So how do we get X-rays out of this? Well. One way is remember that there's electrons spiraling around at nearly the speed of light, and they're emitting radio light. What can happen is the radio light is a low energy photon. The electrons are moving really fast, and so they can collide with the photons and give some of their energy to the photon and bump it up to an X ray. So the strong magnetic fields keep the electrons flying. Something's accelerating the electrons to nearly the speed of light and keeping them entrained inside of these, inside of these jets. And so we get X-ray emission from the radio light that they emit. So not only do they emit a radio light, they then billiard ball some of the light to get up to X-ray emission. And we call that inverse Compton scattering. So it kicks them up into high energy as they interact and gives them more energy. And that's where those jets appear. That's what most of this emission that you see comes from. So here's a series of images, a composite of radio imaging, X-ray imaging, and optical imaging from Chandra, VLA, and the Hubble Space Telescope, as well as others, 
to put it all together to show you what an uh, what an active galaxy in the nearby solar neighborhood is like. We're not solar. We're talking about 14 million light years away. We've alluded to the idea that these things are bright at every wavelength, and the active galaxies are. So a normal galaxy seems to be usually a collection of stars and gas and dust. So the lower curve shows a typical normal galaxy, which would have some, a dim radio, infrared, invisible, but it's mostly an addition of a whole bunch of stars together. And we're kind of smoothing things out to make it easier to understand, but that's the basic idea. But in an active galaxy, there's enormous radio emission, there's enormous infrared emission, there's enormous visible light, and a much, much greater X-ray emission than in a normal galaxy. Normal galaxies don't tend to glow in X-rays. So the radiation from these galaxies is what we call non-stellar meaning it doesn't come from stars. Just like I described, we have electrons zipping around, making radio, light, and then they kick it up to x-rays. So this is not a thermal process that happens in stars. This is happening in magnetic fields as things are moving at nearly the speed of light. And something's actually accelerating these electrons and protons, or mostly electrons, seems to be the dominant model to actually make all this light, is, is with high-speed electrons. So something's happening deep in the galactic center to actually do that. So just to kind of really show a really high resolution spectrum. So we go way back to one of the, to Seifert's original paper, and this is by Brown and Moustakis again. And this is from uh, June of 2014, where they took a large, large, large number of data and made what's called a spectral energy dent uh, distribution or SED, the entire spectrum of the galaxy from very, very deep in the ultraviolet all the way to very long infrared. And so the visible light wavelengths are only in between about, say, 4,000 and 0.4 and 0.7 on this graph uh, at the short end of the wavelength in microns. But then everything to the right is in infrared and everything to the left is, is ultraviolet, uh, is, out into the, is out of the ultraviolet. We don't go to the x-rays in this particular image. That's unfortunate. But we're seeing that this is very different than most normal galaxies because of the excess brightness in infrared, as well as the enormously bright hydrogen emission lines, which you can see in emission here. Now we're going to talk about the nature of the rapid variations. Seifert galaxies vary really rapidly, and this is kind of a schematic diagram by which they, well, what do we mean? They got to get bright and dim by two or three or five times over the course of a few days or a couple of years, and they can actually be measured year to year, day to day, and so, month to month, and sometimes even day to day that they have their time variations. So what do we mean by that? This was a study done uh, by Aravalo et al. And they published in monthly notices in 2009. And this is an active galaxy, active galactic nucleus, the NGC 3783. And they took three different uh, sets of measurements, one in X-ray and one in Johnson B filter and Johnson V filter over a number of days. And as we can see, there are lots of variations. And this is varying. Uh, just the nucleus is varying in brightness in X-ray quite rapidly as well as in the Johnson B, which is a visual filter, the blue end of the spectrum, and Johnson V, which is smack in the middle of the optical. Then we actually zoom in on a very short period of time when they actually, um, when, they, when they were able to take measurements up to three times a day, especially for the X-ray data, and they found that there's very high variability for the B and V, spec, uh, B and v photometry of this, just the nucleus of this galaxy. So this is a relatively nearby one, or else you wouldn't be able to get B and V photometry for it of this of this quality. But you can see that the X-ray variability can vary up to a factor of two over the course of literally hours, and the factor and the and then the amount of that can come with a B and V in terms of well the, the the word flux means how much energy you're getting per second into this into your tiny little detector, meaning ergs is a measure of energy per second per square centimeter. So if you had a square centimeter detector, you would get this many ergs per second. And an erg is a measurement of energy, just like a joule. So it's just in CGS units rather than an SI. Okay, so we can see that there's extraordinary variability on the order of hours. Next, we find the brightest radio sources in the sky are called quasars, or quasi-stellar radio sources. And it wasn't enough to find radio galaxies, and they found extraordinary bright point-like sources of radio emission. And then when they looked at the photographs, they found there was a really fuzzy, tiny, fuzzy little star-like object that seemed to be like a star. And there's, and then when you look at the actual spectrum of a 
of one of these things, you find wild, broad emission lines that nobody knew really what they were at the time. And so they said, okay, it kind of looks like a star. Um, it's got a lot of radio. So it's a quasi-stellar radio source or quasar, quasi-stellar radio source. So that's where the word quasar was neologisms about. And one of the first bright ones was 3C273. It's one of the nearest uh, quasars in the sky. It's about a billion light years away. And night, so to give a little history about it, um, 1963, Martin Schmidt then looked at 3C273 and said, well, what the heck with this? He recognized that, unlike everybody else, he, uh, and there was a really huge debate about this at the time, and it took a long time for people to be convinced, is that he recognized that if you simply took the normal absorption lines in quasars, or normal emission lines in quasars, and simply, yeah, if, and then simply redshifted them all the way really deep, what do you get? Well, you get the, if you take normal emission lines or normal absorption lines and redshift them massively, then you get this thing that's like, oh, it fits perfectly. It's just highly redshifted. But remember, Hubble found that redshift means the greater the redshift, the more, uh, the more distant it is. And so the Hubble relationship by 1963 was well established. So nobody wanted to believe at 1963 that these things were that far, because if they were that far and that bright, that meant they were insanely luminous. If they were at extraordinary distance, Martin Schmidt said, they're really luminous. And he was correct. And that is true. And so here's the typical spectrum for 3C273. And we have a lab comparison by spectrum. So let's actually kind of go through what we really mean. 3C273 has bright emission lines in hydrogen. And so this is a sample wavelength thing, and we, I, put, I overlay the uh, optical spectrum on it. And know that we have we, the, the hydrogen alpha, which is that bright pink line that we see, that gives us the pretty pink of like the, the Orion Nebula or the Triffin Nebula or something like that. That's been pushed all the way over into the deep red at nearly 7,600 7, angstroms. And so it went from 6563 all the way to 7400. So that's a big shift. So how big a shift is it? Then we can then determine the redshift this way. We know it was observed at 760 nanometers or 7,600 angstroms. But we know that if it was hydrogen, it was emitted at 6,562 6, angstroms or 656 nanometers. So you just calculate the redshift. We said sit and, and the following way, and we find it's a redshift of 0.158, which is an enormous redshift which implies an enormous recession velocity, which implies an enormous distance. Quasars are discovered. There's over a quarter million quasars that are really known. There are many, many, many quasars that are known, and most of them come from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And this is uh, from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey release, data release 12. And we can see this particular one has a similar redshift to 3C273 of 0.1954. And then the tall right emission line is hydrogen alpha. So we have all sorts of things that are emission lines in there. Now, if we then go back and look at, say, let's take a quasar spectrum and put it in the rest frame and so forth like that. What the really, what's the real emission wavelength? Not what we see it to be, but what we what it would be at emission. So we take the we eliminate the redshift out of the picture, and what do we get? And this is called a composite quasar spectrum. It was done by Vandenberg in 2001. And what we see is that there's enormous, enormous ultraviolet emission at the Lyman alpha line. That's for hydrogen. That's the Lyman alpha. Then there's carbon, uh, ionized carbon and magnesium ionized, as well as ionized oxygen lines and hydrogen as well. It's an extraordinary emission too. So we've got this amazing, strange sort of uh, broad, broad emission lines, especially the Lyman alpha line, which is insanely broad, much broader than anything else in the sky. And it has kind of a semi-stellar sort of appearance because look at that shape. It's almost like a star, but there's something weird about that on the left-hand side. And here's this, the total wavelength spectrum across all wavelengths for 3C273. And the circles are the actual data points. Maybe there's some bars that go up and down to show you how well it's known. Um, but the, on the far right-hand side are extraordinarily energetic photons, like X-rays and gamma rays. And on the far left-hand side are extraordinarily long wavelength photons, like radio. But on that, there's so there's three kind of humps, and there's like an additional sort of hump in the middle, too. But let's actually look at the three tall humps 
the one that looks kind of like in the middle, the middle hump that looks roundish, that's from thermal emission or the sum of all the stars in the galaxy surrounding 3C273. And so that's what the data points there show. On the left-hand side is emission from radio emission due to synchrotron radiation, and that's the long wavelength stuff. On the right-hand side is X-ray and gamma ray emission that comes from synchro that comes from the inverse Compton scattering process that I described before. And so there's an enormous jet. There's three separate processes that give dominant radiation. So the idea that this kind of models the spectrum really well, actually, when you combine it together. And the top line is just kind of the best fit overlay on top of the three underneath curves. And the other one down below is another contribution, which I forget exactly what it does. I think that might be dust emission. It's probably more like dust emission because of it kind of kind of goes up and then drops off rather rapidly. Therefore, quasars are the most luminous objects in the universe. They can have up to something that's a hundred, that's a hundred, a hundred trillion times the luminosity of the sun. A hundred trillion times the luminosity of the sun. Not a billion, but a hundred trillion. Remember, the luminosity of the, sun, of the Milky Way is about 10 to, is about 100 billion, or 10, uh, 10 to 9, 10 to 10, 10 to the 11th solar luminosities. So this one object can have a thousand times the luminosity of the entire Milky Way, and most of the light from this is coming from the center of the object. This is 3273, it's still pretty near, but its luminosity as a point-like object all comes from the central region, just like we saw in M87's study of the VLA. If we then look at other quasars, they, they actually thought that they were galaxies for a while and couldn't resolve them, so it took a long time for people to actually resolve the surrounding galaxy because quasars are pretty freaking bright. So they're extraordinarily bright objects. And finally, this one was an image that was released in 1994 using the Hubble Space Telescope. There were other, there were other images that showed some pretty good observations uh, from ground-based things that were extraordinarily good studies of this exact thing. But then the Hubble Space Telescope confirmed what looks like a bar-like structure in the center of it all, surrounded by what looked like a spiral arms. So we have that there's a host galaxy with an extraordinarily bright object in the center. And this must be a colliding galaxy. And the, the, something what's happening is, is that the bright, the quasar object is the bright central core. Quasars also have radio lobes. And this is another one. This is a quasar 3C175 taken with the VLA at six centimeters, 1996. Um, and I provide the link there so you can go hunt it down. And yeah, you can see that quasars themselves, in addition to being bright, bright, bright luminous sources, are also staggeringly luminous radio sources as well. So to kind of sum it up, we, we discussed in a previous lecture the luminosity of galaxies, and we found that irregulars are kind of the little bitty guys, and then elliptic, and then spirals are lots of places where star factories are being done, and they're more massive. So if they're more massive, they have more, uh, more gas and dust, so they can be more luminous. However, ellipticals tend to be the collision train wrecks where things kind of mash together, and they can be little tiny things or super massive uh, ellipticals like M87. But quasars top them all. They are the most luminous objects in the universe, and, and they can be up to uh, 10 to the 14th times the luminosity of the sun, which is a thousand times more luminous than the Milky Way. It's as though the a thousand Milky Way galaxies are compressed inside an area that we'll find inside a volume that's smaller than the solar system. So this is really catastrophically bizarre something a thousand times more luminous than the entire Milky Way seems to be coming from a little volume that could fit inside the solar system. Just in rough schematics, normal galaxies just have gas and dust and they got a nucleus and such forth. And, you know, it's kind of pretty and such forth. But then we look at this edge on views, of course. If it's got an active galactic nucleus, then the center is really, really bright. And it's got bright, broad emission lines. It's probably formed by something like we call a supermassive black hole, which we'll justify next time. But a quasar is so insanely bright, it drowns out that thing. It's not that, that, that the disk doesn't is, exist. It's that it's the contrast is so great that you can't see the disk. It's not that it doesn't exist. It's that it's too bright to see it. So it's like, hey, hey, stare at this light. Uh, stare at my flashlight. Oh, I can't stare at your flashlight. It's too bright. It's exactly the point. You can't see this stuff on the flashlight.
So this is the kinds of activity comparisons that we see between galaxies. So we're going to look next time at exactly what drives these galaxies, what makes this active galactic nucleus. And that's a really fascinating study that we alluded to with the, uh, many lectures ago. We talked about the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Now we're going to see that effect in full focus next time when we talk about the central engines of supermassive black holes. See you soon. Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. This time we're rounding out our study of the nature of galaxies and quasars and active galaxies by seeing how active galaxies and quasars form and evolve. So what is the central engine of an active galaxy? Active galactic, galactic nuclei all have one of the same properties. They have very similar properties. One of them is that they're extraordinarily luminous objects. They emit huge amounts of non-stellar energy, uh, meaning the energy source doesn't come from stars. The energy output is extremely variable, and that means it's very small wherever it's happening. And there are jets and other signs of some sort of explosive activity. And around the central engine of an active galaxy, we find broad emission lines with them indicating there's rapid rotation. All right, so what exactly powers an active galactic nucleus? And again, these things have to be explained. The luminosities are on the order of billions to trillions of times, which is 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 12th, solar luminosities. They emit wavelengths all the way from radio all the way to gamma rays. They're extremely compact because the visible light can vary on the order of time scales of a few days. And x-rays uh, can vary on the time scales of hours. So this is really interesting how quickly they can vary in their sizes. So something's got to be small and really bright. So to explain what we see, we use a black hole. The energy source of active galaxies is, can be usually explained by having uh, accretion of matter onto a supermassive black hole. And by supermassive, we mean a million to a billion times the mass of the sun, which would equate to a Schwarzschild radius of about one-tenth of one-hundredth of NAU, up to 10 times an 10 astronomical units meaning the most massive black holes inside of, gal inside of active galactic nuclei, about a billion solar masses, would have a diameter that's larger than the orbit of Saturn around the sun. So these would be extraordinarily huge black holes. As material falls into it, it releases gravitational energy and that settles into an enormous accretion disk around the black hole. And when it does so, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and emits light through friction and eventually loses that light, and that light leaves uh, the system, and they, that hot inner part close, especially in x-rays, right as it's falling into the inner region of the black hole. So just about one or two solar radi one or two um, Schwarzschild radii, it falls directly in. So that's the leading theory uh, about what powers a galactic nucleus, is that, and also it, when it falls in, the accretion disk spins round and round and round, heating up as it gets closer and closer. And there's magnetic fields that are probably that probably appear as part of this disk of material, because most of it, if it's going to be hot enough to emit X-rays, will be ionized and strongly magnetized. And that magnetic field will get wrapped around and create a, a toroidal magnetic field that can, can that can contain material that goes out in a jet. But remember, the black hole itself is extremely small with respect to the jet. And a picture like this is a very good image of what we might see as a jet-like material. So the disk would be surrounding it as material falls in. And as it gets closer and closer, it gets hotter and hotter by friction. And that magnetic field it gets stronger and stronger. And you see a jet coming out of the center of it.
And so this is the typical picture we see for a supermassive black hole. Because even still, something the size of 10 astronomical units is very small compared to a light year, which is very small compared to a parsec. So still, even supermassive black holes are extremely tiny objects. And this disk that we see here would be many hundreds of astronomical units or thousands of astronomical units around. So the central engine can be billions of solar masses, and material that falls in can radiate up to 20% of its mass in a very weird way of saying. It's not like it's radiating away its mass. It's that the binding energy of the black hole, uh, the, as material falls into the black hole, the energy that's released is binding energy for the black hole. And so the black hole itself has less mass than the material that falls into it, and some of that gets radiated away. If you were to take the material that's there and spread it back out, it would gain that mass. So it's a, it's a sense of saying, where do you get that energy from? And the energy happens to be as a result of falling into a gravitational field. Black holes are extremely efficient at transforming matter into energy. Up to 20% of the rest mass of the art particles are converted into light. Uh, and then about that means that roughly a solar mass per year of matter can, is needed to power the brightest of the active galaxies. And they get their fuel from surrounding gas and stars, as we saw in that previous image. So you get this rapidly, a rapidly spinning black hole acts like this enormous particle accelerator. And that creates these incredibly large jets that are seen in, act, in active galactic nuclei that are very bright in radio sources. So that gives us kind of our model for active galactic nuclei. You have three different types. You have a normal galaxy with a kind of a bright core that might have a supermassive black hole in the core, but it's not really doing anything. A galaxy that has an active galactic nucleus has material that's falling into the supermassive black hole. But then we've got a third thing, the quasars, which are very strong active galactic nuclei that they're so incredibly powerful that they actually overwhelm the light of the surrounding galaxy. And those are the quasars. Quasars. So let's look at a little bit closer towards them and see the observational evidence for all of these things that lead us to think that there's actually a supermassive black hole down in the center. If we look at this particular one, this is a, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of NGC 4261, we see a dual image. The Hubble Space Telescope is the inset on the right-hand side, but it's also inset with, protect, with respect to a visual light image and a ground base, as well as the radio observation of radio lobes. So let, we're going to piece apart each one of these things. First of all, this is an elliptical galaxy, as you can see in the left-hand side image. It's a, it, this thing's about 100 million light years away. And so the diameter across this thing is approximately 88,000 light years or about 100,000 light, let's just call it about 100,000 light years long lobes. And it's part of another, a super part of a galaxy group. Now this particular black hole is roughly 400 million solar masses. And there's a, the disk on the right hand side in the Hubble image shows something that's about 800 light years wide. So that's what that disk is, that's material that's falling into it. The galaxy itself is only about six, on the left-hand side, the, the whitish galaxy is about 60,000 light years across. But the jets go each about 88,000 uh, light years along the length of each of these jets. So you've got radio emission from the jets. You've got stellar emission on the left-hand side. The radio emission is in yellow on the left-hand side. The inset is an incredibly detailed, tiny image of just the core, the inner 400 light years or so. So the disk itself is about 100 light years across. And you can see that there's some extraordinarily bright emission happening inside the center of that disk and where that lands in there, even still that tiny dot that's there, the black hole itself would, would still not be visible because the material because it's much smaller than that dot that you see in the center. However, as material falls in, it gets entrained inside of the supermassive black hole, and that is the source of the jets that you see on the left-hand side. All right, so another more more the more local uh, black hole, uh, which is, this one's about 100 million light years away, but something a little bit closer, about 70 million light years away, is the, ga is the supermassive uh, elliptical galaxy M87 in the Virgo cluster. Now this has, a, uh, this is the core of M87, and if we look at the 
this is a gaseous, so there's a huge amount of gas that's orbiting at a very high speeds. And so if you take spectra of the gases that are orbiting it, you get two different versions of it. There, on the left-hand side in the image, the spectra is in red, and it shows it's receding away, therefore it's a longer wavelength. And the right-hand side shows that it's rushing towards us, or it's blue shifted. So this is hydrogen gas as it's falling into it. And the light, is, the light is either blue shifted or red shifted strongly, depending on where we take our measurement of our spectrum. So there, and by looking at that, it tells us how fast things are. If we get a, we know the distance to M87, so we can know the size scale of this object because we know the angular size scale, we know the distance, so we can get the dis, the physical distance between those two little circles, and that shows us by Kepler's laws that the. Uh, by Newton's version of Kepler's laws, that the mass of the black hole inside of there is between, say, four and six billion solar masses, which is one of the largest supermassive black holes there in, that is known. And that rotating disk is roughly perpendicular to a known jet of material. And these, in order to have the lines separated out from, as we see from this Hubble Space Telescope's image with the faint, with the faint object spectrograph, is that the disk as itself is rotating at about a thousand kilometers per second, and that's just under one percent the speed of light. So this is sp and it spans about a quarter, about a third of a light year, about uh, almost a quarter, almost a half a light year. So it's going extraordinarily fast around in this massive wind. So the and then the in order to power what we see, the gas is accreting on top of the black hole at roughly one solar mass every ten years or 90 Earth masses every day. So this supermassive black hole would swallow 90 Earths a day in order to show the emission that we see here. So this is the jet that's emanating out of the, out of the M87. You can see the jet in the inset, and there's the Hubble image that we see from it. So we have an inner region and then a jet coming out of it. Uh, and that jet is, uh, the, the, uh, the jet itself is incredibly large. Uh, and there's probably, the, so the, 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 the jet is probably occurring at about seven parsecs away. That's where we see the jet occurring. But the displacement is not really real. It has to be happening right there. But the visible portion of the jet starts happening there. So it doesn't actually start to emit light until it's far away that we can see. But the base of itself, at the base of the jet, right down near the black supermassive black hole, the base has to have a diameter of about five times the, Sch the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole, and that supermassive black hole is powering it there. You can also take a spectrum of that jet and just the jet and then learn that it's polarized. And if it's polarized, then there must be a strong magnetic field. So you have relativistic, meaning things going nearly the speed of light, in a strong magnetic field in order to polarize the electron in order to polarize the light. What's amazing about this particular jet is that the total energy in the electrons that must be in this jet in order to make this is approximately 10 to the 13th times the energy produced by the entire Milky Way from all the stars in the Milky Way. 10 trillion times the Milky Way's uh, emission in order to get the amount of energy found in this jet, which is a staggering amount of, of, of of energy, all coming from there. So the center of this thing is brighter than all the Milky Way, all the energy in these in these electrons, which looks very wispy, but it's not. The energy is extraordinary, and the and the jets themselves extend up to hundreds of thousands of light years. So what can we see that's doing this? That's creating the energy content of a whole of trillions of Milky Way galaxies inside of this kind of thing. Well. We can see that there's different ways of viewing and uh, active galactic nuclei. If you look at it from down above, you see that you're going to see along the jets, and you're going to see very strong X and gamma ray emission. And that's what you see if you're looking from above down. You'll see a jet coming towards you with lots of X rays and gamma rays. Or if you look at it from the side, you'll just see the jets and a strong, strong, strong infrared emission because you're not going to be able to see the central X-ray, gamma-ray emitting area. But you will see the jets, and you'll see some strong infrared because of the material that's in the disk itself. So there's, and the, um, so we get broadband radiation, meaning lots and lots of different X-rays from, from radio all the way to X-rays. 
But if you only see the jets and only mostly infrared, then you're looking along the edge of it. So one engine can provide lots of different ways of seeing active galactic nuclei. And that's another way of looking at these particular objects, because some of them are radio lobes and some of them are radio cores. But if you see, looking down the radio lobe, you can see like, if you see like just a, a, an active galactic nucleus that's just a blob of radio emission, then you're looking straight down the lobe. You know, straight down the jet. But if you see it from the side, then you can see both the jets and the lobes, and that explains the appearances that we see for active galactic nuclei that we saw in the previous lecture. All right, so what does it look like close up to one of these things? Well, if you saw it, then you'd see the, um, a huge amount of material falling in, and as it fell in, the things would be uh, taken away in the jets, and if, we're, if we ride along with the jet, as it goes out at many times the speed of light, we would then see some enormous, enormous emission from the side. So there's material that's falling into the supermassive black hole, and a huge magnetic field creates, uh, creates a jet-like structure, and material comes out of that jet-like structure. And if you look down the jet, you see huge amounts of, of X-ray and gamma rays. And the X-rays themselves are being produced deep towards the core, and that's what we get to see is the jets from the side. All right, so if we then, here's kind of the model. Uh, is a is a, a accretion disk around the supermassive black hole. Remember, the supermassive black hole is pretty small. It can be on the order of an astronomical unit or a few, or just like a tenth of an astronomical unit up to 10 astronomical units. So the diameter of where all the action is is very small compared to the rest of the galaxy, which would be tens or hundreds of thousands of light years across. So the supermassive black hole and all the energy that's coming from it is is coming from an extraordinarily small area. And if there's very small variability, then every, that's, what, that's what explains it, because the size scales can be vary on the, on, this, on the length of a day or two, and that's the, roughly the size scale of roughly 10 to 40 or uh, astronomical units. So if it's going to be coherently changing, then the entire disk must change. And if the disk is on the order of tens or so astronomical units, that's what we see. Now, the X-ray emission comes from even tighter in, which then, if it can vary on the order of a few hours, which is which is what we would see if it's on the order of a couple of light, a couple of uh, couple of astronomical units. So, X-ray emission comes from deep in the center, and coherent changes uh, come from the entire disk itself. And this one model then can take care of all of the known variability of all active galactic nuclei. And as an example, we can look at Centaurus A. It's one of the most, it's one of the nearest uh, nearest galaxies to us. It's only about 10 or roughly 15 million light years away. It's a close radio galaxy, and it's also the fifth brightest galaxy in the sky. So there's lots of observers in the southern hemisphere that get a chance of that. So the supermassive black hole down in the center of Centaurus A is about 55 million solar masses, not as big as M87, uh, 70 million light years away. And those jets that are occurring out of it uh, those are responsible, and the, the, the supermassive black hole emits a huge amounts of relativistic jets, and they create X-rays, which you see in purple, as well as radio light, which you see kind of in the glow, in the kind of a background glow. Now, you can also see uh, if you uh, take radio observations over a few decades or so, a decade or two, you can see that things are actually moving, and the movement inside of the material in these jets is about half the speed of light. And as they move, the jet collides with gases in the surrounding medium and creates very high energy particles, which then decay and form light. So the X-ray jets of Centaurus A are thousands of light years long, and the radio jets uh, that are also visible in other wavelengths can be up to a million light years long. So we're only looking at the X-ray jets, but if we could see the radio portion of this thing, it would stretch over a million light years long. It'd be much, much, much larger than the full moon. It'd be quite interesting in the sky. So we, we, this is also thought to be, of course, a supermassive black hole down in the center with about 55 uh, so million solar masses. And here's another view of that. There's the central galactic, active galactic nucleus down in the core, and the jet which is coming out to the side. These jets are going about half, half the speed of light, extending for tens of thousands of light years, or thousands of light years long. That's how long that jet is. And there's even the faintest hint of a counter jet. So that's kind of what we would expect in these things, is there'd be two jets, one above the disk and one below. 
in the center of Centaurus A. And so we see there's the, the galaxy emitting all of that light. And supermassive black holes and their active galactic nuclei do the trick. All right, so here's another example of an active galactic nucleus. Uh, and so this active galaxy has a supermassive black hole in the center, creating all the light. So let's see how the X-ray radiation is occurring specifically in that. So if you have a strong magnetic field, then what happens is, is the, you, can, you can then have the electrons spinning very, very, very fast inside of this magnetic field. And where the X-ray emission comes in these jets is that as the electron spins and it approaches a proton, because it's going nearly the speed of light, so as it's going nearly the speed of light, it will spin by a proton, and as it does so, feels the pull of the proton while it's moving in the magnetic field, and it loses a little bit of energy. And as it loses some energy, it loses it in the form of light, called an X-ray. So this is called breaking radiation or Brumstrahlung radiation. And so the, that's where the X-ray emission comes in these jets as the protons and electrons interact along the magnetic field, and then the X-rays then get emitted as the electron slows down as a result of getting close to the proton inside the magnetic field. And so that's where we get that, and it's called synchrotron radiation. And synchrotron radiation is a result of movement of the electron inside of a strong magnetic field. The X-rays come from the breaking radiation, but then the, uh, the, the, uh, the, that's a non-thermal form of radiation, as well as what you see from the, from the, from the, the radio emission. The radio emission is from synchrotron radiation, just from the, pro the electrons themselves losing a little bit of energy as they spiral around the magnetic fields. Occasionally they get close to a proton and do the breaking radiation to emit x-rays as well. So therefore when we look at an active galactic nucleus we should expect a lot of radio emission, a lot of x-ray emission, and not as much thermal emission. And that's what's being described by the little thing, by the little uh, the sketchy graph on the right, is that if it were due to thermal radiation, meaning hot something, then you'd expect kind of a bump like you see there. However, you don't see that. You see a roughly flat emission across m much of the spectrum, and then you get lots of radio emission, and then enough, and also some X-ray emission as well from synchrotron radiation. And to, just to highlight that, a nearby quasar, 3C273, which is about a billion light years away, a couple billion, a billion light years away or so, has three major components and the center hump right around 10 to the minus 6 electron volts. That's the thermal emission from the galaxy itself. And at higher energies on the right, that's X-ray emission due to Bremsstrahlung or breaking radiation I talked about. That's what that, that jagged pointy thing region on the right is due to. And on the left is radio emission due to synchrotron radiation. So notice that both the radio emission, which is synchrotron, and the X-ray emission, which is breaking radiation, have roughly the same kind of shapes to their curves, but they contribute differently. One contributes at high energy on the right, and that's what the dots are. Those dots are the actual measurements of the, of the X-ray radiation. And on the left side, where that peak is on the left, that's the radio emission due to synchrotron radiation. So you have thermal emission from the stars and starlight, but the vast majority of the energy actually comes from in the form of X-rays and radio. And almost li very little of it comes from visible light, which is the middle little trying to, trying to be there sort of hump that's in the middle. But the vast majority of the energy comes from those other regions. And that's what, and all of that energy from either side of it comes from the supermassive black hole in the center. So we've got this massive, uh, this soup, this jet, things are falling in, creating huge amounts of energy, and it's, this, it spirals and falls into the central black hole. The black hole heats it, at, well, the, the energy that it's released by getting closer and closer and closer through friction. The friction then heats the gases up to, up to uh, millions of degrees to form X-ray light that we see if we're looking down the top of the jet. And if we can see the jet, uh, then the jet is giving us uh, two different forms of light, one in X-rays as the electrons spiral in the magnetic field and interact with protons, and then there's also radio light from the synchrotron radiation as the electrons themselves just lose a little bit of energy as they go nearly the speed of light along the, around the, as they spiral along the magnetic fields. So they get launched uh, from very close inside of the black hole, and then they spiral along those magnetic field lines constrained in the jet.
So then how do these supermassive black holes form? Nobody really knows, but there's probably uh, some, some uh, collisions between smaller black holes because there aren't very many middle-level black holes. There's like stellar mass black holes, there's neutron stars. We know that neutron stars are formed by the, super, by the explosion of supermassive stars. We know that stellar mass black holes up to 100 or so solar masses can be formed by the collisions of either smaller black holes or directly created by massive stellar explosions. But to get a, but to get a black hole between 100 solar masses and a million solar masses, hard to know where those actually come from. So one would think that million solar mass black holes don't just appear out of nowhere. They should grow from something. But to actually not see too many of these intermediate solar mass black holes is a problem for astronomy. And it's, a, it's an area of active research is where are the intermediate solar mass of black holes? Because we find stellar mass black holes and we find supermassive black holes, but not much in between. And actually discovering smaller black holes in between is a definite area of research. So perhaps galaxy interactions, so you have colliding gases. If you have two galaxies colliding, and then they might dump material into the black hole. Or maybe the stellar bars themselves. Maybe we saw barred galaxies. Maybe that itself, the bars themselves, provide a train by which they can funnel into the gas. And maybe smaller galaxies get cannibalized by bigger galaxies. So a huge galaxy is there, and a little galaxy gets too close and falls into the core. And so you can have that, but let's see if that actually is something we can see. Um, the New Star X-ray Telescope, which is, which is the next generation uh, X-ray telescope launched by NASA, was able to see on the left-hand side the image of, uh, in very high energy X-rays, as material falls into the very inner regions of a black hole. That's what this new star is looking for. It's called a black hole telescope, because if you're looking extremely high X-ray, X-ray, extremely high energy X-rays, then those things must come from the inner regions of the black hole. So that's what we're seeing on the left-hand side. Optical images on the right, and a combined images in the middle. So these, the, the X-ray data says that we're having an enormous, 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 uh, a huge gal galaxy collision, a pair of galaxies colliding, and as they collide, they're forming another massive, supermassive black hole. So there's the X-ray emission uh, just from the from the NASA's New Star or Nuclear Spectroscopic Telescope Array, looking at ARP 299. And they weren't sure if, they were to, if one is, is going after the other, but we're looking specific. Well, there's two black holes colliding inside of this. And if we overlay that with the, with the imagery from, uh, from an optical image, we can see that the two galaxies, as they're colliding, we see that the X-ray emission comes from the center of them, which is interesting. So the black holes might be in the process of colliding and forming one big black hole. So do most galaxies have supermassive black holes? And the answer is yes. Nearly all spiral galaxies show some level of activity, even the Milky Way. And there's a, as we look closer and closer at them, the more we look at galaxies, there, we find that there's more and more reasons to think that, that, super, that all galaxies have supermassive black holes. If it's a spiral galaxy, it has a supermassive black hole. If it's a massive elliptical, it has a supermassive black hole. In fact, there are no galaxies found yet that don't have supermassive black holes, but the active galactic nucleus element is if there's fuel. So there are lots more Aegeons in the past, but fewer today, and where are all the dead quasars? And so that asks the question. Now we see that other, we, we find, uh, this is just another example of what we mean by this, the size scales of, of these things. We see them in distant, distant galaxies. Again, another way to look at it is there's other spiral galaxies. When we look at the center of it in 21 centimeter radiation, which is radio light, we can get a Doppler shift and actually see the sides and see the radiation coming from the inner quarter of a parsec of the center of this galaxy, which is approximately uh, 20 kiloparsecs across. And the whole galaxy is well, more like 10 kiloparsecs across. And the center 0.2 parsecs has super speeds going around. And the super speediness can, you know, has massive, massive, massive redshift on one side and massive blue shift as material goes around the central supermassive black hole. So stu such studies of the centers of galaxies 
amongst many of them, and then comparing them to others, show that the central mass of a black hole is correlated to the size of the galactic core. So the ma more massive the bulge of the galaxy, meaning the more massive the black hole. And so that's what this graph means. We can see that smaller galaxy bulges, uh, which are represented by these little dots, um, have smaller supermassive black holes. Larger galactic cores or galactic bulges have larger supermassive black holes. So there's just basically more stuff to feed on and the black hole collects more and more stuff. So the, as even though the black hole is an incredibly tiny target, I mean, it's, it's, it's like having a target the size of one person across the entire city of New York City, the into all five boroughs. And so every, the bigger the guy at the center of Times Square, the bigger the city. So imagine that there was a correlation. There's a weirdness about this is, is that let's say you said, well, how big is a city? And then you'd say, well, let's see, there's 10,000 people in this city, there's 100,000 people in this city, and there's a million people in this city. What this is saying is go to the center of that city and if you find a, a thousand person city, in the very center of the city, you'll find a very small person, like a tiny person. Now he'll look like a certain thing and he'll have like a little sign around saying, I'm the center guy in town. But if you go to a larger town, that person will be physically larger and you'll have a sign around saying, I'm the center guy in town. And if you go to a massive city, the guy in the center will be even bigger. But not like giant sized, the difference in size between them will be maybe a hundred times in certain size. but the, the bigger the city, the bigger the person at the center of the city. And, the, and it's, there's a direct correlation between the two of them, which is very interesting. So that tells us something about the evolution of galaxies and black holes in them. So let's see if we can figure out if there is a, a link between the evolution of galaxies and their active states. So if we then look at the most active of the active galactic nuclei, quasars, Quasars were things that are incredibly bright active galactic nuclei. They are the brightest of the AGNs, but they're also the most distant. And therefore, since they're the most distant, they, they occurred the longest time ago. So therefore, they represent an early stage in galaxy development. So quasars are ago, a long time ago, and if the universe is only 13.6 billion years old, and we're looking billions of years in the past, this is a childhood picture of supermassive black holes. So we can see that the image that we see inset is that quasars are part of galaxies, but yet they're bright supermassive cores of galaxies. Now, gal now, now, quasars themselves then had an epoch where they lived and when they were born and when they died. They seem to have started uh, roughly about 12 billion years ago and seem to have had their peak about 10 billion years ago. And then they kind of petered out after that until about 2 billion years ago. So the, what we find is that the thing that we call quasars, or whatever is making it the brightest possible thing that the that quasars are, that fuel for quasar activity happened at when the universe was only a couple of billion years old, a few billion years old, and then it faded away. And so as time went on, fewer and fewer quasars existed until today. We don't have any quasars in the local universe. It doesn't mean that the massive, supermassive black holes have gone away. It's just that there's nothing left to feed them. So supermassive black holes grew, 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 got fed, 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 did their quasar thing, and then stopped. So we look at something like the 2DF quasar survey. They just finished this up in 2008, which is a long field survey. We can look at this thing and say, okay, these pizza slices are two different directions in the sky, a few degrees wide, high. We just compress it so it looks like a two-dimensional survey. But the center of this wedge is where we are in the Milky Way, and then we look out into the pizza wedges towards the edge of the pizza, and we find that the peak of them ends at about 10 billion, light year, 10 billion years ago, at a redshift of about 2. 
but then we see that there are some ga some quasars that approach to about 2 billion light years. But if you squint really hard at this thing, you can say the vast majority of the quasars were between, say, 13 billion years ago and about 10 billion years ago. And then they fade roughly away. Notice that there are fewer by number inside of the 8 billion to 2 billion area compared to the 10 to 12 billion area. There's a lot more that are seen at the at 10 billion light years away or 12 billion light years away than nearby. So and there's almost none. In fact, there are none within a 2 billion light years of Earth. So that's an important element of it that says that quasars are a temporary process inside of the history of gal galaxies and they fade with time. That doesn't mean the supermassive black hole goes away. It doesn't disappear. It's just that the thing that makes a quasar stops after a while. And let's see how that then all adds up. So we have black holes are supermassive and they're part of, the, of, of galaxy evolution. So we're going to find that galaxies start, or we have found and have seen, that little tiny galaxies long, long ago were tiny and misshapen and irregular. And then they merge together. We've seen that galaxies collide and stick together. We've seen galaxy mergers all throughout. And when they merge, they make a larger central black hole. Those then become go from tiny misshapen galaxies to larger galaxies with some sort of central black hole. Then those things collide and the black holes fall together to form supermassive black holes. Now when you have two large such galaxies colliding, you then have an enormous amount of material that forms them and that can create a radio galaxy or a blazar or a quasar across the top and that what if we're looking straight down the top there's a huge amount of material that active galactic nucleus then can be in a radio galaxy a blazar or a quasar and then eventually that settles down using up all the gas and dust and material and it blows everything out and it eventually settles into becoming an elliptical galaxy however the quasar activity occurs and then after it does the quasar activity, it has little bitty tiny other mergers. Then you can get Seifert level activity after the quasar is done, because quasars are a very short period of time when, when suns are being consumed per year, because that's what the, the active, the amount of energy that it takes to make a quasar. So quasars themselves are, are fall with, if they when they're done doing quasar activity, you have a normal galaxy. And if they have little tiny mergers, then you can have Seifert level activity, which is a lot of active galactic nucleus, but you don't get the lobes or blazar activity, but just little activity. And then those things can settle down and become spirals. But if you have massive activity, it can disrupt and use up everything in the entire galaxy, blowing away the gas and dust and eliminating it, forming giant elliptical galaxies such as M87. Or you can have a series of minor mergers and form spiral galaxies such as M101 or the Milky Way. And that's our summary of exactly how galaxy evolution and those things go. So supermassive black holes can explain that, and they can also explain the evolution of galaxies as they go from billions of years, as they can evolve by collisions and mergers into forming larger galaxies. All right, so we're going to go into the cosmological end of things next time. See you soon. <laughs>